Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Ghost Dancer by Robert Westbrook, narrated by Kaipo Schwab. Prologue Body Piercing Is this the first time you've made love at 13,000 feet? he asked, with his well-practiced boyish grin. The first time, she agreed. But I'll bet you've done it before up here, haven't you? Never! He laughed and flashed the famous grin again. Well, maybe once a long, long time ago, but it doesn't count. Oh, no? She nuzzled playfully. Her brown eyes lit up with mischief. And just why doesn't it count? It was summer. There were wildflowers on the high meadows. Very pretty, actually. I bet. But I've never done it in the winter. Not at 13,000 feet in a blizzard. You, my dear are the very most delicious, most cuddly first. They giggled and played. He was old enough to have gone through a kaleidoscope of fashions and seen most things recycled a time or two. But my God, the kids these days! As the millennium approached, staying hip was turning into a full-time job. It wasn't the nose ring that bothered him. He had gotten used to that, the delicate small gold loop that pierced the skin of her left nostril but the ring through her clitoris was another matter. This was weird. Still, he had to admit, it never failed to excite him when his hand wandered into that nether region. An interesting aesthetic, smooth metal against moist flesh. A slippery foreign object where you least expected to find one. Kinky, to say the least. Especially when she explained that her husband had a gold ring just like it through his scrotum. They were a perfect Generation X couple, apparently, with matching genital wedding bands. Well, we're from different worlds. It's part of the fascination. Sixty-three and twenty-four, he told himself as he gently stroked her stomach. It seemed to him miraculous, this subtraction of thirty-nine years, a sign from heaven of his own eternal silver-haired youthfulness. They lay on a narrow cot in a small avalanche hut, high on the ridge above the ski resort. A propane heater sent a hissing glow into the room, reflecting against the window in the girl's bronze skin. She had an athletic body, compact and strong. Her dark gold hair tumbled in thick curls onto her shoulders. Even on this wintry morning, she seemed to him full of sunlight. She was like holding a summer's day in his arms. The shed was twelve feet by eight, not exactly the honeymoon suite. The radio equipment and boxes of explosive grenades left barely enough room to stand. Fortunately, the bed made standing unnecessary. Outside, the snow swirled around the window. Hey, it's ten o'clock, she said, glancing at her watch. You said you had a meeting this morning. Damn, is it that late? He never carried a watch one of his eccentricities, though he prided himself on his innate sense of perfect time. It can't be more than nine-thirty. You just want to be rid of me. No, honest. Look at my watch. You told me to remind you. Damn, he swore again. He picked up his ski clothes from the floor. She started to dress as well. This wasn't a place to lounge around naked. Bra first, then panties, long silk underwear, black snow pants, thick gray wool sweater, and finally a red jacket with a large red cross on the back, the emblem of the ski patrol. He slipped into his own underclothes, then a dark blue powder suit, and his Nordica boots. He grabbed his gloves and goggles and hat from where he had left them on the table by the radio. The morning went by too fast, he told her. When can I see you again? I don't know. I think my husband's getting suspicious. He's starting to give me these long, pleading looks. Is he? Poor guy. Her husband was a ski instructor, the same age as she was, and he felt a pang of unexpected empathy for the young man. I'll put him teaching beginner's week. That'll keep him occupied. You're bad, she said with a coy smile. Not as bad as you are, he whispered back. He kissed her weather-cracked lips, feeling the momentary cold touch of her nose ring against his own nostril. Then he was gone stepping out from the avalanche hut into the storm. She watched through the frosty window as he got into his skis and pushed off over the cornice of the mountain into the steep chute below. 
As soon as he was out of sight, she opened a zippered compartment of her red backpack, took out a small cell phone, and punched in a number. He's on his way, she said into the mouthpiece. She refolded the phone and put it away. Finally, she took off her Eddie Bauer wristwatch, pulled the small silver knob on the side, and reset the time, correctly now, back one half hour. How glorious to ski waist-deep, off-pist, through steep virgin powder. This was Beethoven's ninth and then some. He sang the ode to joy at the top of his lungs as he swept down from the high ridge toward the chairlifts and trails below, sending up a plume of white snow in his wake. No, he did not feel sixty-three years old. Not when he could still climb nearly seven hundred and fifty vertical feet to the avalanche hut in a storm, satisfy a young woman, and then ski down again with effortless ease, and all before noon. In a few minutes he came down from a wide glacier bowl onto the ski area proper and joined those below, not many in this weather, who had come to spend the day on the slopes. Slower, losing ecstasy as he lost speed, he descended part way down an intermediate trail. Finally he stopped and moved along a small path through the trees to the clearing where he had arranged his meeting this morning. He was the first to arrive. He stood by himself in the falling snow and sighed. He remembered that he had a problem, a big problem, possibly. But if all went well, his mind wandered. He laughed suddenly, thinking of the girl's clitoral jewelry, wondering what a Generation X couple said to the guard at the airport when their genital wedding bands set off the alarm at the security check. It was not a particularly profound thought, but as it happened, it was the last clear thought he ever had. He heard a sound behind him. He turned with a smile still on his lips, his lovely boyish smile. But as he turned, something struck him in the chest with enormous force. An iron fist, a locomotive, a battering ram, but stronger still. It shook every part of him and made the world go dim and woozy. He stood stupidly in shock, his mouth open. His eyes traveled downward. My God, there was an arrow sticking out of his blue powder suit. A wooden shaft, colored feathers at the end to guide its flight. An arrow had pierced his chest. He stared at the thing in astonishment. Just to make certain, he reached with one hand and touched the shaft. It was real, all right. No hallucination. Someone had shot him with a goddamn arrow. He looked up with genuine curiosity to see who could have done this terrible thing. But his head was heavy. He struggled to squint and focus his eyes. There seemed to be a dark figure standing in the snow in front of him hardly more than a black outline against the blinding white. A ghost, perhaps. That's what it looked like to him. And the ghost was coming toward him, floating just a little, twirling to some distant music. The ghost was dancing. He saw that now. A dancing ghost with a bow in hand, come to take him home. Part One Philosophical Divisions at the Top of the Food Chain 1. Howie met the lady in white and her daughter in a chairlift in a late-season storm. He didn't learn her real name for some time, so that's how he continued to think of her, as the lady in white. For a day that soon turned ugly, she made an attractive start. The memory of her became forever linked in his mind with the white sky, the mountains, and heavy snowflakes floating down so soft and silent, it was like standing inside a winter scene from one of those old-fashioned crystal paperweights. It was April Fool's Day, and Howie should have been more on guard. By mid-morning nearly twenty-six inches of fresh powder had fallen from the sky, hiding the scars of old turns left behind by last week's marauding college kids on spring break. The small resort village at the base of the lift looked like some Hollywood fantasy of old Bavaria. But it was all make-believe. The gingerbread houses with their steep roofs sold goggles, gloves, and skis, and the thing that looked like a church steeple was, in fact, the top of the Winter House Inn. This was not the old world, but the new. The northernmost mountains of New Mexico, close to the Colorado border, with a lot of set decoration thrown in to provide the proper atmosphere. 
Howie and Jack had just pushed forward out from the front of the lift line onto a red plastic strip, half buried in the snow, that said, Load Here. Jack drifted past the mark by a few inches, and Howie had to pull him back by the belt. Load here, Jack, he said. Overhead, a huge wheel moved the heavy cable. Behind them, an empty chair was making a U-turn and coming their way. Howie was thinking that a chairlift is certainly a splendid thing. To ascend a mountain upon huge steel pylons during a winter storm, traveling where a clever eagle might hesitate to go, just for the hell of it. But then, without warning, the huge wheel ceased turning, and the lift came to an abrupt halt. The two men were left standing foolishly on the red plastic strip. What's happening? Jack asked. Someone probably fell getting off at the top. Jack, are you sure you want to go through with this? I'll be fine. You still can change your mind, you know. Wait in the lodge with a nice hot toddy while I take care of business. Don't worry about me. I used to be a very good skier, you know. I still think this is crazy. Relax, Howie. I came in third at the National Junior Slalom Competition in Stowe, Vermont, Jack said with dignity. Back in 62. For Jack Wilder, 1962 was clearly a vintage year, a much better year than today. He was a large man in his early fifties, six feet two inches tall, about thirty pounds overweight, with a well-trimmed gray beard and curly gray hair. He carried himself with a kind of stately resolve. You could tell he must have been handsome in his youth, before stress and various culinary pleasures had broadened his features and added a comfortable belly to his physique. This morning Jack looked like an overdressed bear in a gray powder suit that was padded from underneath by a thick white sweater his wife Emma had knitted for him. He wore a blue and gray wool scarf wrapped tightly around his neck, and there was a dazzling red ski cap you couldn't miss in the blizzard pulled down over his ears. The scarf and cap were crochet work, also from Emma Wilder, who spent each evening in a rocking chair near the fire, with two cats at her feet, and with knitting needles or crochet hook, working away at a great clip. This meant she was always seeking new victims for her work. Obscure nieces and nephews in Iowa or San Diego might unexpectedly receive oversized sweaters at odd times of the year, usually July. Howie, too, was wearing one of Emma's ski caps, an orange and black thing that made him feel like a Halloween decoration. It was not his idea of style, but he hated to hurt her feelings. Despite the storm, Jack wore goggles with a lens so dark his eyes were invisible. Between the goggles, the ski cap, and the scarf, there wasn't much left of Jack to see. They had been waiting less than two minutes, when Howie heard a child's eager voice behind them. Mommy, let's get on this chair. Angela, wait, came an adult voice in alarm, but it was too late. The child had moved forward from the line, sliding in between Jack and Howie onto the red load here strip. She was about five years old, dressed in a candy pink snowsuit, cute as she could be, a cherub with plump cheeks and long blonde hair falling down from her pink cap. Her mother appeared a moment later by her daughter's side. It seems we're joining you, she said with an apologetic laugh. Quite all right, Jack told her gallantly. Howie was unhappy the mother and daughter had effectively separated him from Jack, but there was nothing to be done. The woman, he saw, was dressed completely in white, powder suit, gloves, hat. Even her expensive German skis, vocals, were mostly white. How he knew that she was an attractive female of the species, covered up as she was in powder suit and goggles in a snowstorm, is one of the sweet mysteries of nature. His nerve endings simply whispered sex, though as a civilized male in the age of AIDS, he did his best not to show any interest. He smiled, instead, at the little girl. The child was adorable on her shorty skis, and she grinned back, her eyes ablaze through the yellow lens of her goggles. They were fresh as an ad for toothpaste, this lovely mother and daughter pair. But Howie wished they had stayed back in line. With a groan of moving cable, the machinery started and the four-person chair was once again coming their way. A lift attendant whacked the seat with a broom to get some of the loose snow off. The effort was perfunctory faintly ridiculous in a storm like this. Here we go, Jack, Howie said over the heads of the mother and daughter. When you feel the chair against the back of your legs, sit down. Yes, yes, of course. 
Jack hated to feel helpless, and there was a note of irritation in his voice. The lady in white glanced toward Howie, studied him briefly, and then turned to inspect Jack. In her effort to get onto the lift with her daughter, she had not looked closely at her co-riders until just this moment. Now a small shadow crossed her brow as she sensed that in some undefined way they were out of place. But if she had any doubts about riding with Jack and Howie, it was too late for her, just as it was for Jack and Howie, because a moving chairlift is an inexorable thing. Jack managed the first obstacle. The chair arrived and he collapsed onto it, putting his arm anxiously around the metal bar at the side. They lurched forward together, their four pairs of skis gliding over a mound of snow, then falling off into empty space. They cleared the first tower and suddenly found themselves high above the white ground and climbing fast into the frozen sky. 2. Skiing is a white, white sport. Anyone who does not believe that there are two Americas neatly segregated one from the other should spend a winter in the mountains among the privileged class. Howie found it telling that here at San Geronimo, in the town itself that is fifteen miles away, the population was dominated by people of color, mostly Hispanic. But at San Geronimo Peak, high in the snow, there was nary a red nor brown nor black face in sight, which is why Howie was so out of place. The little girl had been studying him with huge eyes through her goggles ever since he got on the chairlift. She was too young to disguise her curiosity, to know that strangers are dangerous in this world and must not stare at one another. Finally she just came out and asked him, Are you an Indian? Native American, dear, the mother corrected quickly, a delicate blush of embarrassed P.C. in her voice. Howie smiled at them both. He couldn't hide it, he supposed, his round, full-moon face and flattish nose, even the long black hair in a ponytail down his back, a ponytail which, despite his every effort to look like some hip rock entrepreneur, summoned instead a hint of ancestral forests and plains. Why, sure, I'm an Indian, he told the little girl. Then where's your bow and arrow? Angela, cried Mom, scandalized. Quite all right, he assured the woman. He peered into the little girl's grave, curious face. Well, naturally I have a bow and arrow, he told her. Lots of arrows, as a matter of fact, but generally I leave them back at the wigwam when I go skiing. Why? demanded Angela. You think I'll need them skiing? Indians are supposed to have a bow and arrow, she insisted. Well, I guess I could shoot a few Texans who are hogging the trails, he told her. The mother laughed. Everybody's got to hate somebody, and in New Mexico people hate Texans. It was only natural. Just as Oregon loathes California, and Northern California despises Southern California, and Southern California detests the brown-skinned masses who live farther south still, there exists among humankind an entire chain of loathing in which everyone feels superior to someone, except perhaps the people who are so far south, metaphorically speaking, that there is no one left to hate except themselves, and, as an Indian, how we had some knowledge of this last category. He's teasing you, sweetheart, the mother said to her daughter. The little girl smiled, serene in her own fantasy belief in storybook Indians who roamed watercolor pages with bow and arrow in hand. Normally, Howie was not wild about two cute children, but Angela seemed the authentic article, still young enough to pull it off. A year from now she would go to school and learn which lunch boxes were cool to have and what TV shows she must watch to be part of the right crowd. She would discover she was blonde and pretty and probably become awfully stuck up. But at the moment the little girl appeared that rare thing in today's world, a truly innocent child. With her plump cheeks she reminded Howie of the sort of angel you might find on a Renaissance ceiling, one of the small chubby kind that's usually found near the corners of the frame blowing trumpets at the clouds. Now that they were chatting, Howie was able to inspect Mom more closely. His male antenna received a kind of high-voltage electrical zap. There was a great alertness to her, a surplus of energy, as though her emotional core was burning close to the surface. Her complexion was pale, rosy cheeks in the snowy cold. Her features were delicate and well-formed, 
She had short, dark hair, cut in a cute, feathery way, almost as black as Howie's. Her eyes were large and animated, and he wondered what color they were beneath the orange lens of her goggles. There was not the slightest doubt in Howie's mind that she was well-educated and came from money. He was willing to bet that men had loved her and probably had suffered for it, too. When she had first joined them on the chairlift, he had estimated her age in the mid-twenties, the same as his own. But looking at her more closely, he revised that figure upward ten years. She was a childlike woman, small and elfin, but an aging child nevertheless. She was studying Howie, too, in a certain anthropological way in which white people tend to look at Indians. Are you from the San Geronimo Pueblo? she inquired. No, I'm a Lakota Sioux, from South Dakota originally. I've only been in New Mexico a few months. Really? And what brought you to San Geronimo? Blind fortune, he told her with a smile. She smiled back. It didn't really mean anything, only a polite facial gesture signifying courtesy. Yet for all that, it was a nice smile and he was inclined to elaborate in order to keep the conversation going. I was in Europe for a year, and I met an American couple in Paris who offered me use of their guest cottage here. I'm a graduate student working on my Ph.D. dissertation. Long overdue, I'm afraid, and I needed a quiet place to write. Unfortunately, Bob, my friend from Paris, twisted his knee in early December and gave me his ski pass to use. That was the death knell for me as far as academia is concerned. You're neglecting your studies to ski, she said with mock severity. You bet. And how about you, he asked. Do you ski here often? Only when I can. Not as much as I'd like these days. So where are you doing your graduate work? Princeton, he told her. She raised an eyebrow, just slightly, but he saw it. As an Indian, Howard Moondeer was accustomed to Anglo-curiosity, and he could see the big question mark in her eyes. How did this kid from the res get to a fancy East Coast school? The answer, in fact, was not complex. He had simply gone where the scholarships were, first to Dartmouth, which had been chartered originally as an Indian school, a noble New England urge to educate the heathen, and then on to Princeton for his master's, and finally his endlessly dangling, often interrupted Ph.D., it was the rich schools that tended to be the most generous with selected minorities, and as a Native American, Howie was lucky to find himself on the receiving end of a lot of well-honed guilt. The lady in white could not read him, or fit him within any category that she knew, and he could tell it bothered her a little. He smiled vaguely, but did not help her out. She gave him an odd look, and they fell silent for a few hundred feet, passing over a stand of Douglas fir whose branches were heavy with new snow. Jack, at the far end of the chair, seemed deep in his own thoughts. The little girl, meanwhile, had fled the adult world completely and was swinging her short skis back and forth in rhythmic boredom, singing a song to herself. They had exactly nine and a half minutes to share their ride from the base to the mid-mountain station at 10,455 feet. It is an unusual interval of time, nine and a half minutes, to be trapped together with a beautiful stranger of the opposite sex, traveling in intimate proximity on a chair dangling twenty or thirty feet above the earth. Howie was determined to make the most of it. So where are you from? he asked the lady. He was betting she would say Santa Fe because she had the look, but he was wrong. San Geronimo. You've lived here for a while? Not really. I'm one of those dreaded newcomers, she told him. Howie laughed. After Texans, Everyone in New Mexico hated newcomers next, a rich vein of loathing, since there were newcomers here galore. What do you do in town? he prodded. He felt the slightest hesitation on her part. I'm a doctor, she said guardedly. This surprised him. She appeared too young to be a doctor. Too pretty, perhaps, though certainly this was a sexual prejudice on his part. I bet a small town like San Geronimo is always in need of a good doctor, he mentioned. Actually, my practice is in Albuquerque. You commute to Albuquerque? It's not so bad. It's three hours each way. Well, I only work three and a half days a week, so that makes it easier. And I've been studying some language tapes in the car to fill the time. No kidding. Which language? Swahili. 
She said it with a shrug of her shoulders as though it were no big deal. I'm impressed, he said. But why Swahili? For a bold modern woman, she seemed unexpectedly shy. I have a fantasy of starting a medical clinic in Africa. I don't know where exactly. Probably Swahili won't do me any good. But as a doctor, I long to be, well, useful. I can understand that, Howie answered, thinking, hot damn, this is my sort of lady in white, from head to pretty toe. An idealist, even. He was looking at her perhaps too intensely, for he felt her consciously break the connection. She turned deliberately to Jack, who had been sitting without expression throughout the conversation, as though he were not on the same chair. For a big man, Jack had a curious ability to disappear when he wished. Are you an academic as well? she asked. Jack smiled with a dormant sadness how he had often seen in him. Oh, no. God forbid. I'm only a cop, he said with modesty. Or, rather, I used to be. Jack here was a big shot in the San Francisco Police Department before he retired, how he explained to the lady doctor, feeling an odd need to speak up on his friend's behalf. Is that so? said the doctor. But she did not seem pleased at the idea of sharing a chairlift with a police officer, highly ranked or otherwise. What exactly did you do? Oh, mostly office stuff, really. The great bureaucratic tango, he said vaguely. But it's past history now. These days, battling grasshoppers in my garden is about the extent of my excitement. You live in San Geronimo? In town, yes. My wife inherited a house here. You must be glad to be away from all that big city violence, she remarked. Actually, early retirement was somewhat forced upon me, he told her gently. The lady doctor smiled vaguely and decided not to pursue the subject. They passed over an expert run, a patchy shoot a name that was sheer fantasy since Apaches had never lived in this particular corner of New Mexico. The white man, Howard Moondeer often noticed, did not burden himself unnecessarily with historical fact. Below the chair, two beginner skiers had appeared on the slope, coming out from the trees onto terrain that was clearly way over their ability. Probably they had dared each other to do this run. One of the men wore a moosehead ski hat with antlers on it. The other had no hat at all, but he carried a can of bud in one hand, a bit of Milwaukee courage. They disappeared below with a good deal of laughter and shouting, barely upright, their skis in a wide, kamikaze stance pointed straight down the mountain. My God, said the lady doctor scornfully. Budweiser. Howie was amused. You think it would have been any better if they were drinking Grosch? She shook her head mournfully momentarily robbed of words by the sight of beer-drinking yahoos. How he imagined only expensive wine would dampen her own pretty lips, for she was on the other side of a huge culinary chasm. Meanwhile, the magic chair kept gliding ever upward into the heavens. The little girl, Angela, yawned and began to make a snowball from the fluffy powder that had fallen in her lap. The lady doctor wiped her goggles clear of snow with the backs of her gloves. I hate skiing when I can't see, she said. On a day like this, forget your eyes. Use your feet to see, Howie told her. She glanced at him skeptically. You're kidding. Your feet? Sure. Let your feet guide the way over the terrain. There's an exercise I did once in a ski clinic. The instructor had us go down an intermediate slope with our eyes closed. What you do is imagine you have eyes in your big toes. You sort of caress the snow, feel your way down the slope, delicate as a pussycat. It improved my skiing a lot. Yes, but what if you encounter a tree? She asked archly. Well, there are limits, of course, to every theory, he admitted. During the clinic, the instructor naturally kept his eyes open and told us where not to go. Hmm. I'm not sure what I think of these fancy ideas. I learned to ski as a kid in Southern California, and we just did it without a lot of conceptualization. They were coming up fast now to the end of their ride. They lifted above a final stand of evergreens, and Howie could see the attendant standing with a shovel by the warming shed near the huge wheel that would turn the chair around and send it back toward the base of the mountain. Talking with a pretty doctor, Howie had almost forgotten Jack. The responsibility of taking care of him returned with a shot of anxiety. Jack, he said over the heads of the doctor and her daughter, 
Put the tips of your skis up. I'll tell you when to stand up. About fifteen seconds now. He grunted irritably. The lady glanced curiously at Jack and then at Howie. Is he going to have trouble getting off? Jack hasn't skied for some time, he explained. On a chairlift with strangers, skiers bond for the few minutes of allotted time, then disengage as they near the top. Jack Wilder, Howard Moondeer, and the mother and daughter sat together now without speaking, watching their ascent past the final tower into the approaching station. They readied their poles and adjusted their gloves and goggles. Here we go, Jack, Howie said with forced optimism. They glided the last few feet into the station. You can stand now, upsy daisy. The lady doctor helped Angela hop from the chair, since the little girl's legs weren't quite long enough to reach the ground. Four abreast, they rose from the seat and began to slide along the gentle decline from the lift. Jack, ski slightly to the right, Howie suggested. We'll coast to the flat spot about twenty feet ahead. You're doing fine. Jack pushed the backs of his skis out to make a small wedge. This slowed him down so that he was no longer abreast. Moondeer skied ahead with the lady and the little girl. They stopped at the crest of a small knoll. This way, Jack, he called. Come over here and stop. I want to check my bindings. Jack skied to Howie and snowplowed to a halt, stolid and clumsy, but Howie was relieved to see he was in control. The lady stooped down to fasten the snaps on her daughter's boots. When she stood up, she regarded Howie with a smile. Good luck with your dissertation, she said. Good luck with your doctoring, he told her in return. Bye, Angela, he said to the little girl. The doctor nodded curtly at Jack, who had not won her heart. Then she turned, skated a few feet to gather speed, and skied away with her daughter, who followed like a duckling in her mother's wake. Even on the flat knoll Howie could tell the lady in white was an expert skier. She moved with the effortless grace of someone long accustomed to easy gliding on snow. The little girl lacked her mother's form, but she too was entirely relaxed and fearless. Howie watched the mother and daughter disappear over the lip of the hill toward the maze of trails below. Howie liked his snow maiden just a little less than that she had so obviously not liked Jack, but had seen in him only her own projection of a certain type, a cop. That seemed shallow to him, and a disappointment. Still, they were a scrumptious pair, and when they were gone, he felt the sudden angst of female deprivation like the feeling you get if someone snatches away a plate of food you're about to eat. Would he see her again? Would he ever find true love everlasting? Jack heard the involuntary sigh escape Howie's lips. Forget her, he said. That's easy for you to say, Jack. You're fifty-two years old and happily married. I'm twenty-seven and single. We'll discuss your love life another time, Howie, he said. At the moment we have work to do. And indeed they did, for they had not come skiing today for frivolous reasons, but to meet the very first client of their newly formed enterprise, Wilder and Associate, Private Investigations. But first, Howie had a problem on his hands. He had to get Jack to the next chairlift, then up to the top of the mountain and down the other side. The problem was that Commander Jack Wilder, medically retired from the San Francisco Police Department, was totally blind. 3. A young woman from the ski patrol stood watching them from the side of the trail. She wore a red jacket with a cross on the back, and Howie was certain she was going to bust them for reckless endangerment, probably felony foolishness as well. She had curly dark gold hair and sun-bronzed skin, and for some reason she was studying Jack and Howie with intense interest. Be cool, Jack, and just follow my voice, Howie said softly. Fortunately, the hill here was not steep, and they made it past without incident. He even managed to flash a smile to show how relaxed he was. A pretty girl, he noticed. One of those blonde Wagnerian ski goddesses you see at places like San Geronimo Peak, a body bursting with athletic health. As he skied past, Howie saw she had a small gold ring piercing her left nostril. This seemed fairly hip for the ski patrol, mildly intriguing. But then he forgot about her, because he had his hands full with Jack. They entered an intermediate run called Jabberwocky, 
and suddenly this was not a game anymore, this was really skiing. Howie stayed close to Jack, barking out the turns like a drill sergeant. Right, left, right, left. The snow was swirling around them so thickly that even for Howie there was little visibility, hardly more than a few feet. See the terrain with your feet, Jack, Howie urged him, just as he had said to the lady on the chairlift. On a day like this, I'm skiing blind the same as you are. Yes, yes, Jack said through gritted teeth. But spare me the pep talk, please. Howie laughed when seconds later, Jack took a spectacular fall, head first, and came up sputtering snow. Howie had to pull him to his feet. You look like a snowman, Jack. Do you want to rest? No, let's go on. Jack certainly had nerve. He had lost his sight four years ago, and how he was always astonished how incredibly hard Jack worked to overcome his limitations. In town, he spent hours every day memorizing where things were. Not only his house, he had memorized that long ago, but the street outside his house, the walk to the park ten minutes away, even the downtown grid. He had worked out a navigational system, steering to the warmth of the sun in his face, depending on the time of day. It worked on sunny days, at least, and with a few routes. But he suffered countless falls and collisions as well. Howie's big fear was that one day Jack would have all of San Geronimo memorized, just as some developer came to town and changed it all. They continued down the white trail. Howie managed to get Jack into a dancing rhythm, one turn after another, warning him of the obstacles ahead as far as he was able to see them himself. It was obvious that Jack had been a good skier at one time, though he bobbed up and down a great deal and kept his feet too close together in an Austrian style of skiing that was now thoroughly out of date. But Howie was impressed that Jack could manage it all. Jabberwocky led to the Peak Express, a two-person chair that carried them from mid-mountain to the very top, an elevation of over 12,000 feet. The snow was blowing hard on the summit, and they ducked down quickly onto the back side of the mountain, which was more protected from the wind. Finally, after ten minutes and nearly as many falls, Howie told Jack to stop. They had arrived at an unobtrusive bend in the trail, where a separate track disappeared beneath the snow-heavy bough of a blue spruce. Howie led the way into the forest, talking Jack along the bends of the trail, moving slowly. There were signs people had been here before them, three separate ski tracks whose outlines had not yet been entirely obscured by the new snow. But the clearing itself, when they arrived, was empty of life. Not a soul. Nothing but the snow coming down. What time is it? Jack asked. He hadn't had this much exercise for years, and he was panting for breath. Ten forty-three, Howie answered. We're late, Howie. We were supposed to be here at ten thirty. You should have told me. Jack, under the circumstances, we couldn't have gone here any faster. Then we should have allowed more time. Anyway, our client is late as well. In a storm like this, everybody gets slowed down. All right, then. We'll wait. Howie had been here before. The spot was officially known as Phoenix Rock because of an oddly shaped granite obelisk that rose nearly thirty feet high in a suggestively phallic manner at one side of the clearing but the locals generally called it Doobie Rock because of the smoking activity that went on here. The clearing stood at the very edge of the mountain, and in good weather there was a spectacular view of the desert thousands of feet below. On pristine days you could see hundreds of miles to distant mesa tops, all brown and dreamy on the western horizon, and even see a hint of the Rio Grande. Most skiers, how he knew, paused here for a beat or two while stuffing their pipe back into their pocket to contemplate the grandeur of planet Earth. But today there was no visibility at all, just the blank whiteness of the storm. The minutes ticked by. It seemed to Howie miraculous they had a client at last, a local big shot even, Senator Kit Hampton, the owner of San Geronimo Peak and descendant of a ranching family whose roots went back more than a hundred years in New Mexico. In terms of the local Spanish and Indian Pueblo cultures, this was no time at all, of course, about as nouveau as a microscopic meal in the center of a huge plate. But it was said that Kit Hampton was distantly related to his namesake, Kit Carson, the wily explorer who had once tramped about in these mountains 
and this made him aristocracy as far as the Johnny-come-lately Anglos were concerned. As for his political career, that was a thing of the past. It was now more than a decade and a half since he had lost his seat in the U.S. Senate to a Republican challenger, a man who had labeled him sarcastically as the Jerry Brown of New Mexico. Many people said he had been smeared, and there was an ancient sex scandal connected to the lost campaign whose details how he had long forgotten. Still, for all that, small towns loved their celebrities, and Kit Hampton would always be known fondly as the Senator, regardless of scandals and election results. How he had never met the man in the flesh, though he had seen his photograph in the local newspaper often enough, attending this or that art opening or charity luncheon, a fit, silver-haired man of distinguished appearance who was about everything you'd want to find in a local aristocrat. Not only did he run the ski area, San Geronimo Peak stood on family land, part of the old Hampton Ranch, but he had served on the board of directors of the Santa Fe Opera, he was a past president of the San Geronimo Art Association, and he was still a force in all sorts of high-minded civic ventures to protect the environment from out-of-town real estate developers who were always threatening to build shopping malls and golf courses. Some might say that a ski resort was itself not exactly a friend to the environment, but you didn't say that, apparently, if such downhill pleasures were the main source of your own personal fortune. The big question in Howie's mind was why such an exalted individual wanted to meet with a dangerously over-educated Indian and a retired police commander from San Francisco. Senator Hampton had answered their small advertisement in the San Geronimo Post. He had spoken to Jack on the telephone yesterday, suggesting they meet him on the slopes today at Doobie Rock. This seemed an odd request, but rich people reserve the right to be odd. Senator Hampton explained only that he had a problem, and Jack would understand the situation more readily if he could rendezvous with him at this particular place. Most considerately, he had arranged free passes for them at the ticket office. Howie's guess was that the senator was going to ask them to spy on his employees and inform them who was smoking Mother Nature on company time. Howie was not thrilled about the prospect of being a narc, but Jack refused to do divorce work, and there was not otherwise a huge demand for two would-be private investigators in the small town of San Geronimo. Their ad had been running for two months, and this was their first serious response. How could they turn it down? After nearly ten minutes of waiting, Howie finally spoke. Jack, are you certain it was actually Senator Hampton who called you yesterday? Of course I'm certain. Why? Well, it is April Fool's Day. I hate to say this, but maybe someone's just having a bit of fun at our expense. No, that's not possible. I know his voice. You've met him? Of course I've met him. You didn't tell me that. Jack shrugged. It was a number of years ago in the late eighties. I helped him out of a jam in San Francisco. It concerned his daughter, Josie. She was a junior at the Art Institute going through a rebellious phase. One of my detectives picked her up in the hate during a drug sting. She was dating one of the dealers, only indirectly involved, in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I let her go. Was she pretty? What do you mean, was she pretty? What the hell kind of question is that? I'm trying to imagine you as a softy, Jack. Maybe the heart of Commander Wilder was melted by a pretty face. Her looks had nothing to do with my decision, Jack said stuffily. I was after the big boss, not small fry and bystanders. However, her father was grateful. He stopped by my office when he came to California to fetch his daughter back home, and we ended up having quite a long talk. When he saw our ad in the paper, he remembered my name. So you don't have a clue what he wants now? Howie, I've told you this about five times. He said he would explain everything once he had shown us Doobie Rock. Howie smiled. He hasn't seen you for years. I bet you didn't tell him, did you, about your eyes? My health is not his concern, Jack interrupted testily. What time is it now? Nearly eleven. We'll wait another fifteen minutes. It was a big thing for Jack to be working again as a detective, and how he hoped their mysterious client was going to show. When the minutes ticked by and no one appeared, how he felt more and more badly for him. Time? Jack asked. Eleven fourteen. Well, Jack said finally, 
Maybe this was an April Fool's prank after all. Not if he actually recognized his voice, Jack. Probably he didn't think we'd show up in this weather and he's down at the bottom waiting for us in his office. He would have phoned or sent someone up here with a message. We can wait a few more minutes if you'd like. No, he said with a discouraged sigh. We might as well go. Hell with it. Just gotta pee, Howie told him. He slid his skis close to the edge of the precipice. Astronauts probably have an easier time taking a pee than a fully dressed alpine skier. Howie planted his poles in the snow, then took off his gloves and impaled them upon the poles. Next, he opened snaps, undid the belt around his waist, and pulled down the zipper of his snowsuit from neck to torso. Then he only needed to search through layers of shirts and long underwear with a cold blue hand until locating at last that shriveled thing, a penis in a snowstorm, which was not exactly an object of manly pride at such a time. Howie did his best to redeem his ego by peeing in a mighty arc out beyond the precipice, sending a small stream a thousand feet into the storm. Adults may put on a fine pretense of civilization, but few of us entirely outgrow the infantile pleasures of the toilet. Howie peered over the precipice as far as he dared, hoping to see how magnificently far he could send his yellow river into the wide world. And that's when he saw a pair of skis, blue rossignols, on a narrow ledge about fifteen feet below him, and then he noticed a leg protruding from the snow at a very odd angle. Howie was so startled he dribbled on his boot. Oh, Jack. Oh, Jesus, Jack! What is it, Howie? I think I've found our client. 4. When Howie was ten, he discovered the dead body of his Uncle Wilbur Fat Cloud in a 57 Chevy pickup, collapsed on the steering wheel, and he had nightmares about it for years. Fat Cloud earned his name because he ate twice as much as anyone else on the reservation, and he weighed close to 300 pounds. He departed this world on the wings of a heart attack with a pleasant, mildly surprised look on his face. Such was Howie's single contact with a dead body before this moment. Like most Americans, native or otherwise, he had done his best to keep the great trickster a distant concept. Now, on this April Fool's Day in the snow, how he found himself fascinated and repulsed. He couldn't bear to look at the broken thing on the ledge below, yet it was impossible to tear his eyes away. Jack skied closer. Don't move, how he screamed at him. Don't get too close to the edge. Man, you're going to give me a heart attack. Good God, how he chill out. There's no reason to get so excited. I'm an intellectual, Jack. I don't come across dead bodies every day. I think I'm going to puke. Go ahead, Jack suggested coldly. Maybe it'll clear your head. Howie tried, but he could only give a few dry heaves, nothing very satisfying. Howie, I want you to take a few deep breaths and tell me how much exactly of the body can you see. Only the legs and torso. What about the ledge it's on? How far down is it? Ten, twelve feet? Far enough. And how wide is it? Maybe eight feet wide. It's only an outcropping of rock. Then after that it looks like there's nothing, just empty space all the way to the desert below. But I can't see too far because of the snow. You feeling a little better now? Yeah, sure. Good. Now I'd like you to look at the ledge and tell me this. Is there any way you can get down there? Down there? Are you kidding? Take your time and study the terrain, Howie. That's all I'm asking. If you can't get down safely, we'll go and call the ski patrol. But if there's any chance at all... Howie sighed, feeling very put upon. He was fearful of heights, particularly the extreme vertical kind where one could fall screaming through many thousands of feet of empty air. Man, I don't know. There's a tree, an aspen. It's growing up from the ledge against the side of the cliff. Maybe I can use it to sort of shimmy down. The tree's strong enough? It's not rotten? It looks okay, hard to tell this time of year. I don't want you to do anything foolish. Believe me, I'm not planning to do anything foolish. Howie studied the aspen tree, the side of the cliff, the narrow ledge below, and the legs and torso and rossignol skis for about another five minutes. Nothing changed in that time except more snow drifting down. He was frankly terrified. How you doing? Jack asked quietly. 
I'm scared shitless, Jack, if you really want to know the truth. Naturally, anyone would be frightened to climb down there. Let's get the ski patrol. No, I'm going to do it, Howie insisted. Why he was going to do it, he did not precisely know. It seemed that Indians, even the Ivy League sword, had to be brave. It was engraved in his genetic engineering, and if he didn't give this a try, he was going to feel like a failure. I just need a few minutes to psych myself up. Okay, but don't turn this into some rite of passage. It's a physical problem, not spiritual. Why don't you step out of your skis and look it over some more? Is the aspen really strong enough to hold you? Are there any places in the rock where you can get a foothold? These are the only questions you need to ask yourself, not whether you're brave enough. And so Jack talked him through it, standing safely, it might be noted, in the center of the small clearing, well away from the edge of the precipice himself. Howie stepped from his bindings into waist-deep snow and experienced an unpleasant thrill to the testicles. He had forgotten that his snowsuit zipper was still open to the crotch. It woke him up big time. He zipped himself up, got his gloves on, and scrambled onto a rock that had been mostly cleared of snow by the wind. From here he was able to take hold of the trunk of the aspen. It was a lithe, slippery young tree only two or three inches in diameter, but it seemed anchored solidly in the ledge below, so he gave it a try. The moment he climbed aboard, the tree bent like a rubber toothpick, and for a nasty second, how he thought he was going to plummet to the desert below. He hung on tenaciously and somehow slid down a few feet to where the trunk was thicker and more solid. From there he managed to wedge himself between the tree and the cliff, using the rigid toes of his ski boots to find a sort of steep staircase in the rock to descend to the ledge below. I'm down, Jack, he called finally. His hands ached, his shoulders hurt from tension, but he was in one piece. Good. Now tell me what you see. The dead man was in a stylishly cut dark blue powder suit, face down in the snow, his arms outstretched as though he were embracing the mountain. At least how he assumed it was a man from the angular lines of the figure, though the person was half buried in fresh powder, and it was impossible to be sure of his gender, let alone his identity. The bindings had released upon impact, as they were designed to do, so that the skis had separated from the skier and stuck into the snow at odd angles near the body. As Howie's gaze traveled from the boots upward, he could tell there was something very wrong about the head. There were some unappetizing tufts of white hair and congealed bubbles of blood. The skull looked more like a smashed melon than anything human. From where Howie was standing, he was not able to see Jack in the clearing on top, but he shouted all this grisly information up to him, feeling like he was addressing some all-powerful god. Is it the senator? Jack called down. Maybe, maybe not. The next step is going to require a strong stomach, Jack warned. I want you to turn the corpse over onto his back so you can get a better look. Good God, you want me to touch him? He's not going to hurt you, Howie. Howie complained loudly. He told Jack he should climb down and do it himself. But since this was out of the question, he gritted his teeth and pulled the body loose from the snow and got it turned over on its back. The corpse was not entirely frozen, but it was stiff enough, and turning it over was not easy because of its outstretched arms. It was a man. Howie had been right about the gender identification, which can be tricky in these androgynous times. Holy shit, said Moondeer contemplating the unfortunate spectacle of human meat once the soul had departed. The top of the forehead was a bloody pulp, and below that two bulging eyes stared off in different directions. His mouth was frozen in a strange smile that showed several teeth broken off like a berserk Halloween pumpkin. I'm almost certain it's Senator Hampton, Jack, but I've only seen photographs of the guy, and this... this... thing... Doesn't look like anything I would recognize except in a bad dream. Take a guess about the cause of death. Well, that's easy. He fell and hit his head against the rocks. The front of his skull is crushed in. Much blood? Some. It's congealed on his forehead, and there's blood in the snow from where I lifted him out. You're doing great. Now, Howie, strictly speaking, we should go report the death to the proper authorities. 
without disturbing the body anymore. I certainly don't want to lead you into breaking the law. Nevertheless, this particular opportunity to gather information may never present itself again. What do you want me to do, Jack? Howie asked with resignation. I want you to search through his pockets and tell me everything you find. For the next few minutes, under Jack's persistent orders, Howie searched through the dead man's zippered pockets. He found a billfold in an inside breast compartment. The victim was indeed Kit Armstrong Hampton of 197 Nuevo Año Road, San Geronimo, New Mexico, according to his driver's license. There was also every kind of credit card, gold and platinum, as well as $273 in cash and set of keys on a lucky rabbit's foot charm, which had not done Senator Hampton a great deal of good in this instance. The billfold contained nothing personal, no photographs of loved ones or phone numbers scrawled on small pieces of paper and most importantly, no indication of why Jack and Howie had been summoned there that day. It was while putting the billfold back into the inside breast compartment that Howie touched something unusual, the jagged end of a wooden shaft that had broken off and was embedded into the chest just below the sternum. Howie retracted his hand quickly and found it was sticky with dark globular blood, blood that had changed in consistency from the cold and had become rubbery as chewing gum. Howie wiped off his hand with an urgent motion in the clean snow nearby. This is going from bad to worst, he said to Jack. What's going on? Howie was about to say that he did not have a clue what was going on, but then he saw a small wedge of colored feather sticking out of the snow about a foot from the body. He reached for the feather and found it was attached to a few inches of wooden shaft. My God, Jack, it's an arrow. A what? A broken arrow. Kit Hampton was shot with an arrow, for Christ's sake. I didn't see it at first because it got broken off, probably by the fall. It was almost buried in the snow. Jack was silent for a moment. Then he asked, What kind of arrow? Howie was outraged by Jack's calm. What do you mean, what kind of arrow? It's just an arrow. A hunting arrow? A target arrow? What? I know this is going to surprise you, Jack, said Howie with superb patience. But despite what I told that little girl this morning, I've never actually shot a bow and arrow in my life. I know nothing about them. I've never scalped anyone either, though I have been tempted upon occasion. Do you have that out of your system, Howie? If you got any more comments about your cultural identity, I'm ready to listen. No, that'll do for the moment, Howie said with a sigh. Good. Then let's get back to the arrow. It's just some cheesy thing from a sporting goods store. For shooting at targets, I suppose. Describe the feathers to me. Mm, they aren't real feathers, just colored plastic bristle. Two of them are bluish-green, and the third is yellowish. Jack, I'm starting to get kind of cold down here. Do you think we can wrap this up? I'm beginning to feel we should maybe tell someone about this. Yes, yes. We'd better get the ski patrol. He agreed reluctantly. Howie was glad to leave. Death by an arrow bothered him a great deal more than death by falling off a cliff. It brought out some atavistic Indian horror of his own ancestral past and made him think that maybe he should get his red ass back to Princeton, New Jersey, where people killed each other in more up-to-date ways. He left the dead man on the ledge, his arms outspread so that he looked crucified on the rocks. At least nature was kind enough to provide a shroud. The soft flakes sifted down, covering the agony of death with the white cool mercy of snow. 5. There was to be one more adventure for Howard Moondeer and Jack Wilder before they made it safely to the bottom of San Geronimo Peak. As a lapsed Jungian, Howie thought of it later as not so much an accident as synchronicity, the not-so-chancy coming together of fated objects. It happened below Wizard on an intermediate trail called White Fox. More synchronicity. Jack was skiing fairly well, but Howie was spaced out, pondering the meaning of life and death and the very thin line between the two. Unfortunately, it's not a good idea to ponder major philosophical questions while moving at a brisk speed on skis. Howie was deep in his thoughts when he became aware of two figures appearing suddenly from emerging expert trail on his right, Sipapu Drop. They were skiing fast and sweet. It took him a moment to realize it was a lady in white with whom he'd shared a lift earlier in the morning, 
with their daughter taking up the rear. The mistake how he made was to stop and look at them for a few seconds, for he was in a dreamy mood and the mother and daughter made a pleasant sight. The lady doctor was skiing superbly well, moving almost directly down the steep fall line in soft rhythmic turns, a delicious zigzag through the powder. The little girl followed fearlessly in her mother's tracks about fifteen feet back, without much form, but managing the difficult slope like a pro. After the horror on the ledge, Howie was enchanted to see such prettiness. Then he remembered Jack. The lapse of concentration was nearly fatal. When Howie came out of his reverie and turned downhill, he saw that Jack was about to ski off the trail into a pine tree. Jack, do a hockey stop! Turn right! he shouted. Jack responded immediately. He turned out of the fall line away from the tree, but then lost his balance at the end of the turn and fell. Howie skied down after him, concerned that Jack was all right. But now he was not concentrating properly on his own skiing. He hit a small bump beneath the new snow, fell back too far on his skis, and nearly took a nasty tumble. He managed to stay upright, but he lost control for a moment and swerved too far to the side of the trail. All this time he had been looking only at Jack, but now a blurred motion to the side of his vision made him turn abruptly toward the merging trail. He saw, to his astonishment, that he was on a collision course with a lady in white. The fault, if there was one, was hers. She was skiing entirely too fast from the expert slope onto the intermediate terrain where Howie was still struggling to stay on his skis. She came like an eagle swooping down while Howie could only stand there flapping like a befuddled turkey. When the lady in white saw that she and Howie were destined to crash, she tried to cut her speed with a heroic hockey slide that sent a plume of snow fifteen feet into the air and turned Howie into an instant snowman. But it was too late. They met face to face with the inevitability of Newtonian physics. Howie opened his arm so he wouldn't hurt her with his poles, and he caught her in a bear hug. His right ski, a purple Elan, slipped in suggestively between her two white volks. Their legs became intertwined as closely as lovers, and they fell in this intimate embrace upward into the hill. Oof! she cried in surprise. Damn it! Sorry, Howie told her. Are you all right? I didn't see you, she said more calmly. Then she added, I'm okay. Anyway, it's my fault. No, it's my fault, Howie insisted. I was off balance. Howie became gradually aware that this was a uniquely interesting situation. He was holding in his arms a very beautiful woman. Every nerve ending of his male being sensed the slim curves of her body beneath her snowsuit. Her cheeks were glowing pink with exertion, and he could smell the warm, clean fragrance of her skin, a girl's smell that was a thousand times better than any perfume. Her breath was hot against his cheek, and their legs were interlocked thigh to thigh, in a position how he used to think of in his early teenage years as the dry hump. He did his best not to smile, knowing that a single smirk could lose her to him forever. Shall we try to get out of this? she asked calmly. We'll have to do it in unison. On the count of three? Howie and the lady struggled to stand up and separate, but it was no good. It can be difficult on skis under the best of circumstances to get up from an awkward fall, but wrapped up together as they were on a steep slope and fresh powder, it was nearly impossible. The new snow was like quicksand. They managed to get halfway to their feet and then fell back against the hill in a tighter embrace than before. Slide backward, she told him. I can't, he replied. The backs of my skis are buried. Why don't you try? No, I can't move either. Then I guess we're stuck with each other, Howie admitted, risking the smallest smile. They had been holding each other cheek to cheek, but now the lady in white leaned her head backward so she could get a better look at him. Her goggles had come off in the fall, and Howie found himself staring into a pair of large and intelligent brown gold-flecked eyes. Her lips were extremely close, only millimeters away. She was regarding him just as intently as he was staring at her. She must have seen something in his face, something Howie could only guess at, because suddenly she decided the situation was funny. Her eyes sparkled, and she threw back her head and laughed. Mommy, I'm cold, said the little girl who had stopped on the slope a dozen feet below. Yes, what's happening here? Jack added grumpily. 
he was still sitting on the snow, not far from where the child was standing. Well, I can't say this hasn't been interesting, but I think we're going to have to separate, the lady in white told Howie with a subtle smile. Have you any suggestions? I'll get out of my bindings, Howie told her. He reached down behind himself to the plastic release lever on his uphill ski. He stepped out backward, waist-deep, into the snow, and in a moment they were able to pull free from one another. The lady kicked her skis loose from the snow and gave Howie a final appraising look. Howie wanted to say a hundred things to her, but the frankly sexual manner in which she had examined him left him tongue-tied. He could only give her a goofy smile, like he was some moronic thing from the backwoods who had never seen a woman before. Then he made it worse. I hope I run into you again sometime, he said. He didn't even mean to be funny. It was simply the only inanity he could manage to come up with. She arched her eyebrow at him and turned away. Then she skied down to the little girl. Come on, Angela. Let's go, sweetie. They skied away down the hill. Howie watched her as she made impeccable parallel turns into the great snowy distance below. I wish I could ski like that, Howie said with longing. He was pretty good, but watching her he realized he worked at it too hard. Probably he was too far down on the food chain ever to fully relax into frivolous play. He was willing to bet she had a husband who drove a Porsche and made a million dollars a year and was an even better skier than she was. Let's get going, Jack said wearily. My rear end feels like a block of ice. Jack's rear end was not nearly as enjoyable to contemplate as the lady in whites. Nevertheless, Howie gave Jack a hand up, and then he talked him down the mountain turn by turn. Thinking to himself, holy shit, how many times in a lifetime does a woman like that come sailing into your open arms? And I blew it. I couldn't think of a clever word to say. And then, worst of all, I let her go. 6. When Howard Moondeer looked back over his life, wondering how he had gotten himself into this weird predicament, a seeing-eye Indian to a blind detective, he had to place the blame squarely on his own fatal curiosity. From his earliest childhood, Moondeer had always found white people wonderfully exotic. Laughable, certainly comically full of delusions and lies, but a strangely moving race. He had devoured tales of the pale-faced world with the same wide-eyed interest that an earlier generation of white children once read about Indians. He dreamed of New York, London, Paris, St. Petersburg. He literally read his way out of his dysfunctional corner of Pahasapa, which is the name the Sioux gave long ago to the Black Hills of South Dakota. For Howie, Books were the wings that carried him away from his airstream trailer, the dust and wind, the sheep grazing outside among rusting cars, his alcoholic father, defeated mother, an entire tribe of diabetic, overweight relatives who made him feel ashamed. In later life, white friends sometimes asked him in accusing tones, where was his Indian pride? He tried to explain that in his childhood, Indian pride was not even slightly in the picture. It had died at Wounded Knee and a thousand other places in a century of demoralized captivity on the reservation. Personally, Howie was fixed upon his own bookish path. As a Sioux, he was impressed from an early age that General George A. Custer had graduated last in his class at West Point, the class of 1861. It seemed to him there might be some correlation between this fact. Custer's last standing, academically speaking, and Yellowhair's porcupine ending at the Little Bighorn at the hands of his ancestors. Howie was determined to do better in school himself. He was fortunate in this task to have the help of a sixth-grade teacher, Miss Fransworth, a gray-haired, flat-chested, leather-faced spinster from Nebraska. He was Miss Fransworth's pet, her pride and joy, and probably the only tangible success she ever had as a teacher on the reservation. He read every book she gave him and was hungry for more. Miss Fransworth shared a house with another gray-haired, flat-chested, leather-faced spinster named Miss O'Dowell, who was the librarian in the nearby town of Red Creek. Together, Miss Fransworth and Miss O'Dowell 
planned and plotted his future. For Howie's junior year in high school, they managed to get him a full scholarship to a fancy prep school in Vermont, the Putney School, where the regular students paid over $20,000 a year for the privilege of having a classmate like him who was an authentic Native American. And that was Howard Moondeer's early ticket out of South Dakota. From Putney to Dartmouth, Princeton to Paris, he followed the scholarship trail and became the sort of Indian rich people liked to invite to their summer homes. It was an interesting life, not bad at all, though New York, London, Paris, and St. Petersburg were a disappointment when he finally arrived in these fine places, for they could not possibly live up to his perfect childhood conception of them. White people, he concluded, were about the same as red people, only they had a lot more toys. It was at Princeton that Howie had begun to suspect that human beings were creatures of appetite, and that society was nothing but a kind of henhouse pecking order in which the strong ate better and ate a good deal more than the weak. It was a terrible vision, really. Suddenly, everywhere Howie looked, he saw an open mouth that was poised to gobble something or someone up. This vision gradually matured into a new academic field he called culinary psychosociology. He titled his Ph.D. dissertation, Philosophical Divisions at the Top of the Food Chain and he set out to show how the American dream had turned into the great American divide through a giant but basically simple case of acute indigestion. Budweiser versus Grolsch, iceberg lettuce versus arugula and baby greens. The sort of person who said shrimp and the very different kind who said prawn. These were the issues, he believed, that divided America in two, a seismic, cultural split that was of a more profound and fundamental nature than Republican versus Democrat. His culinary studies led him to Paris eventually on a grant from the Betty Crocker Foundation. American indigestion was always his primary concern, but he was looking for international comparisons and, of course, some fun. He met Bob and Nova Davidson at a small cafe on the Boulevard Raspail. They were at the next table one day, and started a conversation with him. The three soon became the best of friends in a way that's only possible among expatriate travelers. Bob and Nova were from San Geronimo, New Mexico. He was from Red Creek, South Dakota. From the vantage point of a Paris cafe, it felt like they were almost neighbors, part of the same American West. Bob and Nova were both artists, quite talented in their separate ways, but lucky to live on Nova's trust fund, rather than the less reliable whims of the marketplace. They had taken a flat for six months near the Luxembourg Gardens, and soon Howie and they were doing nearly everything together. When the Davidsons returned to the States, they made him promise to visit in New Mexico as soon as possible, and stay as long as he liked in their guest house. In the intensity of their foreign adventures, they had started to feel inseparable. Howie, too, went home eventually, but with a sad heart. There had been a woman in Paris, a fiery, red-headed philosophy student, an American girl taking a year off from Radcliffe, who threw him over eventually for a black rock musician from Nigeria. Even at the time, Howie understood perfectly well that she chose the African because her parents would be even more shocked by him than by Howie, a mere American Sioux. Nevertheless, this did nothing for Howie's self-esteem, and he was in a funky mood. His dissertation seemed suddenly hopeless and boring, not nearly as interesting as the hot wounds of love. He was ready for a break from academia, and from Paris he headed directly to South Dakota, determined to rediscover his roots. For a few months he wore a lot of feathers and buckskin and turquoise, and was about the most Indian Indian you'd ever want to meet. Howie's parents, who ran a gas station on the reservation, thought he was nuts. He soon realized, of course, that there was nothing for him in South Dakota. He had been away entirely too long, and he had never really fit in there in the first place. Even Miss Fransworth and Miss O'Dowell were gone, their dry bodies blown off by the prairie wind to some new destination. So Howie took off his feathers, buckskin, and turquoise, and wondered what to do next. As far as he could see, he was neither fish nor fowl. His education had resulted only in a grand dislocation. He did not belong anywhere. For a few weeks, Howie considered suicide by overeating, but he could not quite settle on the menu. 
In the end, he decided to take up the offer of Bob and Nova, the nice couple he had met in Paris, and become their house guest in New Mexico. And that's how he came to meet Jack Wilder, on a day in September, only a few weeks after he had arrived in New Mexico. The weather was extreme that day, breathlessly clear in the morning, but by the afternoon the wind had come up and the sky was suddenly black with thunderclouds. For no particular reason, Howie decided to borrow Bob's mountain bike and take a ride, little suspecting that his life was about to change. He pedaled out onto the two-lane highway with his ponytail flapping in the wind. When no one was looking, he did a papa wheelie. He was twenty-seven years old, a creature of academia, but riding a bicycle made him feel like he was twelve. The sky grew darker. Rain fell. Lightning crackled in the heavens. How he didn't care. He cruised down a long grade into the eastern edge of town and soon found himself on Kachina Lane, a new residential street carved out of the desert that was lined with freshly planted cottonwood trees, all in a nice straight row. Kachina Lane led into Calle Santa Margarita, a narrow gravel road. Here he entered an older part of town, a mixed neighborhood of old money and even older poverty, side by side. As Howie rode, the rain began pelting down harder, and the wind was furious. Occasionally, the lightning struck so close that he could see where it hit the ground in front of him. Through a break in the black clouds, San Geronimo Peak in the distance was bathed in a single swath of sunlight. Fantastical. It was an unaccountable afternoon. Moondeer ran his bike through a big brown puddle and found himself letting out a high coyote war cry he had learned as a child. He pedaled up a steep grade and then flew down the other side. And that's when he saw a large and ungainly figure, a gray-haired man, struggling in the front yard outside an old adobe house, trying unsuccessfully to get a blue plastic tarp tied down to protect his ripening tomato plants from the driving rain. He made such an odd picture that Howie stopped in order to see him better. The man was framed against the black sky, and the tarp was flapping wildly in his grasp, as though he were wrestling with an angel. The scene was almost biblical. There was a dog, a wet German shepherd, dancing about excitedly at the man's heels. It looked as if the wind was going to pick up the man, the tarp, and the dog as well, and carry them all off together into the black heavens. Howie got off his bike to see if he could be of help. The man didn't see him, and the flapping of the tarp covered the sound of his footsteps. Then the dog noticed his presence and leapt his way as he approached. Who's there? the man cried, spinning about. Just at that moment, a flash of lightning illuminated his face, and Howie was filled with terror. The man did not seem human. Water ran down his stony cheeks. His gray hair was tangled by the wind and rain. There was a scar on the left side of his face. But what terrified Howie most were the man's eyes, fixed and bulging, staring at him hideously. As he stood gaping, there was a crash of thunder, a huge exclamation mark. Howie screamed and tripped backward and fell into the mud. The German shepherd was on him immediately. At first Howie thought the dog was going to eat him alive, but the animal only licked his face with a scratchy tongue and vast enthusiasm. Gotcha! the man shouted. His voice was low and powerful, like a thunder god. Gotcha! Come here! The dog obeyed reluctantly, slinking away from him, tail wagging, moving to the man's side. Howie sat up in the mud, feeling foolish and miserable. Who are you? the man demanded. And there came another boom of thunder, as if on command. Howie was terrified. I'm... I was riding by... Yes, speak up! I was riding a bike, Howie managed. You looked like you needed help. You stopped to help me? Yes, I thought. Well, get hold of the other end of the tarp, then, the man said gruffly. He added more gently. There's no reason to be frightened. I'm not Frankenstein, for Christ's sake. I'm only blind. And as a matter of fact, I would appreciate a hand if you have a moment. Howie laughed at his own terror. This wasn't some unholy spirit after all, but only a blind man in the rain, having trouble with a household chore. So he stood up from the mud and helped the man tie the ends of the tarp to an apple tree at one end of his tomato patch, 
and a picnic table at the other. The wind was so ferocious it took nearly ten minutes to get this done, even with the two of them at work. The dog worried Howie at first, but she turned out to be a real softie, wagging her tail like crazy, overexcited by the drama of the storm in the black afternoon. They were soaked to the skin by the time they were finished, and the blind man invited Howie inside for a cup of tea. "'My name's Jack Wilder,' he said. "'Thanks for stopping by.' "'I'm Howard.' Moondeer answered, doing his best to retrieve his fine, Princeton persona. Glad I could help. The house was a true adobe, probably very old, with thick walls of mud and straw and big old timbers holding up the roof. The kitchen was a large room, with a low ceiling and a kiva fireplace at the far end. Howie had an impression of wooden surfaces and many knives and kitchen utensils, cast-iron pots and pans hanging from hooks, shelves crammed with jars of spices and food. There were potted plants on every window sill as well as on the tables and counters, a few geraniums, a cactus, but mostly spices, since this was a working kitchen, thyme, oregano, basil, chives, parsley. There was a round table of thick dark wood near a window with two rocking chairs set against it all very snug. Jack tossed Howie a towel and told him to have a seat in one of the rocking chairs while he went upstairs to change into dry clothes. When Jack returned to the kitchen, he was wearing dark glasses, and this made it easier to share his company. Jack made a pot of Earl Grey tea and poured a shot of brandy into their cups. "'You're Indian?' he asked, handing Howie his cup. "'Lakota,' Howie agreed." surprised a blind man could tell, for he had worked hard to erase his past and imitate the transatlantic accent of his intelligentsia East Coast friends. It's the way you laugh, Jack explained, a kind of hey hey rather than a ha ha. They took you off the reservation, didn't they? Sent you to a lot of white man's schools? I'm working on my Ph.D., Howie replied, a touch defensively. Are you? What's your field? Culinary psychosociology. Good God, what's that? Jack laughed. He added, I don't mean to be rude, but back in my day we had things like English, math, and biology. I'm not sure I've even heard of this culinary what's-it of yours. Howie smiled tolerantly. Basically, I investigate the connection between diet and behavior. What I'm trying to show is how the cultural divide in America between the left and the right is connected to how people eat. No shit. No shit, Howie assured him. So you plan on teaching this stuff eventually? Not if I can help it. Why's that? Frankly, I'm sick of school. I'm ready to try something else. Jack grinned. Try what, for instance? Howie wasn't sure why he was opening himself to this blind man. I don't know, he admitted. I used to think academia was my bag, but now I'm just not sure. Jack's smile seemed to grow and grow. Have another cup of tea, he said. And such was his first odd encounter with Jack Wilder. How he ended up staying for several hours, much longer than he had intended. It was the start of many long, rambling conversations that he and Jack were to have in that kitchen. After the second cup of tea, Jack began to shell peas into a bowl as they spoke. It was a rhythmic, soothing motion, and after how he watched him a few minutes, he offered to help. Jack gave him the bag of peas and moved on naturally to other kitchen chores, standing at the cutting board and using a large chef's knife with great skill to dice up a yellow onion, red pepper, a jalapeno, Greek olives, a tomato, garlic, fresh thyme, and oregano. He minced and sliced more quickly than Howie thought possible, never nicking a finger. The man fascinated Howie. Though he was blind, he moved about his kitchen with absolute assurance, reaching for jars on the shelves, sniffing occasionally to make certain what they were, hardly wasting a gesture. Howard stayed for dinner and met Emma when she came home from her job at the library. She was a handsome woman, in her early fifties with short, dark hair, that was touched only at the very ends with gray. Howie was sure that in her youth she must have been a knockout. 
Now, like Jack, she was a little stout, and she was not the sort of older woman who spent much of her time on clothes or trying to look young. She once told Howie, months later, that one of the benefits of being married to a blind man was not having to worry about her appearance. Jack and Emma, they became for Howie a second home. In the beginning he dropped by just to say hello, but after a few weeks he began to do odd chores around the house, read to Jack, and chauffeur him to the market when Emma was at work. When Jack tried to give him money for these services, he at first said no. But before long, they formalized their relationship, and Howie accepted a salary. The money, in fact, was a godsend, since he was broke and psychologically in need of paying Bob and Nova some rent for use of their guest house. Oddly enough, however, he had no idea Jack was an ex-cop until nearly two months after they met. Jack simply never mentioned it. And then one afternoon, Howie came across an envelope addressed to Commander Jack Wilder. When Howie asked what sort of commander he was, Jack said he had been a cop in San Francisco, the head of a special investigative unit, until an accident nearly four years earlier had forced his retirement. The accident, how Jack had lost his eyesight, was kept deliberately vague. Howie was not to learn the details for some time, but he came to suspect that Jack had left the envelope deliberately for him to discover, for it heralded a sea change in their relationship. A few days later, he told Howie his plan to start a private detective agency in San Geronimo, and he invited Howie to become his assistant. But Jack, I don't know a thing about being a detective, Howie objected. Of course you do. For the past decade, that's about all you've been doing. Research. Digging about in libraries and finding things. Yes, but that was for school. Basically, there's no difference. We'll simply venture out of the library into real life. Frankly. I think this could be good for you, Howie. Howie had to admit that this was the most interesting proposal that had come his way in a long time. Girls, he thought, would be a lot more attracted to a private eye than a graduate student with a dangling dissertation. And so Jack got his license, which in New Mexico is mostly a matter of paying $200 and undergoing a cursory background check. Then Jack put an ad in the local paper, and they were in business. Wilder and Associate, with their office in Jack's kitchen. For Howie, it made a fun anecdote to tell Bob and Nova, and he began to sign letters to friends back east as Howard Moondeer, P.I. All in all, quite amusing, he thought, and utterly harmless. Basically, Howie thought they were just playing games. Until April Fool's Day, when the game turned serious, and they found their first client dead in the snow. 7. Death has its formalities, and it was not until late in the afternoon of April 1st, when the day was fading to a dim and stormy twilight, that Jack and Howie finally made their way to the Winter House Inn. The bar was crowded, and there was a whiff of wet ski socks and soggy gloves in the air. They collapsed into a booth near the huge stone fireplace. Jack was visibly exhausted, hardly able to drag himself another step. A yule log was burning in a hearth that was big enough for a Texas barbecue. The heat felt good on their snow-reddened faces. A waitress in black jeans and a tight turtleneck sweater appeared at their table. Probably a college girl, Howie judged, taking a year off from school to find herself, i.e. ski and party with the opposite sex, while Mom and Dad paid the greater part of the bills. Hey, guys, she said, eyeing Howie as a possible party mate barely seeing Jack. What can I get for you? A transfusion, Jack told her wearily. Or rather, if you will, a glass of your best blood-red wine. They settled on the wine of the week, a Claude Val, Zinfandel. Jack told her to bring the whole bottle, please. They had spent the past several hours repeating their story to a wide variety of officialdom, first the ski patrol, then the San Geronimo County Sheriff's Department, and finally the New Mexico State Police. The press showed up as well, a local reporter from the San Geronimo Post, and later a TV crew who arrived from Santa Fe, but Jack skillfully ignored their questions. Howie had never been involved in a newsworthy situation before, and he had an odd feeling that it was all make-believe, a group of children playing self-importantly a true-life drama. The ski patrol had been the most difficult encounter. 
They were furious that Jack had skied without the required orange blind skier vest to warn others of his handicapped condition. Wilder and Associate were now waiting to see Josie Hampton, the young woman Jack had helped out of a jam in San Francisco more than a decade ago. Josie had risen far in her father's hierarchy since those days of youthful folly, all the way to the number two position at the ski resort. She had been tied up throughout the afternoon in various urgent meetings, but had sent word through the ski patrol that she wanted to see them. Could Jack and Howie meet her about four o'clock at the winter house? They could, particularly with a glass of good red wine to warm their innards. Josie was nearly half an hour late. Jack and Howie were sitting in a semi-stupor with their wine, half hypnotized by the heat of the fire, when a woman with long black hair appeared at their table. She was short and attractive, a compact woman in her early thirties with a smooth brown complexion. Howie would have taken her for Spanish, except for her light blue-gray eyes, which gave her an oddly displaced appearance, as though someone else were inside her body looking out. Commander Wilder? she asked in a tentative voice. Is it really you? Jack turned his wraparound dark glasses toward the sound of her voice. Josie, forgive me if I don't rise. This is my assistant, Howard Moondeer. I'm terribly sorry about your father. She seemed dazed. I still can't absorb it yet. My God, who would shoot him with an arrow? And why? It's just so crazy. Let's get you a drink. Josie was dressed in jeans and a fluffy white sweater. She was the sort of woman people describe as cute, rather than a beauty. But her voice wasn't cute. It was low and growly, at odds with the rest of her appearance. It was a voice accustomed to giving orders and holding its own among the boys. She raised a finger, and the waitress appeared immediately. Josie ordered a double shot of Couvoisier. I was sorry to hear about your eyes, Commander. The ski patrol told me you were blind. How in the world did it happen? An accident, Jack told her briefly. But I'm doing very well. It was obvious Jack didn't want to talk about his blindness, so Josie turned her attention toward Howie. You're Cheyenne? Lakota, he told her. And then he saw something about her, a mannerism that would be nearly impossible to describe to a non-native. You're Indian too, aren't you? Half and half. My mother was from the reservation here. My dad was about as Anglo as they come, of course. Such is my schizoid heritage. If you feel up to it, I'd like to get your family picture straight in my mind, Jack told her. Sure. Ask anything you want. I'm okay, really. I suppose this will hit me later, but right now I only feel numb. I seem to remember that your mother was Kit's second wife. Not wife. Girlfriend. They never got married. After a small pause, she added with a subtle smile. That makes me a love child, you see. That's the phrase my father liked to use. Jack nodded in an encouraging manner. My family history's a little complicated, Josie continued. Cynthia Hampton was Dad's wife. She's the mother of my half-sister, Allison, who's a few years older than me. But Dad was always big on the ladies, and in the mid-sixties, he had a hot affair with my mother, Maria Concha, who worked as a cashier here. She was only seventeen at the time. When Maria got pregnant with me, Cynthia was not amused, so she split with Allison to California and filed for divorce. This was when your father was a U.S. senator, I presume? No, I was born in 1967 when Dad was still running the ski area. He got interested in politics a few years later. He was in the Senate from 1972 to 1984. During the period when he was in Washington, San Geronimo Peak was put in a blind trust and managed by a Swiss outfit. Let's get back to your mother. How long were she and Kit together? Just a few years. It ended pretty soon after I was born. The cultural gulf between them was too much, I guess. Dad went to Harvard, you know. Mom never finished high school. Did your father ever marry again? Never. Cynthia was the one and only legal union. I guess he decided life was best as a carefree bachelor. Jack frowned. So you grew up with your mother? 
That's right, on the reservation. I never even knew I had an Anglo father until I was 12. I guess I looked different from everybody else with my blue eyes, but Indians can be fairly nice about stuff like that, and no one made a point of it. I thought my father was a guy named Manny Trujillo, whom my mom married when I was two. Manny wasn't from around here. He was a Chicano dude from Los Angeles, but he didn't have blue eyes either, so I guess I should have figured something was up. How'd you find out who your real father was? My mother told me finally. She was drinking. She and Manny drank pretty heavily for a while, and the story just sort of tumbled out one night. I was blown away, as you can imagine. Not only did I have an Anglo father, but he was a millionaire, apparently. A U.S. senator to boot. You must have been curious to meet him. Well, yes and no. It's hard to describe. I mean, I already had a family and a life on the reservation. Anyway, this was during the time Dad was in Washington, and he hardly ever came to San Geronimo, so it wasn't like I had the opportunity to show up on his doorstep, even if I wanted to. Did he take care of your mother financially? Yes, he did. I have to say that for Dad, he was never stingy. I grew up in a nice house, and we had everything we wanted. I didn't realize, of course, where the money came from until I was twelve. Up to that time, I assumed Manny earned it. So when did you get to know your father? When I was seventeen, in eighty-four, after he lost the election and returned home to San Geronimo. Suddenly, he was very curious about me, this daughter he didn't know. Maybe there was something about losing... He was wounded, I guess, feeling rejected, looking to reestablish family connections. I'll never forget the day I met him. It was right after I graduated from high school. He simply showed up at the house one day, this handsome man with silver hair, saying he was my father. I had been fighting with my mother about that time, and I couldn't stand Manny ever, so it was sort of a fantasy come true. Like I was a swan, you know, not a duckling and I belong to a whole different life. Like a fairy tale, Jack agreed. We took a trip that summer to Europe, just the two of us, to get to know each other. Dad was a perfect guide. He spoke fluent French. He knew tons of fascinating people. We tripped around the great cities of the world, staying in fancy hotels. I thought he was fabulous. When we got back to the States, he wanted to send me to college, and that's when I enrolled at the San Francisco Art Institute. Jack was nodding. Eh, this is coming back to me. You have to excuse my memory, Josie. The old brain gets overcrowded when you're my age and things get lost. Your father actually told me a bit of this story when I met him in 1987. When I had my little escapade with the law, you mean, she said ruefully. Yes, your little escapade. You were, what, 21? 20, she told him. I'm 31 now. I see. Now, Josie, I seem to recall there was a scandal that was responsible for your father losing the 84 election, and that it had something to do with this story? She laughed. You bet it did. Those Republicans did a real smear job on Dad in 84. Somehow they found out about Maria and me, that Dad had an illegitimate child. It was kind of the last straw. For months they had been painting him as the Jerry Brown of New Mexico, this total flake who was into New Age meditation and dating Hollywood actresses, etc. It was a very effective campaign, extremely well organized. They saved the juiciest bit, that Senator Hampton had an illegitimate daughter stashed away on an Indian reservation for just two weeks before the election. It was what really did him in. He even lost a lot of his liberal supporters over it, the fact that my mom was underage when he started up with her and that she was a disadvantaged Indian and all that. The Republicans made it seem as if he had abandoned us in a very heartless manner, which wasn't true, actually, at least not in terms of money and child support. But the tactic worked. So your father decided to get to know you. I'm surprised he didn't feel, well, just a bit sour about you. In effect, you were the reason he lost the election. No, Dad wasn't like that. He was very fair. It's strange. I think he had forgotten my existence up to that moment. But once he was reminded, he decided to do the right thing. Josie seemed to enjoy talking about her father. Perhaps it was a way to deny his death. 
but suddenly she bit her lower lip to keep from crying. Poor Dad, I still can't get over it. An arrow. An arrow is very odd, Jack agreed. Tell me, Josie, there's anyone down on the reservation who bore your father some sort of grudge? She looked at Jack in astonishment. The reservation? You think maybe an Indian did it? Good God, none of those guys could shoot a bow and arrow if their life depended on it. Not this century, anyway. Josie drained her cognac and held up the empty glass in an imperious manner for the waitress to see. Excuse me, but I think I'm going to get a little slosh tonight, she said. How are you two doing? Just fine, Jack told her. Back to your family, there are only two children, then. You and your half-sister, Allison? Yes, actually, I don't know Allison very well, since she grew up in California, but she's moved back to San Geronimo recently, and I'm hoping we'll become friends. I want to talk with her. Do you have a telephone number? In my office. We can stop off there afterward. Jack was just warming up with his questions, but Josie had a few of her own. She wanted to know what Jack and Howie had been doing at Doobie Rock. So Jack went patiently through the story once again, from the phone call he'd received the day before to finding the senator on the ledge. It was a story that raised more questions than it answered, and at the end Josie could only shake her head. What in the world did he want to talk to you about? And why meet you there, of all places? she wondered. He didn't tell you about our meeting? Not a word. I'm mystified, really. I know pretty much all there is to know about the business. I'm the general manager, you know. So if it was something about the ski area, I'm sure he would have told me. Your dad said he wanted to show me something at Doobie Rock, and that we would talk about it afterward. Does that ring any kind of bell with you? Jack asked. Something a person might see there. Josie shrugged. Not really. Unless it had to do with dope. That's what skiers generally do at Doobie Rock, you know. They stop there to get a buzz. I've heard that. Was your father concerned about drug use? Not particularly. All employees have to sign a statement agreeing to random drug testing, but that's mostly for our insurance. I've never heard of the rule actually being enforced. Basically, Dad had a live-and-let-live live attitude about stuff like that. So you would say that everything's been going smoothly at the resort? Couldn't be better. Ski Magazine gave us a huge write-up three years ago, said we had better snow and terrain than any place in Colorado. Since then, we've hardly been able to keep up with the crowds. Tell me a little about how San Geronimo Peak is structured. It's a private corporation, is that right? That's correct. My dad is... was the main stockholder. He owned 95% of the land that the ski area is actually on. It's the old Hampton family ranch, you know, but there are 148 investors all in all. Basically, whenever Dad wanted to put in a new lift or expand the boundaries, he'd invite in some outside money. I want to have a list of those investors, if that's all right. Josie seemed doubtful. I hate to bother any of them, but if you think it's absolutely necessary... It's necessary. Now, who owns the remaining 5% of the land? There's just a small chunk on the back of the mountain that's not ours, about 50 acres. It was added back in the mid-60s when Dad decided to expand that side of the resort and build two new quad lifts. Most of the parcel was leased from the U.S. Forest Service, but about nine acres is Indian land, part of the reservation. We have an arrangement with them. What about Doobie Rock? Jack asked. That's on the back side of the mountain. Does it belong to the old ranch? I'm pretty sure that's family land back there, but I'd have to check the plat. Do you think it's important? Jack shook his head. I doubt it, Josie. I'm just trying to get a general picture of things in order to figure out why your dad needed a private detective. You say business has been good. Is there anything else you can think of? Was he cheerful recently? Worried? Preoccupied about anything? Josie was silent as the waitress appeared with her second snifter of cognac. She took the glass and held it for a moment against her cheek, feeling the smooth surface against her skin. I'm not sure I can really answer that. He always acted like everything was wonderful. He was very charismatic, you know, my father. Very entertaining. It's like he had to seduce everyone with his charm. Maybe that's what drew him into politics. 
but what he actually thought about, if he was worried about anything in particular? It's terrible to admit, but I just don't know. And I guess I'll never find out now, either. It seemed to be hitting her now, her father's death. Or maybe it was a cognac loosening her up. She was wandering off into some personal realm of grief, and Jack had worked to hold her. Tell me, Josie, if you had to take a guess at who killed him, who would it be? Just a wild guess? Well, it's crazy, but when the ski patrol phoned and told me the news, my first thought was, the assholes finally got him. Who got him? I don't understand. The people who destroyed him in 1984. Jack was trying to follow her logic. You're saying he was killed by an old political foe from 14 years ago? I told you it was crazy. But those right-wingers hated him. It went beyond any kind of logic. It's like Dad symbolized something for them that set all their bells ringing. I'm not certain you can even call it politics, that sort of hatred. It was more like cultural warfare. I mean, those people wanted to annihilate him. You say those people. But who were they, Josie? Was it a group? I guess so. I don't know for sure. Probably you think I'm nuts, but you did ask my opinion. No, I'm very interested, Jack assured her. When you talk about the past and the people who wanted to destroy your father, is there any single individual who comes to mind? I'm trying to remember the name of the Republican who won his seat that year. James Corman? No. He was a total non-entity who got drummed out of office after one term. He was only a puppet for a bunch of right-wing interests who were behind him. Probably you're going to laugh or think I'm being horribly new-agey. But the way I see it, when you're rich, smart, healthy, when you live a privileged life, when you have everything, you end up creating this terrible opposition, this pool of resentment. And suddenly a big dark fist comes out of nowhere and it wants to smash you. I'm not putting this very well. D do you understand what I'm saying? She appealed, turning to Howie for support, settling her light blue eyes on him. Strange eyes, he thought. It was the first time she had really looked at him since the start of the conversation, and once again he had the odd sense that her eyes didn't fit with the rest of her face. It worried Howie a little. Do you? she insisted. Her voice was breaking with some emotion Howie could not understand. Well, sort of, he told her cautiously. Perhaps it's what the Greeks called hubris. But Josie Hampton was no longer listening. Suddenly she was weeping hot tears into her courversier, bursting with grief for her dead father. Yet it seemed to Howie as if the faucet had been turned on deliberately. He gave her some privacy by looking away. So... A big dark fist out of nowhere, Howie said to Jack, as he led him through the parking lot toward the old Toyota pickup truck that was the Wilder's second vehicle. Anything is possible, Jack replied vaguely. Personally, I like the idea of cultural warfare, Howie said happily. Maybe the god of Budweiser wanted to murder the god of Chardonnay. The storm had ended with the usual abruptness of weather in New Mexico, and there were bright, hard stars twinkling in the night sky. Jack held onto Howie's arm as they trudged together through the snow. The Toyota was buried in the snow, hardly more than a white lump in the parking lot. Jack stood thoughtfully to one side as Howie got busy digging them out with his hands and a whisk broom he found under the seat. A shovel would have been nice. Howie, Jack said after a while, stop what you're doing and tell me something. I want you to remember back to when we were just entering the trail to Doobie Rock. You described the path to me so I'd know where to go. What'd you tell me? I said we were going to follow a pair of tracks into the woods, and that you'd better keep your head down as we went beneath a big old blue spruce tree. You didn't duck low enough, so you got dumped with snow. Yes, yes, Jack said irately. So there was only one pair of ski tracks into the clearing? No. If I remember, there were three tracks, side by side. One was fairly deep, and that's the track I followed because I knew you were getting tired and I didn't want us to work any harder than necessary, breaking new snow. And the other two tracks? One was so light I could hardly make it out. The other was a little deeper, but not as deep as the one we followed. So we have three tracks, Jack pondered. For the sake of convenience, let's call them Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. Now... As a great Indian trekker, 
How would you interpret them, Howie? There's no need to be sarcastic, Jack. I'm being perfectly sincere. Tell me what you think. Easy. The snow was falling at about an inch an hour. Baby Bear was the oldest track, nearly covered. Mama Bear was made maybe half an hour before we arrived. And someone used Papa Bear shortly before we got there. But there could be another explanation, couldn't there? For one set of tracks being deeper than the others? What do you mean? It's possible that ellipse time may not have been so much a factor as the weight of the skier. Do you see what I'm saying? Three people may have entered Doobie Rock simultaneously, side by side, and the lightest tracks could have been made by a young child, for example. Howie blinked at Jack in astonishment. I think I figured it out, he said slowly. It was that cute little girl we met on the chairlift. Probably she went to Doobie Rock to sell drugs and found Kit Hampton on her turf, so she shot him with her bow and arrow and pushed him off the cliff. Jack put on his most annoyingly patient voice. Howie, we're simply looking at every possibility. I don't know if this means diddly shit, but it's important to avoid a personal bias when interpreting evidence. So tell me, could a young child have made the third track baby bear? Well. Theoretically, Jack, sure. And what about Mama Bear? Could that have been made by a light woman? I suppose so. That's all I want to know. Now, let's get the hell home. I've had enough of this mountain for one day. 8. April 1 might have been winter, but April 2 was decidedly spring. At least down in the town of San Geronimo, which stood at an elevation of a mere 7,000 feet. Spring is always a fragile event at such altitudes, with snowflakes never far away, but by April 3 the warmth seemed even more established, penetrating deep into the cold bones of the earth. The sun shone brightly, birds sang in the trees, and the melting snow turned the land everywhere into a big happy mud puddle that was conjugating with the stuff of life. How he felt the onslaught of warm weather in every pore of his body. There was a fragrance in the air that filled him with longing for sweet, dreamy things. At night he tossed restlessly in his bed as he fantasized different endings for what might have happened between him and the lady in white, had they collided thigh to thigh in a less constrained world. As for Jack, he kept to himself for an entire day after the murder. How he wasn't certain whether the exercise on the slopes had been too much for him, or he was simply gathering his thoughts. But on Friday, April 3, Jack phoned Howie early in the morning and told him to come by as soon as possible. They had a full day in store. My God, Jack, you got a haircut! Howie laughed when he drove over to Calle Santa Margarita in the red Toyota truck, the Wilder's second vehicle, which he had on a kind of semi-permanent loan. And look at those new clothes! It was overdue, Jack muttered, stepping into the cab of the truck. Howie couldn't get over it. Normally, Jack looked like a big, shaggy Russian bear. But today he was almost sleek. His curly gray hair had been neatly trimmed, and even the anarchy of his beard was momentarily under control, short and almost military in appearance. From the feet up, Jack was wearing highly polished brown leather shoes, beige slacks, a pink dress shirt with a button-down collar, a dark burgundy-colored tie, and a gray tweed herringbone sports coat. Everything was so new you almost expected to find the price tags dangling. He even had a new pair of dark glasses, aviator style, that made him look like a Hollywood celebrity or a drug dealer. Pretty sharp, bro, Howie told him, grinning like crazy. Okay, okay, enough already about my appearance. Emma took me to Santa Fe yesterday, and we picked up a few things. It's no big deal. But it was a big deal. How he was certain. Part of some mindset, a new beginning, a morale booster. Commander Jack Wilder back on a case again after four blind years. How he felt like teasing him some more, but decided to leave it alone. So, where to, he asked. The Pueblo, of course. Howard Moondeer was as much an outsider at the San Geronimo Pueblo as Jack Wilder. How his ancestors, the Lakota people, were hunter-gatherers nomads and warriors, 
itchy feet Indians who liked to roam. The Pueblo Indians were just the opposite, town folk, a conservative, stay-at-home people who had their own language, their own ways, and had never liked outsiders even in the old days before the white man arrived. The San Geronimo Reservation was situated on the 90,000-acre swath of land to the west of San Geronimo Peak. It was good land, reaching far up into the high mountain valleys, though it was only a fraction of what the Indians here had once called their own. The Pueblo itself, the village at the heart of the reservation, dated from the early 14th century, and it was a maze of adobe condos, rooms built one on top of the other two or three stories high, with wooden ladders connecting the different levels. It was very picturesque, often photographed, but no one actually lived in these ancient rooms anymore. The historical part of the Pueblo existed now mostly for tourists and for traditional ceremonies that were close to the public. Howie parked in the central plaza, an unpaved, muddy square of ground that was surrounded by gift shops. There was a smell in the air of burning cedar from Kiva fireplaces. Old men sat in the sun with nothing much to do. Howie had only been to the San Geronimo Pueblo once before, but he found the Indianness of it deeply familiar. Too familiar, really. He went inside a gift shop to seek directions to the home of Mrs. Maria Trujillo. The woman inside the shop regarded him warily. She did not ask his tribe or offer him refuge from the white world that Howie had learned to call home. Being on the reservation made Howie feel very edgy. There's no Maria Trujillo living here, the woman told him. No? Her daughter Josie told me there was. Not Trujillo. She calls herself Concha again, ever since Manny took off to Oklahoma with some hippie girl. So where can I find Maria Concha? It was work to get directions from this woman, but how he kept at it. He was in a sour mood by the time he stepped back into the cab of the truck. Listen, don't start having some kind of Indian identity crisis on me, Jack told him. What, Jack? What did I say, for Christ's sake? I just feel it coming. I know you, Howie, and there simply isn't time for it now. We're investigating a murder, and I need you to be solid. Howie sighed with exasperation. You're on the wrong track, Jack. You're talking to a guy who's melted in the great American pot. I'm hardly more Indian than you are Irish. That's bullshit, and you know it. Now, please drive. Unbelievable, Howie muttered. He got his jeans muddy, putting the front hubcaps into four-wheel drive, and then he drove along a narrow dirt road that was deeply rutted with puddles of melting snow. They passed through a neighborhood of modest adobe homes, each with a small yard and a TV antenna on the roof. But soon the houses became less frequent. After a while, they crossed a fast-moving stream on a rickety wooden bridge and headed toward the mountains. You know, Jack, I don't mean to spoil the fun, but the truth of the matter is we don't have a client, Howie mentioned as they bounced along the bad road. Of course we have a client. He's simply deceased, Jack countered. And where are you planning to send our bill? Heaven, perhaps? Or is our particular benefactor down below? We'll worry about money later, Jack said breezily. You think Kit's going to come back to life with a nice fat retainer in hand? What I think, Howie, is that someone phoned me for help. But by the time I got to him, he was dead. So we're going to find out, you and I, exactly how this misfortune occurred. Howie was surprised by the anger in Jack's voice. What is it? he asked. You feel you owe him something? Not a bit. It's bad for business, that's all. To have only one client, and then that client gets killed. That's a 100% failure rate, and people aren't exactly going to beat a path to our door if the word gets around. Howie didn't have the heart to say the obvious, that no one was beating a path to their door anyway. And business couldn't be any worse than it already was. They drove the rest of the way in silence, not entirely happy with one another. Maria Concha lived about twenty minutes from the tourist part of the reservation, in a damp, steep valley that did not receive much sun this time of year. Her house was low and light brown in color, and it seemed to Howie almost a caricature of mid-Americana. A front yard with a satellite TV dish, a two-car garage, a living room shaped like a loaf of bread with other little box-like rooms connected to it. The house had been quite modern at one time, but chintzy. 
Now it looked as if a good wind could blow it all away. There was a huge American car in the driveway, an Oldsmobile, a classic gas guzzler from the late seventies that was dented in a number of places and had seen better days. Howie parked behind the Oldsmobile and guided Jack along the short path to the front door. The door opened before Howie could knock, revealing a middle-aged Indian woman. She was short and stocky, and there was a haggard fleshiness to her face that suggested alcohol. She regarded her visitors in an unfriendly manner. Yes, she demanded. Jack let go of Howie's arm. Good morning, he said pleasantly. Are you Maria Concha? She did not reply, but fixed Jack with her stare. Jack reached into the inner breast of his new sports coat and handed her a card from Wilder and Associate, Private Investigations. Senator Hampton was my client, Miss Concha. We're investigating his death. We spoke with your daughter Josie, and she suggested we talk with you. This was not true, but Jack said it very well. The woman studied the card carefully. She even glanced at the back. Well, come in for a few minutes, I guess, she said reluctantly. I told the cops everything I could think of yesterday, which wasn't much. I haven't seen Kit in months. We don't exactly hang out in the same circles these days. The interior of the house reminded Howie of a motel. There was insubstantial, anonymous furniture, even a tourist photograph of the Rio Grande on the wall. The focus point of the living room was a huge old TV set, toward which every chair and sofa faced, as though it were a holy altar. Maria Concha lit a cigarette and sat in an overstuffed armchair, whose springs and stuffing were leaking out. Howie guided Jack to the sofa and sat at his side. He tried to see in Maria Concha something of the pretty seventeen-year-old Indian girl who had caught Kit Hampton's roving eye thirty years ago. But there wasn't much. Indian women can age quickly on the reservation. Their nubile girlhood, only a brief window of opportunity that closes fast. Howie had an idea that this was what Josie would look like when she was older, particularly if she kept downing double cognacs to ease her pain. I'll try not to take too much of your time, Miss Concha. I was hoping you might tell me about the last time you saw Kid Hampton, Jack asked her. She took a long drag on her cigarette. He showed up unexpectedly, she said on the exhale. It must have been January, a few months ago anyway. It surprised me because I hadn't seen him for about ten years before that. He came here? That's right. He showed up one morning at the house, just like you did, without calling first. I made us a cup of coffee. Should have slammed the door in his face, I guess, but I was curious why he'd come. And why had he come? To talk, hang out a little. What'd you talk about? Nothing much. Jack was patient. So after ten years, he simply shows up one morning and wants to hang out? Didn't that strike you as strange? She shrugged. I don't know. Kit and I go back a ways. He seemed tired and out of sorts, and he just wanted to relax with a friend. You consider yourself a friend? Not really. But what the hell? The bad stuff between us happened a long, long time ago. So he was out of sorts. Did he say what was bothering him? The peak? He said it was a hassle to run a big place like that. Too much work, too much stress. Insurance costs were going sky high. Everything had become very difficult. He said he was thinking of giving the whole thing up and retiring to the South Pacific. But first he had to get everything in order. Mm, what did he mean by that, get everything in order? He didn't say, and I didn't ask. It was all bullshit, of course. I used to hear him talk about retiring to a tropical island thirty years ago. It was just something he would say when the mood was upon him, usually to some girl when he wanted to get into her pants. His eyes would get all dreamy and he would go on about palm trees and making love on the beach under the stars. That was Kit. He couldn't really believe a word he said, but it sure sounded nice. So you don't think he actually planned to sell the resort? Maria laughed sharply and shook her head. No way! Owning a fancy ski resort was what made Kit a big shot in New Mexico. Now that he's not a senator anymore, he wouldn't give it up for anything. So what else did he talk about? Did he say anything about Josie or his other daughter, Allison? No, like I told you, he just wanted to sit quietly for a few minutes. He left after maybe half an hour. 
Jack frowned. The senator's visit to Maria didn't make sense to him. Did you get the impression he had come to the reservation that day to do some other errands here? To visit someone else besides you? Maybe. He knows a lot of people at the Pueblo. But he didn't tell you? No, he didn't say. Jack, Howie, and the Indian woman sat quietly for a moment. Somewhere in the house, there was an old grandfather clock ticking. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Time can pass slowly on a reservation. When Jack finally spoke, Howie was astonished because he took a huge leap. Miss Conja, in 1984, when Kit was running for re-election, it was you, wasn't it, who spoiled his chances? She didn't reply. She took another drag on her cigarette and watched him. Jack simply waited as though he possessed as much time as the grandfather clock. Don't call me Mrs. Concha, she said after a while, mockingly. I don't like that Anglo shit. Call me Maria. Very well, Maria. You went to the Republicans who were running James Corman for the Senate, and you told them that Kit had seduced you when you were 17 and that you had an illegitimate child with him. I'm not saying I blame you for what you did. What I want to know is who you spoke with. That was a long time ago. I don't remember. Try to remember, please. She finished her cigarette, then she lit another. How he didn't think they were going to get much out of her, but then she seemed to change her mind and decide she was in the mood for talk. I hated Kit for a while. The bastard used me, and I didn't like that one bit. Used you in what way? My uncle Raymond was the cacique. When she didn't elaborate on this statement, Jack turned to Howie for help. The cacique is the tribe's spiritual elder, Howie told him. I still don't understand, Jack said, turning back to the woman. To get the lease, Kit wanted me to use my influence. Ah, said Jack with understanding. We're talking about the nine acres of Indian land that Kit wanted in order to expand the ski area. What year was this, 1967? It was 66, back when we first started fooling around, and those nine acres were crucial. I didn't realize that at the time. It was where they happened to be located, halfway up the one narrow place where he could build a chairlift on the back side of the mountain. Without those nine acres, San Geronimo Peak would have always remained a dinky little family mountain for beginners. So he wanted you to convince your uncle to agree to the lease. You bet. Only Kit was so slick, he got me to think it was my idea. I offered to do it. I thought it would make Kit love me more. And when Uncle Raymond said no, he was against leasing Indian land to a ski resort. I went to the tribal council and I convinced them. There was a lot of money in it for the reservation, and we were able to build a new school. How long is the lease for? Ninety-nine years. Long enough, so we'll all be dead at the end of it. So the lease did not actually need the cacique's approval. Hey, we live in a democracy here. Uncle Raymond only gives his advice, and these days not many people listen to it. But he has a lot of prestige, and it helped with the tribal council that it was Raymond Concha's niece who had come to them. So you were very useful to Kit. You're damn right I was, and when he got what he wanted from me, he dropped me like a brick. I can understand why you hate him. Can you? Well, I did hate for a while, at least, but as I say, it was a long time ago. And to tell the truth, after many Trujillo, Kit Hampton started to look maybe not so bad. Jack smiled. I gather you haven't been lucky in love? She didn't smile. No, not so lucky. So you went to the Republican who was running against Kit in 1984, Jack said, guiding the conversation back to his earlier question. Yes, I did, she admitted. I spoke to some guy in Corman's office. I don't remember his name. I told him that Kit had got me knocked up with a kid when I was 17. They sent some photographers to the reservation, and for a while I blabbed my head off to anyone who would listen. Kit must have been furious with you. She shrugged. Well, not really. He showed up on the reservation maybe a month after he lost the election. I was a little scared, really, what he might do, but he smiled at me in a sad way and said that he understood why I'd done it, that he was the one who had been wrong. And that was when he started taking an interest in Josie. 
I was glad when he took her away from here because I was afraid Manny might be messing with her. Messing with her? Sexually? I never knew for sure. But when Manny was drinking, he'd screw a donkey. So I was grateful Kit took her off the reservation and gave her a chance to make something of herself. It's funny, but I got to thinking Kit wasn't such a bad guy after all. Interesting story, Jack told us. So you became friends again? Not really friends. But when he showed in January, I guess that's why he didn't slam the door in his face. He was a bastard. But he had done right by Josie. I guess she's going to run things up there, now that Kit's gone. So did he say anything else that day? Anything at all peculiar? Well, there was one thing, she mentioned. It seemed a little peculiar. He talked about the end of the world. Jack's eyebrows went up. How did this come up? Just out of nowhere. He used the word millennium. He asked me if I knew what it meant. In the old days, Kit was always trying to teach me things, you know. I told him I had heard the word, but I didn't really know what it meant. So he explained that a millennium was a thousand years, and that throughout history, whenever people came to the end of a millennium, there was always a lot of magic and mystical things going on, and people saying that the world was going to end. He even told me there was a name for it. Millenarianism. He said this millennium coming up soon was going to be no exception. Things were going to get really out of hand, so we'd better be ready for it. It's in the book of Revelations, Jack told her. Revelations 20, to be precise. After a thousand years, Christ was supposed to return and usher forth a new epic of holiness and peace on earth. That's right. That's what Kit told me. He said a thousand years ago, people went pretty crazy waiting for Jesus to come. But they prayed and waited and prayed some more, and Christ still didn't come. Millennium, Jack wondered, shaking his head. I wonder why Kit was thinking of that. The end of the world, Maria agreed cheerfully. Well, personally, I'm going to have me a beer. She walked to her refrigerator and offered them to join her in a can of old Milwaukee. But Jack and Howie politely declined. So, who killed him, Maria? Jack asked as she drank from the can. How do I know? Take a guess. She shook her head. It wasn't an Indian, anyway. No? An arrow rather suggests an Indian, you know. She continued to shake her head. No one on the reservations uses a bow and arrow anymore. Everybody has a nice hunting rifle these days from Walmart. Everybody? Sure, why not? Everybody except maybe my Uncle Raymond. He's an old-fashioned man. He hates the modern ways. Poor guy doesn't even have a TV set. I'd like to meet Raymond, actually. She grinned so widely that Howie could see a few of her back teeth were missing. I hope you got snowshoes. Raymond lives, well, just a little ways off in the woods. 9. Howie did not have snowshoes, but he did have use of a pair of cross-country skis that belonged to his friend Bob. First, Howie drove Jack home because this was not going to be an expedition for a blind man. Then he stopped by Bob and Nova's, borrowed the skis and boots, they were half a size too large but close enough, and returned alone to the reservation. By keeping the Toyota in four-wheel drive, he was able to make his way about half a mile past Maria Concha's house on a dirt road that climbed into the high pastures until he arrived at a snowdrift that completely blocked forward progress. He parked, slipped into the skis and poles, slung his day pack on his shoulders, and set off into the wilds. It was after two o'clock by the time he got underway, a brilliant afternoon, though the shadows were beginning to lengthen and there was a cold bite to the breeze, a wintry current beneath the spring warmth of the sun. How he found himself on a flat plain, a valley bordered by pinion-covered hills that gradually narrowed into a V as it approached the south face of San Geronimo Peak, the opposite side of the mountain from where the skiing was. At first, Howie had to step around numerous spots of bare ground where there was mud and running water, but as the altitude increased, he was soon in unbroken snow, crunchy corn snow, whose crystals glittered in the sun. He skied with long strides in a rhythmic motion, 
working up a sweat. There were animal tracks in the snow, but no human had come this way since the April 1 storm. According to Maria Concha's map, he was to cross the valley and enter the narrow part of the V, and from here climb along the stream bank until he came at last to Uncle Raymond's cabin, a distance of perhaps seven or eight miles. How he hoped he hadn't started too late in the afternoon to get there and back before darkness fell. After nearly an hour of strenuous skiing, Howie stopped for a drink of water from the plastic bottle in his day-pack. He was alone in a remote part of the reservation. As he stood quietly, he heard the wind rustle the trees and the gurgle of a stream nearby, but there was no human sound other than his own breath and the beating of his heart. No cars, no voices, not even an airplane overhead. The land was so vast and wild it scared him a little. Suddenly there came a shriek overhead. Howie looked up quickly to see a huge dark bird fly across the sun. Was it a hawk? An eagle? A vulture? He had been too long in cities and classrooms and couldn't tell. He returned the water bottle to his pack and set off again, but now there was a small knot of fear in his stomach. The unspoiled woods were still a delight, but he had to admit that the familiar sight of a road or a telephone pole would have been a welcome relief. He tried not to think too much about the loneliness of this place and concentrated instead on his skiing. Another hour passed as he skied deeper into the wilderness. As the valley narrowed, the trees crowded closer around him, and how he had the odd feeling that he was being watched. He could sense motion just off to the side of his vision, but when he jerked his head to look, there was nothing to see but dense forest. Howie was uneasy. Indian land had a different feel than other land. The wind itself seemed alive and restless. There was a kind of sparkle to things, as though there were spirits lurking just out of sight. Howie came at last to the end of the valley and began a steeper ascent by the side of a fast-moving stream. The trees were larger at this altitude, huge old firs, that creaked eerily in the wind. He climbed by sidestepping in the steepest places and sometimes heading straight up the mountain in herringbone fashion where the terrain was more gentle. Several times he fell. He was wearing touring skis that were designed for the flats and they did not have metal edges to grab hold of the slope. Howie was sweating freely now from his exertion, but he was glad to keep moving. Whenever he stopped a moment to rest, it seemed to him that invisible things of the forest began crowding in around him. Hold on a minute. I'm a doctoral candidate at Princeton University, he told himself firmly. I don't believe in Indian spirits. But, in fact, though Howard Moondeer might not believe in Indian spirits when he was in New Jersey, or sipping a glass of wine in town, or riding around in the Toyota with Jack, here in this remote and ancient forest, it was quite another matter. Ahem, said a voice, clearing his throat. How he nearly jumped out of his skin. There was an old man standing on a rock above him, a giant of a man, who looked as if he had appeared suddenly from an earlier epoch of the earth. The old cacique was powerfully built and well over six feet tall. He had a face that was like the side of a granite mountain, long white hair in a braid down his back, and eyes that could have been plucked from an eagle. He was wearing a bearskin cape, leather pants, and high deerskin boots that were laced with rawhide straps. He spoke to Howie a few words in a language that sounded like what trees would say if they could speak. I'm sorry, I don't speak Tiwa, Howie told him. Then I guess I'd better talk American. I've been watching you for the past hour, boy. You sure make a hell of a lot of noise in the woods. Where are you from? I'm Lakota. Are you? Good people, the Lakota. The Oglala, too. I went to a powwow up there once. Must have been about 1962. But you look more like you've come from Los Angeles or New York City. Howie smiled. Have you ever been to New York City, old man? You bet I have. Washington, D.C., too. I met the great white father there. The President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Uh, Nixon hasn't been president for a few years now. No? Well, good riddance. He was not a person with an honest manner. So what brings you to see Raymond Concha? 
I wanted to ask you about another great white father, Senator Kit Hampton. Raymond Concha threw back his head and laughed. Kit! He wasn't so great. I guess he was a father, though. And he was white, at least. I'll say that for him. Right now, I hear he's one hell of a dead white man. Well, too bad for him. How did you hear he was dead? The old man grinned. Maybe the wind told me. Come on, let's have a cappuccino. A uh, what? Isn't that what you young braves like to drink these days? Before Howie could answer, the cacique took off with long strides uphill through the forest. He was wearing snowshoes and he moved quickly. Howie estimated he must be in his late sixties, but with an Indian like Raymond who lived in the woods, this was a whole different age than it would be for a white man. The old man appeared as strong as a buffalo, and he soon left Howie far behind. Fortunately, it was an easy matter to follow his tracks in the snow. A few minutes later, Howie came out into a small clearing in the trees and saw an adobe hut with a thin stream of smoke coming out the chimney. Howie left his skis by the front door and walked inside. It was a hermit's hut, about as primitive a dwelling as human shelter can be, one small room with a dirt floor and an adobe fireplace at one end. There were two low stools, a low table, and a wooden chest. When Howie came in, the old man was putting a heavy metal kettle onto the fire. The cappuccino turned out to be the instant kind from a jar, but nevertheless, Howie was astonished. Coffee's my weakness, Raymond admitted. It makes me feel very wide awake and warm inside. You must go into town occasionally for supplies. Oh, not for years now. But town comes to me. Whenever friends show up, they bring me a present. Everyone knows I like coffee, and someone brought this the other day. I hope you've come with a present too, my young friend. Howie solemnly opened his day pack and brought out the orange and black ski cap that Emma Wilder had crocheted for him. Howie should have felt guilty to give away such a personalized belonging, but in fact, it was a fine opportunity to get rid of the thing, and he could not think of another offering on the spur of the moment. Raymond Concha accepted the gift with ceremony and dignity, placing the cap on his head as though it were a jeweled crown. Very warm, very nice. I will wear this, and I will remember our meeting. The colors suit you, Howie assured him. Very nice, the old man said again. I will give you a present too, but first I need to know you better. We will have coffee, and then you will tell me your story. Sugar? Please. Howie felt oddly comfortable on the hard wooden stool near the open fire, drinking a cup of instant cappuccino with the old cacique Raymond Concha. Like most Pueblo people, the old man let himself be known by his Spanish name, which was the least sacred of all his names. He would have an Indian name, too, of course, several Indian names, most likely, but these he would keep secret from Howie, who was not of his tribe, and there would be at least one name his real name, that no one knew except himself. Secrecy was a large part of native religion. Howie thought it best to simply tell the story of how he had met Jack Wilder last fall, how they became friends, set up a detective agency, and went to Doobie Rock to find their first client with an arrow in his chest. Indians love a good story, and Howie spent nearly an hour narrating these events as vividly as he was able in a storybook order, from beginning to end. Raymond listened appreciatively. He was particularly interested in the fact that Jack was blind, and asked about this several times, nodding with satisfaction when Howie described how well Jack was able to navigate his dark world. Yes, this is good, the old man told him. You should stay with this blind man, Moondeer. I think he's part of your journey. Personally, I've never been one to say that we cannot learn from the white man. I would have them leave this sacred mountain but I do not wish them any harm. They could be happy across the great water where they have come from. As it is, it's very sad to see such a restless and rootless people who have no real land of their own. We must wish them a safe journey home. Howie laughed. Old man, the white man isn't going to return across the great water any time soon. In fact, there are more of them on their way, and they're in a rainbow of colors. Brown men, yellow men, you name it. Raymond did not answer nor did he speak for quite a long time. They will all go away, he announced finally. I have seen it. Perhaps it will not be soon, but it will come. There wasn't much how he could say to this, 
since the phrase, I have seen it, did not invite discussion. Howie debated how best to proceed with the old man, and he decided to plunge right in. Jack wants to know if an Indian killed Senator Hampton. That's why I'm here, to find out about this murder. Raymond shook his head. Indians don't kill white men anymore. Those days are over, Moon Deer. Not even a land-grabbing white man? Someone who turned a sacred mountain into a ski resort? I understand you were opposed to leasing those nine acres of Indian land to the senator. Yes, I was against it. This land has been put into our keeping, and we must protect it. Yes, but the money from the lease built a new school on the reservation and probably did some other good things as well. Money, he said scornfully. You think any good can come from exchanging our sacred land for money? No, it cannot. This is not good. But no one listened to me. It seems that these days all the people are bewitched. They have forgotten the spiritual life. Even here on this reservation, every house has a television set. You know what a television set is, Moon Deer? It is evil magic that robs a man's soul and destroys his mind. But they will see in the end, I think, that I was right. Howie laughed because he did not particularly like television either. We'd all like to return to simpler times, he told the old man. Do you know this place where Senator Hampton was killed? The place the skiers call Doobie Rock? I knew it. That is not its real name, of course. What is its real name? The old man shook his head. This is not for you to know. Well, whatever it's called, Josie wasn't certain if it was part of the Indian lease or the old Hampton Ranch. The old man seemed astonished. This is all Indian land here. What are you talking about? How do you think Kit's parents got this land? They robbed it from the Spanish people who stole it from us. They are all thieves, these people. But Doobie Rock itself, this is what I'm asking about. Was this part of the nine acres that the reservation leased to the ski resort in the mid-sixties? Raymond seemed to take a special effort to speak carefully. This rock you are asking about is a very special place for my people. It has been in our keeping since before time began, and it will be in our keeping after time has ended. It was part of the lease? Yes, and it was the reason I advised the council to turn down Kit Hampton's offer. A sacred place, Howie said. He should have realized it earlier for Doobie Rock was just the sort of odd place Indians would find special. Then it's a great sacrilege that white people are there. Skiers go there to take drugs. Raymond only shrugged. Well, it doesn't matter. The land is very patient. The land will still be there after the skiers have gone. And what about Kit Hampton? What about him? You must have hated him for spoiling this special place. No, I did not hate him. He was the father of my niece's child, so I have never wished him any harm. He was not the sort of man who saw things deeply, but there are many people like that, red men as well as white. Who do you think killed him? That's very obvious. I'm surprised you need to ask. The mountain killed him. Howie raised a questioning eyebrow. You think mountains can shoot a bow and arrow? The old man nodded. Yes, I think so. Some mountains can do whatever they want. Howie grinned. I doubt if the cops are going to be pleased with that answer, Raymond. They want someone they can put handcuffs on. That is not my concern, he answered simply. Howie sensed that Jack would be better at this sort of interrogation. In his own way, Raymond Concho was as elusive as a stream of fast-running water. Maybe you gave the mountain a helping hand, Raymond, Howie asked. Did you shoot Senator Hampton with your bow and arrow? Raymond smiled at the thought. Do I look like a killer to you? I'm not sure. Doobie Rock isn't very far from here, is it? I bet you could probably hike there in a few hours, even in a snowstorm. Less than that, 45 minutes, perhaps. Well, then, did you decide to do a little housekeeping on behalf of your sacred mountain? The old man narrowed his eyes and regarded Howie with a particularly serious expression. I think you should go now, Moon Deer, he announced finally. These are Indian matters, and you have chosen a different path. 
you would not understand if I told you the truth, for your eyes see in a different direction. I don't say you are on a wrong path, for a man must decide his own journey, but you do not see what I see. Try me. Maybe I can understand. But Raymond Concha shook his head, as immovable as the mountain that was in his care. Howie was annoyed to have the conversation end so abruptly, but he saw that Raymond had made up his mind. Howie kept at it for a few more minutes, but the old man seemed to go into a trance where he did not even hear him. Finally, there seemed nothing left to do but stand up and go. Before you go, I have a present for you, the cacique said, coming out of his trance. He walked over to the wooden chest at the far side of the room and reached inside. Howie was a skeptic, a new generation of educated Native American, but still, he could not help being a little thrilled to receive a gift from the holy man. He wondered what sort of magical fetish it might be. The gift was a flashlight, an old, dented, silver ever-ready. May this guide you on your journey home, my young friend, the cacique said elaborately. Howie grinned foolishly. This was not what he had expected, but it turned out to be just what he needed. When he left the cabin, he found that night had fallen, and without Raymond Concha's flashlight, he would certainly have broken his neck getting home. 10. On Saturday morning, Howie and Jack had breakfast at the New Wave Café, a renovated adobe on a narrow street just off the plaza in the historic district of San Geronimo. This was the quaint part of town where all the buildings, by command of the town fathers, were required to look old and atmospheric, even the McDonald's and J.C. Penney. The New Wave was where the arty Anglo set liked to hang out. They had poetry readings at night, and there was usually some fairly awful artwork on the walls, someone's latest show. As a crowd, the arty set were not Howie's favorite people. They liked to pretend they were on the cutting edge of things, but isolated in a small New Mexico town, it was obvious that the world had passed them by. Everybody in town seemed to be talking about the murder. You know what it is, don't you? The mountain simply decided to cleanse its aura, one woman was saying in a loud voice at the next table. Strange how people have decided this crime is a metaphysical event, Jack observed more softly to Howie. Well... That's San Geronimo for you. Welcome to the new age, Jack. Jack snorted and wiped cappuccino foam from his mustache with the back of his hand. Howie had it made among the new agers, being an Indian. But for Jack, it was clearly an uphill struggle to be hip. Tell me more about Doobie Rock, Jack said, continuing a meandering conversation that had been going on all morning. What makes this place so special? Okay. The first thing you got to understand is that Indians don't have churches or temples, at least not in the way you pale persons think of such things. For an Indian, all of nature is a kind of open-air cathedral. The land itself is sacred, and there will be lots of special places scattered about the reservation, certain rocks, trees, streams, caves, hilltops, you name it. These are where you go in order to pray and perform various rituals. Doobie Rock, apparently, is a particularly sacred place, so it's really quite extraordinary that the tribe would agree to lease it to the ski resort. If the cacique is the tribe's spiritual leader, I'm surprised his opposition didn't kill the deal. Jack, a lot of Anglos I know like to romanticize Indians as one big happy tribe, but the fact is, Native Americans are every bit as divided as regular Americans, and pretty much along the same lines. Every reservation I've ever seen has a hot feud going on between its conservative and progressive elements. I don't know why things are set up like that, but it seems almost to be some kind of natural law, like yin and yang. With Indians, the conservatives want to hang on to all the old ways, no matter what. The language, the traditions, and most important of all, the religion. The progressives want to move forward into the modern world. They're the ones who are into education and decent health facilities, which is all very nice. But you have to watch these guys, because they are the ones who are liable to bring strip mines and nuclear waste dumps onto the reservation. Just like Republicans and Democrats, Indians can get pretty nasty with each other, depending on which side of the divide you happen to be on. So, in this case, apparently the progressives won. 
I wonder just how bent out of shape Raymond Concha got over his loss. Tell me, Howie, now that you've met him, do you think he could have put that arrow into Senator Hampton? Well, he could have, Jack. It's physically possible, at least. By car, it's almost an hour's drive from the reservation to the ski area. But if you look at a map, you'd see that Concha's cabin, the way it's situated on the south face of the mountain, it's really very close to Doobie Rock as the crow flies. He himself admitted he could get there in about 45 minutes. He must know all sorts of trails and shortcuts through that forest, but I don't see him as a killer. Hmm. I wonder, said Jack vaguely. Jack was still wondering while Howie ordered another round of cappuccinos and croissants from Sarah, the pretty English waitress. Your turn now, Howie prompted. How did you spend the afternoon? Well, it's the darndest thing. Jack said finally. While you were with Raymond, I had a visit from Captain Ed Gomez of the state police. He's been put in charge of the murder investigation, and he wanted to go over my statement. Not an especially bright guy. His mind is set on some sort of drug angle to the murder, just because it happened to Doobie Rock. And you don't think so? Jack shrugged impatiently. Maybe drugs, maybe not. It's really too early to say... Fortunately, while Gomez thought he was questioning me, I managed to pump him about the police investigation so far. They don't have much. Apparently, the senator was seen riding the 7.45 a.m. chair up the mountain on April 1st. It runs at that hour for 15 minutes for employees to get to work. The senator rode by himself, and then it's like he disappeared off of the face of the earth. No one saw him again. But there are a few troubling items that came out of the autopsy report. For starters, the coroner is estimating the time of death at 10 a.m., half an hour before his appointment with us. Why is that so strange? How we think. The weather was awful that day. Why the hell did Senator Hampton get to Doobie Rock half an hour early to stand around in a blizzard waiting for us? Maybe he had an earlier appointment with someone else. Jack shook his head. It's one thing to go skiing in bad weather. Quite another to linger on the side of a mountain at 11,000 feet in a snowstorm, holding meetings like you're in your goddamn office. No, I don't buy it. It's nonsensical in the extreme. And there's something else that's even crazier. Jack was interrupted by Sarah, the English waitress, arriving with a tray. She had a croissant stuffed with green chili and feta cheese for Jack, a chocolate croissant for Howie, and two more double cappuccinos. One had to keep one's strength up somehow. Something else from the autopsy that's even more bizarre, Jack continued when she was gone, taking a huge predatory bite from his pastry. He had to chew a moment before he could continue. Senator Hampton had sex with a woman less than twenty minutes before he was murdered. No kidding. You know, I'm starting to like this old Casanova, Jack. I hope I have sex twenty minutes before I kick off. On a ski slope in a blizzard? Jack roared so loudly that several of the people at other tables, doubtlessly in the midst of soft artistic conversations, turned to look. Howie shrugged. Hey, it's a cold world. Sometimes you gotta take your pleasures where you find them, bro. Jack and Howie had an appointment at Senator Hampton's house at eleven. Josie said she would be there to show them around and also introduce her half-sister Allison, who was coming to the house for a ten o'clock meeting with a family lawyer. The Hampton residence was a few miles east of town, nestled in the foothills of the mountains among the pinion and pine. The entire estate was surrounded by a high adobe wall. It seemed to Howie a very lovely old wall, thick and rambling, faded ochre in color. But some local kids had scrawled graffiti near the front gate, the inquit spray-can markings of their generation. Apparently, there was no escaping the modern world, no matter what kind of wall you put up. Howie drove in through the main gate and up a long driveway that wound its way gently through a well-groomed forest. They crossed a small stream on a pretty wooden bridge and came out after a few hundred yards upon the house itself, a two-story adobe villa that sat atop a small knoll surrounded by huge old cottonwood trees. There was a blue Jeep Grand Wagoneer outside the front door, and how he parked the Toyota alongside. A Spanish maid answered the doorbell and led them into a huge living room. How he helped Jack settle into a thick sofa, 
and then he browsed around while waiting for Josie and her sister to appear. It was everything a she-she new Mexican house should be. Lots of natural wood, cool tile floors, Navajo rugs on the floors and walls, spectacular views of the desert and mountains. There was a nice Georgia O'Keeffe painting on the wall, a study of rock formations, probably a landscape from her abaki home. A baby grand piano stood near the sliding glass door to the patio, a book of Chopin preludes open on the music holder. Senator Hampton had been an avid Indian art collector. Everywhere you looked, there were kachina dolls, Tony Da pots, Hopi baskets, and Navajo sand paintings. There was even a twenty-foot totem pole outside the living room window, standing grandly at the far end of a lap pool. Totem poles, of course, come from the northwest, not the southwest. And to Howie, this seemed overdoing the Indian motif just a little. The pool was empty of water this time of year, and the stacked faces gazed down on the concrete hole with frowning malevolence. Josie Hampton came into the living room while Howie was busy describing these various house and garden splendors to Jack. She was wearing a blue jogging suit and looked fresher and more attractive than the last time they met at the Winter House Bar. Once again, her light blue-gray eyes struck Howie as odd in such a person of color face, giving her a kind of constantly startled, ironic expression. She seemed to be laughing, slightly, at everything she saw. Commander Wilder, she said in greeting. How are you doing this morning, Josie? Better. I've had a few good cries. But, you know, life goes on. Running a busy ski area doesn't leave a lot of time for grieving. Tomorrow's the last day of the season, and there are a hundred things I need to do to shut down until next year. Jack sniffed the air, which struck Howie as an impolite gesture, even for a blind man. Is your sister Allison here? he asked. Oh, no, I'm sorry, but you missed her. We moved up the meeting with our lawyer, and she couldn't stay. Mm, this is a disappointment. Is she avoiding me by any chance? Oh, no, no, Josie said hurriedly. Allison's just like that, always incredibly busy. Is she? Jack asked Riley. Well, I'll deal with your sister later. Right now, let's talk about your father's love life. I'm interested in current girlfriends. Josie was clearly pained by the subject. She sat down into a stiff, old, ornately carved Spanish chair and crossed her legs primly. This is a missy area, I'm afraid. Seduction was Dad's stock in trade. He used to say it was what kept him young, all that running around. In recent years there have been a whole bunch of affairs, but nothing long-lasting. Who's his most recent conquest? I really don't know. Frankly, I made a point of not knowing. The girls kept getting younger and younger as he got older and older. You know the syndrome, I'm sure. Some of the girls were younger than me. You didn't approve? It's not quite that. It just began to seem sort of pathetic. And I worried about him coming on to the female employees at the peak, that it would be bad for morale and lead to problems among the staff. You know, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if some jealous husband put that arrow in him. Do you have any particular jealous husbands in mind? She shook her head. No, I don't. I tried to tell him that he needed to be more discreet, but he just wouldn't listen. It was like the ski resort was his personal harem, his fountain of youth. God only knows what he was really looking for or trying to prove. To tell the truth, it was a little embarrassing for me as his daughter. Finally, I decided, hell, it was his business, and I'd better just butt out. So you really don't know his latest girlfriend? Oh, I'm sure there was someone. There always was. But no, I didn't ask, and Dad didn't tell me. Living together in the same house, we both decided to give the subject a wide berth. You lived here with your father, Josie? I didn't realize that. Yes, I've taken over the old basement family room during the past few years and turned it into a kind of apartment. It was supposed to be temporary after I broke up with the rat fink boyfriend I was living with. But Dad and I got on pretty well, actually and it turned out to be a nice arrangement for us both. We each had our own lives, of course. We came and went sometimes without seeing one another for days at a time. And he never brought a woman here? He seemed to be obsessed with this one subject. Is Dad's sex life really so important? Yes, it is, Jack assured her. She seemed exasperated. 
Well, he never brought any of his girlies here, anyway. But knowing Dad, he had some twenty-something chicks stashed somewhere. Stashed where? God only knows. I certainly never asked. So sometimes he didn't come home at night? I presume so, but I don't really know. I have my own entrance downstairs, and the house, as you see, is quite large. When's the last time you actually saw him, Josie? Let's see. I guess it was the morning before he died. We had a quick breakfast together. What'd you talk about? Josie shrugged. China, believe it or not. Dad sometimes liked to spout off about politics. He was very opinionated, as you might imagine. Jack pursed his lips. He sat for several moments in a profound silence, frowning, thinking, retreating deep behind his dark glasses. Josie watched him carefully, as though he were a dangerous animal who might strike unexpectedly, and Howie watched Josie watching Jack. The questions had come to a momentary dead end. By the way, I have that list of private investors you asked for, people who have money in the peak, Josie said helpfully. I can get it for you if you like. It's upstairs in Dad's office. Let's go together, Jack suggested, coming out of his trance. It will give us a chance to see the house. You want the grand tour? You bet. With Josie leading the way, they toured the library, dining room, kitchen, back pantry, upstairs bedrooms, even the wine cellar. Howie felt like a running commentary from Architectural Digest, trying to describe it all to Jack. Fortunately, Josie helped out when he faltered or ran out of breath, getting into the spirit of the occasion. As for Jack, his dark glasses constantly scanned his surroundings like two radar screens in motion, taking in impressions through senses Howie could barely imagine. Pretty strange, Howie thought, to walk through the house of a dead man, like inspecting the empty, cast-off shell of a hermit crab. In the senator's library, there were novels in French, Madame Bovary, Le Rouge et Le Noir, Proust, Sartre, and more, which Josie assured them her father read for pleasure in his spare time. There was also a good deal of philosophy, particularly of the Eastern variety. Zen Buddhism, Taoism, the Vedantas, the I Ching, Alan Watts, Krishnamurti, and company. The guy was nearly perfect, how he had to admit. There was an exercise room with a treadmill and Nautilus machine, framed photographs in the hallways of Kit posing with various celebrities, politicians, opera singers, movie stars, even an Italian film director. A citation from the Sierra Club for bringing high environmental standards to the ski industry. A plaque expressing gratitude from the Santa Fe Opera on whose board he had served in the late 80s, doing his civic bit for culture. And, of course, Plenty of vanity photos of Kit swishing down San Geronimo Peak on skis. Kit going through slalom poles in perfect form. Kit in the air flying off sheer precipices of snow. Kit skiing unfazed through a field of moguls that were as big as VW bugs. Kit's upstairs bathroom was at the end of a walk-through closet, and there were his and her sinks, a sunken tub big enough for a Roman orgy, and a toilet with a superb view of snow-covered San Geronimo Peak. How he imagined it must have been pleasant for him to sit on the can and peer out the window to his source of wealth, imagining all those people shelling out forty bucks apiece for lift tickets. Nevertheless, there were sleeping pills and sedatives in the medicine cabinet. This surprised Howie a little. Apparently, life was a bitch for those who had, just as it was for those who had not. How did your meeting go this morning? Jack asked Josie as they lingered near the jacuzzi. Meeting? With your family attorney? Oh, yes. Well, pretty good. He explained how everything was going to proceed, probate, estate taxes, and all that. Dad has a safe deposit box in town, but I gather we can't open it without a representative from the IRS present. So we're getting the ball rolling on that. What is the lawyer's name? Christopher Broach. He has an office in town. Jack nodded in Howie's direction. I'm writing it down, Jack, Howie assured him. And what about your father's will? Jack asked her. Did you discuss the division of the estate? Yes, we read through the will together. Basically, my half-sister and I split everything, with a few small bequests to the San Geronimo Land Trust, the Santa Fe Opera, and KNME, that's the public television station in Albuquerque. 
Dad was always very big on public television. He left them $20,000. And who will run the ski resort? I will. Naturally, the princess will get her share of the profits, along with the other investors. The princess. Sorry, Alison, my dear half-sister. There was something unpleasant in Josie's tone. Since Jack remained momentarily quiet, Howie decided to wade cautiously into sibling waters. Doesn't seem quite fair, he said, that Allison should get half of the ski resort when you were the one by your father's side this past decade helping him run the resort. Oh, I don't mind, Josie replied, but she said it with a sharp laugh that belied her words. Well, to be honest, there's one thing about the will that pisses me off just a little. Dad left her the house. This house? Yep. Dad just gave it to her. The artwork, the furniture, everything. Not that I care about the money, of course. It's more the idea of it. I mean, he knew how much I love this place. I only found this out an hour ago, so I haven't quite absorbed it yet. I'm feeling a bit evicted, if you want to know the truth. Wow. He gave her the artwork, too? How he said with sympathy. I noticed a Georgia O'Keeffe in the living room. That must be worth a fortune. It's been valued at $250,000, Josie said, suddenly angry. And I really love that painting, too. Howie looked over to Jack, certain he'd want to exploit this interesting twist to the conversation. But Jack was gazing back at him, the slightest smile on his face, a go-ahead. Howie saw that this was his chance to be more than Jack's errand boy. So he continued. Why do you think your father did it? Left Allison all this in his will, he asked gently. Josie's expression was distant, full of old pain, old family dramas. I really feel Dad tried to do his best by me, despite the late start. But with Allison, it was always different. She was the princess from day one. She was the legitimate one. I mean, me, I was a quickie. I was conceived in a broom closet up at the ski area. I kid you not, by the way, my mother told me this a few years ago. But Allison, she grew up in a big house in L.A. She went to the best schools. She was always Dad's real daughter, the golden girl, and I guess she was important to him in some way that I wasn't. Probably I shouldn't say this. I don't mean to be petty. And I love my sister. I really do. No, oh, say it. I'm curious. It's just... Well, to be honest, Allison has a way of manipulating men and then discarding them when she's gotten what she's wanted. She's a knockout, of course, totally beautiful, and men have always been wild about her. But she uses them, you know, and I really don't like that. Do you think she manipulated your father? I didn't want to say it, Josie agreed, saying it anyway. But it's true, of course. That's how she relates to men, by pushing their buttons. She's the sort of girl who just bats her eyelashes and guys will do anything for her. She really sucked up to Dad these last few months, and I think that must have... Something to do with why he gave her the house. Josie peered at Howie, suddenly suspicious, as if he might be the shallow sort of male who could be seduced by the mere lure of flesh, her sister, rather than the pure gold of character, herself. Howie concentrated on looking as though sex had little interest for such a scholarly Indian, but Josie wasn't buying it. Somehow he had used up his window of opportunity with her. Jack had been listening carefully and he decided this was the moment to take over the interrogation once again. So where are you planning to live, Josie? Oh, I'll buy a house, I suppose. Actually, Allison's been very nice. She said I should stay here as long as I want. So probably I'm being very bitchy about her. Were there bequests in the will to any other friends or employees at the ski area? He asked. None at all. Women friends? Distant relatives? No, nothing of that kind. The will was really very straightforward. If I may ask, how much money will you and Allison inherit? Not counting the house? Approximately $4 million. After estate taxes, it won't actually be a great deal. The main asset, of course, is a ski resort, which should give Allison and me an additional 300000 a year, maybe more. Of course, I have the responsibility in the work, while she would just receive her check in the mail. Yes, but your father did leave you with a rather good job, Jack mentioned. How much salary will you draw for running San Geronimo Peak? A hundred thousand a year, but believe me, I'll earn every cent of it. I'm sure you will, 
Jack said in a most gentlemanly manner. They continued with their tour of the house. The last room they came to was at the very top of the house, Kit's home office, a small third-floor tower that was reached by a narrow, spiral brass staircase that looked like something you might find in an old lighthouse. Howie was partial to towers, ivory and otherwise, and he described the view glowingly to Jack, a panoramic view of the mountains, the desert, even a scenic slice of the town itself in the distance. There was a small adobe fireplace and a wonderful I'm-on-top-of-the-world feeling to things. Unfortunately, the family attorney, Christopher Broach, had removed all items of interest from the desk itself, the checkbooks, financial documents, and computer disks, taking these to his office to sort through at leisure. There wasn't much left of a nitty-gritty nature for two detectives to get excited about. Oh, look, there's Dad's watch, Josie exclaimed. She bit her lip as she stared at it. It was a gold Rolex, and it was sitting on top of a new hardcover biography of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. His watch? Jack asked with sudden interest. Wasn't he wearing it the morning he was killed? Oh, no, he never wore it. It was one of Dad's quirks. He used to say the electrical impulse of a watch, the battery, the metal, I'm not sure what, interfered with his inner equilibrium. It's a little loony but people in New Mexico start believing stuff like this after they've been here long enough. Anyway, Dad used to go on about how he had an almost perfect sense of time. He claimed he could trust his inner clock. As for the Rolex, he usually kept it in a drawer, or he used it as a paperweight when it got windy up here. Cynthia gave it to him years and years ago. Did he ever ask people for the correct time? Occasionally, when he had an important appointment or something, but rarely. Jack nodded somberly. I see, he mused. And you're certain he didn't have the Rolex with him on April 1st? Absolutely. Captain Gomez is keeping all of Dad's personal belongings that were on him when he died until after the inquest. Ah, here's the list you wanted of the 148 investors along with their various addresses. She reached into a file cabinet and handed several pages of computer readout to Howie. Please keep this list confidential, by the way. The privacy of our investors is naturally very important to us. If you actually decide to contact anyone, I'd appreciate it if you would inform me first. Howie browsed the list as they descended the spiral staircase to the lower floors. There were names he recognized of powerful New Mexico families, but most names he did not know at all. Money, 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 he thought. Who has enough green stuff to put a mill or two into a ski resort? The same sort of person, obviously, who had a gold Rolex to use carelessly as a paperweight. Just as how he was about to fold the list and put it in his pocket, he noticed a particular name on the second page that made his eyes open wide. He took a breath to disguise his excitement. They walked together down the three flights of stairs to ground level. Josie said goodbye to them at the front door, and how he guided Jack to the passenger seat of the pickup truck. He walked around to the other door, slipped in behind the wheel, and waited until Jack had his seat belt properly fastened before delivering his news. Ready for a small revelation, Jack? Try guessing the name of one of the investors. Jack turned his dark glasses toward Howie and frowned. I'm not in the mood for any more guessing. Who? Millennium Investment Corporation, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Interesting, don't you think? that the senator gave a little lecture about millenarianism to Maria Concha? Maybe the end of the world is coming after all. 11. In Lakota, the language of Howard Moon Deer's ancestors, there was an old name for the white man who had invaded their country, Wasiku. Generally, this was translated into English as the greedy one, but the literal meaning was more precisely, he who takes the fat. Whenever Moondeer was inclined to forget the genius of his people, he reminded himself of this single word, Wasiku. He who takes the fat. It was the perfect description of the white man, as far as Howie was concerned, and the birth of culinary psychosociology as well. In San Geronimo these days, if you wanted to take some serious fat, the Blue Mesa Café was the place to go. The word café itself being wonderfully in fashion, chic but understated, 
belying the prices these cafes charged. On Saturday night, after his busy day with Jack, Howie was invited to a dinner party at the Blue Mesa by his friends from Paris, Bob and Nova Davidson. He was frankly glad to forget about Senator Kit Hampton for a while, and Jack Wilder, too. He was certain Jack would disapprove of his fancy off-hour friends, and they, in turn, would find him gauche and much too old and married to be any fun. So he made an effort to keep the divergent parts of his life separate. There were seven people at dinner that evening, seated at a long, languid table in the outside courtyard. The temperature outside was probably in the low fifties, not exactly balmy, but there were clever gas heaters spaced about the courtyard hissing softly, wasting huge amounts of fossil fuel to create the illusion of a warm Mediterranean climate. The table itself was covered with white linen and good china, wine glasses and remnants of salads and appetizers. An attractive waitress came and went with a small army of busboys fluttering behind her. She was a decorative young thing, their waitress, blonde and smooth, pretty as a plate of food, cross-dressed in a man's white dress shirt and paisley tie. How he always found himself wondering where these waitresses came from, looking vaguely erotic in their male attire. As far as he could tell, they appeared in places like San Geronimo almost by magic, part of a culinary support system required at the top of the food chain. Eventually, he imagined, they would be gobbled up by a rich husband. Howie was dressed down for the occasion, making a virtue of his poverty, in old jeans and Birkenstock sandals and a slightly tattered black turtleneck sweater, a fashion plate for Generation X, his ponytail dangling over the back of his sweater. At the far end of the table sat Nina and Diane, a pleasant lesbian couple who ran the Crystal Galaxy, a shop specializing in items necessary to channel energy, worship the goddess, and live a proper New Age life. Next to Diane was Albert, a sculptor who worked and found objects, as he called them, unusual stones, used condoms, beer cans, driftwood, anything the universe dropped on his doorstep, which he welded and glued together into quirky shapes. Farther along the table came Bob and Nova, talking a mile a minute full of fun, and finally, to Howie's right, sat Maddie Jessup, a terrifically healthy-looking blonde woman, twenty-nine-ish, big in the bones with a pretty peasant face. Maddie was the chef at the Corn Maiden, the second-best restaurant in San Geronimo after the Blue Mesa, and Howie was aware that Nova had invited her along for him, a stray gal for a single guy. They eyed one another with cautiously carnivorous intent. "'Have you tried the squash blossoms? They're yummy,' Maddie said, passing him a plate of unborn zucchini, tender budding orange flowers that had been plucked from the plant at just the right moment, then stuffed with Greek goat cheese and very lightly steamed so that the cheese was warmed but the blossoms did not wilt. It seemed to Howie's native sensibilities a tad decadent to eat such pretty, pretty food out of season, for it was not yet zucchini blossom time in New Mexico. He put the blossom to his nose, sniffed it like a bumblebee, then popped it into his mouth. Yummy, isn't it? Mmm, he agreed, though if Maddie said yummy a third time, he was tempted to dump the plate over her head. Have you gone to the bathroom yet? I beg your pardon? The bathroom, she repeated. On the way to the bathroom, you pass over the old well. Oh, yes, the well! He was relieved they were discussing archaeology rather than scatology. After the food, the high prices, and the fashionable clientele, the big thing about the Blue Mesa was the fact that it was built directly upon one of the town's earliest wells, an earthen shaft that had been incorporated into the floor of the bar, covered with clear plexiglass and lit from way down deep with hidden lighting. You could actually step on the plexiglass on your way to the bathroom if the vertigo view didn't bother you and peered downward into San Geronimo's historical past. It was quaint to think of the early Spanish settlers digging for water, blithely unaware that some day in the future there would be an expensive restaurant built upon the spot, utilizing their primitive work for decoration. Humans had certainly come a long way. Now, if you wanted water, you only had to ask the bartender for San Pellegrino. At the far end of the table, Bob, Diane, Nina, and Albert were discussing their inner child. Albert had lost his, apparently, misplaced the poor creature in the ceaseless bombardment of adult responsibilities, the need to pay bills and taxes and floss his teeth. 
With a glint in his eye, Bob launched forth on one of his favorite anti-New Age tirades, one that Howie had heard before. People forget that all this goddess shit and inner child nonsense are at best only useful concepts, he declared archly. They're exactly like Freud's id and superego. They don't exist except as a kind of metaphor, the way a lot of people in San Geronimo talk about their inner child. You'd think they needed to change the damn brat's diapers every few hours. Bob could go on like this for hours. He was very bright and endlessly full of opinions. As far as Howie was concerned, the average Wasiku of the past two generations did not need to discover his inner child as much as his inner adult. But he had learned to keep his mouth shut in these matters. You must tell me about Native American cuisine, Maddie was saying at his end of the table. I'd love to get some really native dishes onto the menu at the Corn Maiden. If you want to go native, you should try some nice raw buffalo heart, fresh from the kill, still pumping blood, he suggested. He smiled a bit too brightly and added, I can imagine the gurgles of delight in a crowded dining room. Serve it at room temperature, I should think, with chopsticks and perhaps a hot towel to clean off afterward. Hmm, with two scallions across the top of the plate, she mused like crossed arrows, perhaps a small mound of pickled ginger and wasabi like you serve with sushi. We'll call it mushi, he said helpfully. Unfortunately, Maddie did not have a sense of humor. She pondered his suggestion quite seriously, wondering if it would help her break through the barriers of oral indifference into international fame. The challenge of today's culinary marketplace, of course, was to astonish the taste buds of people who had tasted everything, to come up with something continually new among all the contestants hoping to win favor in the modern mouth. Maddie was intrigued, but at last she shook her head. No, people in this country hate innards. Anyway, Howie, Native Americans surely don't eat that way today. Not too often, he admitted. Today we're more into refined sugar. You might do best to run a Mars bar special, or corn dogs with lots of bright yellow mustard. Actually, as a kid, I found corn dogs very yummy. He sensed he wasn't being very nice, but there was something about Maddie that rubbed him the wrong way. Howie, you need another glass of champagne, Nova insisted, refilling his fluted glass. They were drinking French champagne this evening in memory of Paris. Nova was red-complexioned, mid-twenties, and modestly attractive in a kind of Flemish way. Howie was her special project, and she gave him a look of warning that he was blowing it with Maddie and should make an effort to be nice. A few months ago, when Bob had been away in Los Angeles, Nova and Howie had nearly had an adventure in her hot tub. They were naked at the time and alone, so it was only natural. They necked a little, but then decided mutually that they simply could not betray Bob. Ever since, Nova had been doing her utmost to fix him up with a girl. Basically, Howie was willing. In his own way, he was searching for Ms. Wright as badly as she, he hoped, was out there somewhere searching for him. Yet it all seemed such a hard lot of work these days, the battle of the sexes. He was lazy, he supposed, looking for romance rather than a relationship. You're looking thoughtful, Maddie said. Probably he's thinking about a case, Nova suggested coyly. A case? Maddie inquired, all ears and she had quite large ears at that. Howie, tell us some of your lurid adventures as a private eye, Bob said, pivoting from one conversation to another. But I thought you were working on your Ph.D., said Maddie. I am. The detective thing is only a part-time job. Isn't it dangerous? Howie shrugged, hoping to look impossibly brave, like one of those bare-chested Indians on the cover of romance novels a half-naked white girl collapsed in their arms. "'Tell Maddie about your case, Howie,' Nova enthused, glad to keep him off the subject of Buffalo Hearts. "'Oh, yes, tell me.' "'Well, first you've got to tell her about Jack Wilder,' Nova insisted. "'I saw him once, Maddie. He looks like a cross between a Russian bear and Jerry Garcia. I swear, that's the only way to describe him. And Maddie, get this, he's blind.' "'A blind detective?' she gasped. But how can he solve anything if he can't see? How he hears his eyes, Bob explained on Howie's behalf. 
how he was about to explain about Jack Wilder and the case, such as it was, when the first of a series of shocking things happened that made this Saturday dinner party an event that was long remembered. Howie smelled smoke. Tobacco smoke. They all smelled it at the same time, a heavy aroma on the evening breeze. At first Howie found the smell rather pleasant. It reminded him of France. Until it fully hit him, what a scandal it was that someone should be smoking a cigarette at the Blue Mesa Café. Their nostrils all quivered with outrage. Nina, Howie observed, appeared as if she were trying not to breathe, lest this terrible thing, second-hand smoke, make its carcinogenic journey into her lungs. Like everyone else, Howie's eyes were doing radar about the courtyard, searching for the source. And then he saw her. It was his lady in white from the chairlift. He was astonished to see her, particularly since she held a cigarette in her right hand, smoke curling upward into the late evening sky. Actually, she was no longer a lady in white. She was dressed in black this evening, a simple but elegant dress that hugged her slim body. She was sitting near the center of the courtyard at a table for two with her daughter Angela. The little girl was wearing an outfit of burgundy-colored velvet, and the mother and daughter appeared deep in a most adult-like conversation. Howie watched as two waitresses and the maitre d' converged upon their table from different angles of the restaurant. For the first time all evening, he was entirely awake. 12. Howie could see now what was only hinted at before, that his snow maiden, previously concealed in bulky ski clothes, was a very pretty woman indeed. Petite features, pale skin, and huge dark animated eyes. Her short feathery hair was hanging in bangs that were parted more or less in the middle in an attempt to make a passage for her eyes. It looked to Howie as if she were trying to grow her hair out, and the process was currently in an awkward phase. Yet awkwardness suited her. Even the cigarette in her right hand did not imply sophistication. She held it inexpertly, like a twelve-year-old with a new vice. Do you know her? Maddie asked, following the intensity of his gaze to its source. I ran into her once. She's a doctor. Hmm, she hummed with disapproval. What sort of doctor smoked cigarettes these days, I wonder? Howie was wondering the same thing himself, and so apparently was the staff of the restaurant who were moving quickly to her table. The maitre d' was a very Italian-looking guy with a soft pussycat face and a ponytail. He arrived at her table, bent forward, and said something that Howie could not hear. I'm awfully embarrassed, she told him. For a delicate woman, her voice carried. I just took up smoking again after a break of eight years. The rules seem to have changed somewhat in the meantime. The maitre d' was sympathetic, but unyielding. The lady took one final deep drag before she stubbed her cigarette out on the ground. It nearly gave Howie an erection just to watch her inhale like that. He had given up cigarettes back in his undergraduate days at Dartmouth, but watching her made him remember all the things he had loved about smoking. A cigarette after sex, a cigarette after dinner. We are empty vessels, Lord, longing for fullness, and for a moment he was tempted to forget petty thoughts of cancer and heart disease and light up a whole pack of Lucky Strike, his old brand, and suck like crazy. Howie, you were telling us about your case, said Nova, trying to get her Cupid agenda back on track. He surgically removed his attention from the attractive mother and daughter in the center of the courtyard. Nova sipped her champagne and gave him a loaded look. If he read her clearly, she was saying, Look, Howie, don't let your eyes wander upon someone else's dinner. You don't like Maddie too much, and I admit she's a bit grating. But for heaven's sake, play your cards right, and at least you'll get laid tonight. So he did as he was bidden, and spoke amusingly about their dead would-be client in the snow. The murder of such a well-known figure in a small town like San Geronimo was big news, of course, so everyone around the table was fascinated with Howie's inside account. There was a lot of clicking of tongues and shaking of heads. Even Bob the cynic was temporarily forced into seriousness. Man, he said, that must really be a bummer to get shot with an arrow. Goodness, can we talk about something else? Like, how about dessert? Maddie said brightly. Personally, I want to try their yummy sorbet. They were deciding on dessert when Howie noticed three strange-looking individuals, two women and one man, 
enter the restaurant and walk three abreast straight past the maitre d's podium into the courtyard. There was something purposeful about them as a group, almost military, that caught his eye. The woman on the left was grim-looking, stout and dark, in her late forties with her mouth sternly set in an inverted U. The woman on the right was younger and blonde, but not in any way what Howie thought of as a sexy California blonde. She was skinny and tall, and there was something squashed about her face, as though her features did not quite dare assert themselves. The man, sandwiched between the women, was short and nebbishy with a bony fish-like face. He was wearing an inexpensive suit that looked as if it were bought off the rack at Kmart. All three of them would have done better in jeans, that great fashion equalizer, but they had tried ineptly to dress up for the occasion. What is it? Nova asked, following Howie's gaze. Friends of yours? He shook his head. As an unabashed people-watcher, Howie was perhaps too quick to pass judgment on different types, but he sensed that this threesome did not in any way belong to the very chic Blue Mesa Café crowd. It wasn't just their unstylish clothing. He knew by looking at them that they ate noodles rather than pasta, white bread instead of whole wheat, and that whatever they ate, they washed it down with a diet Dr. Pepper rather than a good glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. There was more. He could tell they were uncomfortable walking into this feeding arena where they did not belong, crossing the culinary caste lines of a divided America. They attempted to disguise their discomfort with hostile expressions, but they could not fool Howie, an Indian kid who had done some gate-crashing himself, entering with butterflies in his empty stomach the dining rooms of the rich. Howie, what is it? Nova demanded. Probably nothing, he murmured. Yet his sense of unease increased when he saw the three march toward the table in the center of the courtyard, where his snow maiden sat with her cute daughter. The nebbishy man in the middle carried something in a shiny black plastic garbage bag in his right hand. The garbage bag was just one more element of wrongness in the picture. Why, how he wondered, would anyone carry a garbage bag into the Blue Mesa? Then several synapses made connection in his soggy Saturday night brain, and the answer hit him like a blow to the stomach. Oh, my God, he said, standing up. He saw clearly in his mind what was about to happen, but it was unfolding too fast to stop it. The three people reached the table in the center of the courtyard and came to a halt. The lady doctor looked up at them from her main course, the grilled ahi, how he observed, with mango salsa. Her face seemed to drain of blood, and it was obvious that she too understood the meaning of the tableau. Baby killer, the stout woman shouted in a dark, unnatural voice, and the other two took up the chant. Murderer! Murderer! Every eye in the restaurant was upon the man in the middle as he dumped the contents of the black plastic garbage bag upon the dinner table. It was an amorphous mess of afterbirth, a revolting gob of blood and slime that tumbled out upon the white linen. Howie was fairly certain the ghastly offering came from a cow rather than a human, but the effect could hardly be more horrible. From nearby tables he heard people gasping and retching, for it was far from an appetizing sight. The little girl began to wail in terror. She leapt from her own chair into her mother's lap. God will punish you, the stout lady shouted, and the nebbishy man and gangly blonde woman, like a demented Greek chorus, continued to chant, Baby killer, baby killer, Jesus has your number. The lady doctor stared at the bloody mess on the table in horrified fascination. For a moment there was pandemonium. The little girl's terrified wailing rose to a high-pitched scream that pierced every corner of the restaurant. Finally, the mother wobbled to her feet, grasping her daughter protectively in one arm and holding a butter knife in her free hand like a weapon. Things might have gotten very bad, but the maitre d' jumped into the fray and stood between the intruders and the intruded upon, while another employee, a chef from the kitchen, telephoned the police. The chef and maitre d' managed to haul the protesters into a back room to await the authorities. They were Christian martyrs now, no longer terrified bumpkins, and they made their exit with their heads held high. They had done their duty as they saw fit, destroying the collective appetite of their culinary foes. As for the lady doctor, she and little Angela made a grand exit as well. Howie was watching closely as she moved from her table and walked very pale and proud from the courtyard, leading her daughter by the hand. 
He was certain he was not the only person at the Blue Mesa who wished to protect this lovely mother and daughter forever from fanatics who took themselves so seriously as to ruin a person's dinner. You know who that is? I recognize her now, Bob whispered into Howie's ear as the mother and daughter passed close to their table. She's Senator Hampton's daughter. That's the oldest daughter? That's Allison? Howie asked in astonishment. You bet. She was with her father at an art opening about six weeks back. I remember the legs. Suddenly, a lot of things made sense to Howie, even how his snow maiden had come to be such a splendid skier. Her father had owned one of the most famous ski mountains in North America, and, of course, he knew now exactly what sort of doctor she was. 13. Howard Moondeer rose to his feet. It wasn't so much a decision to follow her as an irresistible gravitational pull. Excuse me, he mumbled hurriedly at Nova and Bob. He nodded vaguely, apologetically in Maddie's direction, and then hurried from the courtyard into the restaurant proper and on through to the lobby. He found Allison Hampton and her daughter near the front door, talking with a cop. Allison's voice was calm and decisive. She was telling the officer that she would make a proper statement tomorrow, for right now she must get her daughter home. The policeman was helpless against a woman like this who knew her own mind and spoke with such moneyed certainty. Howie had no such certainty himself. He hardly knew what he was doing. He followed Allison and Angela out into the street. Excuse me, he cried, running up behind them. We met last week on the chairlift. He knew it was a dumb introduction. Skiing was the last thing on the lady doctor's mind after what she had been through. She stopped and studied him with extreme caution, clutching hard to her daughter's hand just in case he tried anything weird. How he saw that he had about ten seconds of her time before she screamed for the cop inside the restaurant doorway. My name's Howard Moondeer. Remember we had sort of a collision on the slopes? I was wondering if you needed any help. From the blank way she regarded him, he doubted if Alice and Hampton had understood much of what he was saying, but he was non-threatening, and she seemed to relax a few degrees. He smiled at the little girl who was watching him with tear-filled eyes. Hi, Angela, remember me? You're the funny Indian. That's me, sure, the funny Indian. Angela grinned, and a small laugh of shy delight escaped her lips. The little girl was recovering fast from the nastiness inside the restaurant. But it was the opposite for her mother who had been icy calm and now was clearly about to fall apart. She seemed unsteady on her feet. Look, he said, why don't I drive you home? It would be no trouble at all for me, and it's not a good idea for you to drive yourself when you're so upset. Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that, she managed. She seemed not to have any clear idea who he was, except a strong young man with broad shoulders and a safe, comforting voice who had appeared at an opportune moment. Angela knew him, though. She held her arms up and said, with childish certainty, Carry me. Up you go, he said, lifting her into his arms. Carrying the child, he walked with Allison across the street to where her car was parked. It was an old MGB two-seater sports car, dark green in color with a beige convertible top. Allison slipped into the passenger seat. Howie handed her the little girl, then took the keys and went around to the driver's side. The interior of the car smelled pleasantly of oil and leather. The engine was deep and growly, but it came to life the instant he turned the ignition. When he looked over at Allison, he saw she was crying. Sorry, so dumb to let those people get to me. But with my father murdered and those damn Christians and everything happening all at once, I mean, hell, I thought it would be nice to take Angela out to dinner. Just her and me, ladies' night out sort of thing. Away from... Everybody being so gloomy and hypocritical about Dad's death. My damn sister crying half the time when it's obvious she's in hog heaven about the money we're going to inherit. Even my mother got into the act, phoning from California in this very fakey, fake voice full of concern. But she's positively gloating, of course, that she actually outlived the son of a bitch. It was quite an outburst. It sounds like a difficult period in your life, Howie admitted. Go straight, she directed. I'll tell you when to turn. Have anti-abortion protesters bothered you before? She flashed Howie an angry look through her tears, as though he must be very stupid even to ask such a question. 
The CMA has been picketing my clinic in Albuquerque for nearly six months now. That's why I moved to San Geronimo. I thought Angela and I would be safe from those idiots up here. What's the CMA? Christians for a moral America. You haven't heard of them? Lucky you. They're a right-wing hate group that's based up in Colorado. Anti-abortion protest is only one of their many activities. They also want to abolish the income tax and make life hell on earth for homosexuals. Gun control is their other big peeve. The list goes on and on. Public hangings of drug felons. And how about the death penalty for children? Now there's a good pro-life cause. These were the people at the Blue Mesa tonight? I assume so. The CMA has been stalking me for months. Stalking you, really? You bet. I'll be driving along and suddenly there's a big American car on my tail, one of those hideous late model things that all look alike. Take a look in the rearview mirror, I bet it's there now. Howie was at a stoplight, so he was able to lower the window and glance behind him. There's a Peugeot station wagon behind us, he said. No, that's not them. They never drive foreign cars, of course. Well, I guess they figure they've done enough to me tonight, so they're taking a little vacation. This is pretty serious, he told her. Stalking a woman is a crime in this state. You should report it to the police. <laughs> the police, she laughed bitterly. Good luck. Mommy, I don't want you to cry any more, Angela ordered, looking up into her mother's tear-stained face. I'm all right, sweetheart, Mommy said, and promptly cried a fresh river of grief. They drove a few miles north on the main highway through town and then turned west onto a dirt road into the desert. It was the little girl who gave Howie the final instructions to the house, temporarily reversing roles with her mother. Here, said Angela, pointing to a driveway that led to a strangely shaped solar home. The front of the house consisted entirely of two stories of glass facing a southerly direction. On the roof were photovoltaic panels and a small satellite dish, giving the place the appearance of an outpost on the moon. Howie parked in the driveway and went around to the passenger side to open the door for Allison and Angela. Thank you, the lady doctor said uncertainly. She seemed to have recovered herself somewhat from her earlier outburst. You know, this is embarrassing, but I was so upset I didn't really catch your name. Howard, he told her. Howard Moondeer. She offered a crisp handshake. Well, thank you, Howard Moondeer, she told him. I haven't met many chivalrous men recently. It was very nice of you to drive us home. We'll be fine now. No problem, he told her with a small smile. Grateful though she might be, he had served his purpose and she was dismissing him in the slightly awkward but haughty manner of an upper-class matron dealing with a delivery boy. He almost expected her to press a fifty-cent tip in his palm. Well, what did he expect? Good night, he said. Bye, Angela, he added with a small wave. Bye, Howard said his friend, the little girl. He turned and walked down the driveway into the dark, starry night. Wait a second, Allison cried after him. What are you doing? I'm walking home. I don't mind. It's not really far. I'll stick out my thumb when I get to the main highway. It was clear that she had not thought about him enough until just this moment to realize the simple truth of his predicament, that since he had driven her home in her car, he was without transportation back into town. Wait, I'll phone for a taxi. He tried not to laugh. Dr. Hampton, there aren't any taxis in San Geronimo. But honestly, I'm fine. Believe me. I've walked longer distances before in my life, and it's a beautiful night. No, it's ridiculous for you to walk, after you've been so kind. Look, I'll tell you what. You can borrow my car and bring it back in the morning. I don't work on Sunday, so I'll have time tomorrow to run you wherever you want to go. Now that the lady in white had decided on doing the polite thing, how he saw there was no arguing with her. So he took her car keys once again and assured her that he would return bright and early. He got back into the MG and fired up the motor. He supposed he was getting somewhere with her. He had her car, at least, so she would have to see him again. But Howie wasn't too optimistic. He was pulling out of her driveway when he heard a scream. It was a terrible scream, full-throated, high and piercing. It scared Howie so much he bit his tongue when he slammed on the brakes. He ran from the car down the driveway and along a short path. The little girl was standing by herself, her mouth quivering, her entire body about to fall apart once again into huge sobs. But it was Allison who had screamed. 
She was standing by her front door looking with horror at something sticky on her right hand. Even in the darkness of the night, Howie could tell her hand was smeared with blood. There was blood all over the front door, and more blood on the huge solar window alongside the front door. It took Howie a moment to see that the blood was streaked in patterns, and the patterns formed words. The word said, Death to the Child Slayer. She turned to him, pale, shivering slightly, a lady in distress if he had ever seen one. Listen, I feel terrible asking you this after you've been so nice already, but would you mind staying with me tonight? 14. Howie was in a light sleep sometime in the dark hours, curled uncomfortably on the living room couch, when he was awoken by a rustling of soft material, a patter of bare feet. Then came a small explosion from nearby. Pop! He jerked bolt upright, terrified, all his senses alert. Then he heard the swirl of liquid pouring into a glass, and the meaning of the sound became clear. He felt pretty silly almost wetting his pants like that over a pulled cork but the last few days had shaken his faith in a safe world. Allison Hampton was coming out of the nearby kitchen with a glass of red wine in her hand. She was in a silky white nightgown, barefoot, looking like some wandering Ophelia, floating ghost-like through the living room toward the stairs to the upper floor. The living room was dark, but a light from the upstairs hall illuminated her. Before she reached the stairs, she turned toward the couch and saw Howie watching her. She changed directions and came toward him. Did I wake you? Not really, he lied. Are you all right? I couldn't sleep. All of a sudden I started worrying about our dog, Rusty. Just what I need, one more thing to worry about. But I haven't seen him tonight. Does he wander off a lot? Sometimes. He's not fixed, so occasionally he has his little jaunts. Want a glass of wine? Sure. She set down her own glass on the coffee table and returned to the kitchen. Howie rubbed his eyes and yawned. The living room was unusual, very modern, a kind of solar atrium that was two stories high with one entire wall of glass on the south-facing side and a flight of stairs on the north leading to a balcony overhead where the upstairs bedrooms were located. With all the glass, the living room was a veritable greenhouse, a jungle of growth protruding from huge decorative pots everywhere a banana tree, bougainvillea, several orange trees, a fig tree, even a few tomato plants bearing fruit. How he imagined in the daytime all these plants were very attractive, but at night the shapes seemed spooky to him. Allison came back with a second glass and a half-gallon jug of gallo hardy burgundy. In some odd way he was relieved she had plebeian tastes in wine. She wasn't a perfect snow maiden after all. She sat in a chair across from him with the light from the upstairs hall behind her, casting her in a dark shadow so that he could see only her luminous silhouette. She looked to him like a dark angel with a halo around her head. She leaned back in her chair and put her bare feet up on the coffee table. I haven't thanked you properly for driving me home and staying here tonight, she said. You did thank me, and it's nothing, really. I still think you should let me call the cops he said, for she had insisted a few hours ago that he should not. In the morning, she agreed. Right now I don't think I could take a bunch of cops asking endless questions. Tell me something. Earlier when I couldn't sleep, I phoned my sister Josie. When I mentioned you, she said you're a private detective. Is that true? Sort of, Howie told her, feeling like a fraud. Jack's the detective. Me, I'm just looking for creative excuses to avoid my dissertation. Jack Wilder's the cop who helped Josie out of that drug bust in California years ago, isn't he? I was wondering, why do you think he let her go back then? I asked him that, actually. He said your sister was only a bystander and that he was after bigger fish. Really? I was always curious how Josie wiggled out of that particular mess. It astonishes me how everybody thinks of her as this innocent Miss Priss. Dad certainly did. She was perfect as far as he was concerned, quite the little helper. You're saying she isn't? Allison laughed. Good God! She was the one who dreamed up that drug scam back in college. Always the businesswoman. That's my half-sister Josie. 
The reason she and her boyfriend were in Haight-Ashbury that night was to pick up a shipment of coke to sell at the Art Institute. But she smiles at the cops like some little goody-goody and gets off with a lecture while the poor guy gets the shaft. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I begrudge Josie her one wild moment. It's just that I can't stand her being such a hypocrite about it. Don't you like Josie? Well, it's complicated. An old family saga. I guess what I really resent is how Dad set up these roles for us. Josie was the good one, you see, who grew up poor, but made up for it by being so level-headed and working so hard. And I was the wild one, who grew up spoiled and rebellious and very impractical. Not that these roles were ever strictly true. I mean, here's Josie selling drugs in college, while I'm studying my ass off to get through medical school. But once your parents typecast you, it's like your character is engraved in stone no matter what you do. What did you do that was so wild? Oh, it was my attitude, mostly. I did the usual teenage things. I played guitar, screwed around, took acid trips at the beach, you know. Allison took a sip of wine. Anyway, it's funny. Your father dies and you think you should be grieving. But mostly I've been reprocessing all the old wounds. Howie had a question he had been waiting for the right moment to ask. There was no right moment, but he popped it now. What about Angela's father? What about him? Where is he? She took another sip of wine, and her bare toes curled around the table. His name was Stephen. I meet him in Nicaragua just at the end of the Sandinista era. He was an American down there as a volunteer, like me. I was working in a medical clinic about an hour outside of Managua. He was a doctor? No, a botanist. He was trying to improve the crop yield and teach the peasants organic farming. We were all so idealistic back then. It was just a brief affair, a kind of consolation, I guess, after America stomped out the revolution. Ronald Reagan and Oliver North never quite understood why they hated the Sandinistas so much, but they did. Eventually there was nothing to do but come back home. Stephen never even knew I was pregnant. He never saw him again. He phoned me once a few years later. It was a bit awkward, really. Hot tropical romances don't travel very well back to reality. Then I heard that he was dead. It's ironic, really. He survived the Contras and the Sandinistas battling it out in Nicaragua, only to get home and be killed in a drive-by shooting in Los Angeles. A friend of mine sent me a clipping from the newspaper. Apparently Stephen was doing some work with a Chicano community in south-central L.A., building community gardens, trying to turn the slums into a green zone. I guess he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is probably a bit personal, Dr. Hampton, but why... I mean, with your profession and all, why... Why didn't I get an abortion when I found out I was pregnant? Yes, she laughed. Well, here's another irony for you. I don't actually believe in abortion. Not for myself, at least. I believe in contraception and choice and rational family planning. That's why I became an OBGYN. Then you wanted to get pregnant. No. Actually, I messed up, she admitted with an impish grin left my diaphragm behind on a particularly lovely moonlit night on the beach. Ah, said Howie. He tried not to imagine the scene too vividly, but he saw it anyway. The moon, the dark sand, palm trees waving in a warm breeze, and Alice and Hampton naked and beguiling. Anyway, it was a shock when I heard that Stephen was dead, she went on. I always imagined Angela would have time to get to know him one day when she was older, but history seems to repeat itself. Now she'll never know her father either, just like me. But you knew your father, Howie objected. You ended up living just a few miles away. That doesn't mean I knew him. Want another glass of wine? She offered. We can get drunk, and I'll tell you the awfully sad story of my life. It was sad, all right. Allison grew up with everything. A nice house in Brentwood, a swimming pool, her own horse at a nearby stable, a car when she was sixteen, trips to Europe, and other awful things like that. The bottle of hardy burgundy went down considerably as Howie listened to this heartbreaking tale. He knew he was getting drunk by the third glass when the gallo actually started tasting good. 
Allison had been three when her half-sister Josie was born, and her mother Cynthia took her off to Southern California and filed for divorce. Two years later, Cynthia married a character actor, Ben Hammond, who made a good living playing bad guys in the movies. Like a lot of actors who played bad guys, Ben was actually a much nicer guy in person than most of the actors who played good guys. His only major problem, according to Allison, was that he was a weakling and a drunk. Not an abusive drunk like Josie's stepfather Manny Trujillo, but a drunk nonetheless. It's odd, isn't it? she said. Both Josie and I had alcoholic stepfathers that we detested. Sometimes I feel like we're mirror images of each other, Josie and I. When did you discover you had a half-sister? Oh, I always knew about Josie, as long as I can remember. Her existence wasn't public knowledge until much later, but everyone knew in the family. Josie was the reason my mother left Kit, and believe me, my mother used to go on and on about it. But you didn't meet her until, not until I was nearly twenty. So it's all very strange. I fantasized about her all the time, of course, this Indian sister I had somewhere. I was terribly envious of her, you know, being an Indian, living with a whole tribe of wonderful spiritually minded people. It seemed a lot more attractive to me than watching Mom and Ben drinking Bloody Marys around the swimming pool. You're smiling. Only because life on an Indian reservation isn't quite as idyllic as your fantasy of it. Oh, I know that now, of course, but when I was a teenager, I imagined that Josie had everything that I lacked. I was sure that in Josie's Indian family, everyone sang and laughed and had a great time. I thought she saw a lot more of Dad than I did. I didn't realize until I was grown up that Dad ignored Josie just like he ignored me. Did you visit your dad often? Not often, but from time to time. I went to Washington once when he was in the Senate. One Christmas we took a ski vacation to Switzerland. A few summers I stayed in Santa Fe where he had a house for a while, but he was always a stranger. Once when I was thirteen I worked up the nerve to ask him about my half-sister, but he was very evasive. He gave me some line about how I would understand when I was older, so he wouldn't try to talk about it now. It only piqued my curiosity, as you can imagine, so it was a real disappointment to finally meet Josie and discover she was quite an ordinary person, who had spent her childhood being as envious of me as I had been of her. Well, the grass is always greener, Howie acknowledged. She was so straight, that's what got me. I mean, I was the Indian in a funny way. For a time I even wore a headband and went around barefoot, but Josie, all she wanted to be was Miss All-American Middle Class. Buying drugs in Haight-Ashbury doesn't sound so middle class to me, Howie pointed out. No, I suppose not. But she wasn't actually getting high, she only did it for money. She's always been very materialistic, you know, maybe because she grew up so poor. She's always craved nice clothes, cars, and things. The things you had but didn't want. Yeah. It's a shame we couldn't just trade places. Poor Josie. I guess she made Dad happy, though. After 1984, anyway, when he decided to acknowledge her. I mean, that was pretty strange, too. Like something out of a Victorian novel. The illegitimate daughter comes forward and takes her proper place in society. But it worked out for both of them. She became his right hand at the ski area, the perfect daughter. All the things he probably wished I would be. Josie stuck by him, I'll say that for her. She's been horribly dutiful. Me, I've been a big disappearing act. And yet, here you are. You moved to San Geronimo. Yeah, I guess I did. One more irony in the fire. It was Dad's idea, actually. He suggested it when I started having so much trouble down in Albuquerque with the protesters. He was worried about Angela, and it seemed to me maybe a good idea, too. I was hoping to get closer to Dad, although it didn't really happen. We certainly saw a lot more of each other after I moved here, but it was always awkward. Your father obviously cared for you, Howie told her, or he wouldn't have left you his house. Allison smiled. Oh, Josie told you about the house, I see. She's pissed as hell. Mostly I think she's hurt, he said judiciously. Well, she shouldn't be. Josie got what she wanted most, the ski resort. As for the house, it was just a guilt offering anyway. Dad trying to make up for ignoring me most of my life. I'll never live there. Frankly, I can't stand the place. It's awfully pretentious, don't you think? It's pretty grand, Howie admitted. 
She poured them each another glass of wine, and then she studied him for a long moment. I like your hair, she announced. Oh, come on, he laughed. No, really. Anglo guys always look ridiculous to me with a ponytail, like they're trying so hard to be hip. But with an Indian, it looks natural. That's because we've had a few thousand years to perfect our coiffure. The savage look, you know. You don't seem terribly savage to me, Moon dear. She reached for a pack of cigarettes on the coffee table. As she leaned forward, the light from behind caught the smooth surface of her chin. Howie was aware that her nightgown had opened at the top, and he forced himself not to peek down the front. Fortunately, he had always been proud of his remarkable powers of self-restraint. Want one? she offered, holding up the pack. You bet, he told her, turning his back on six smokeless years without a qualm. She used a Bic lighter, puffing first on her cigarette and then offering the flame to Howie. In the flickering yellow light, he could see her better. She had beautiful skin, smooth and radiant. He inhaled too deeply, and the smoke hit his lungs with a flood of thick warmth that made his head spin. I'm corrupting you, she said. How old are you? Twenty-seven. I'm thirty-four. Pretty ancient, huh? You don't look very ancient to me, Dr. Hampton. Good God, you'll make me feel ancient if you keep calling me Dr. Hampton. Why don't you call me Allison? Better yet, call me Allie. Allie, he said in an experimental fashion. It made him think of an alley cat. I think I'm going to call you Mooney, she said with sudden whimsy. Moon deer with a round, moony face. My man in the moon. Now you're teasing me. No, I'm not, she told him softly, blowing smoke. You're pretty naive, aren't you? I'm flirting. Howie stared at her in astonishment, since, in fact, this had not occurred to him. She had to spell it out to him. I mean, here I am, sitting with very little on, drinking wine with you in a darkened room, telling you my life story at nearly two o'clock in the morning. Doesn't it give you certain ideas? He felt pretty foolish when she put it this way. Well, yes, of course, he said weakly. But you've been through a lot. I was trying to be sensitive. She smiled. You've been very sweet. And you've been trying awfully hard not to look down the front of my nightgown, haven't you? But go ahead, if you want. Sometimes it's the nice guy who gets the prize. He couldn't say with certainty what happened next. One moment he was staring at her a few inches away, thinking to himself, Holy shit, this is a beautiful woman who just said, if I heard her correctly, that she's mine for the taking. And then the next minute they were kissing. He didn't know who started it if she leaned forward or if it was him. For a long time they didn't touch with their hands or bodies, just lips and tongues, licking and tasting. She tasted clean and good, and expensive and well cared for. A complex, interesting flavor he imagined he could get to like. Then they were tearing off clothes and falling over each other onto the hard floor. For a snow maiden, her skin was burning warm that first electric moment when they touched. When Howie thought about this later, he understood that any sort of euphemism would give the entirely wrong idea of what had happened. This was not making love. This was screwing, pure and simple. They rolled over onto a scratchy Navajo rug. They banged into furniture, both of them grunting and panting like animals. Howie started off on top, but soon she rolled him over onto his back and she proceeded to ride him like a horse. He reached upward and held her small breasts, and they galloped off together into some ultimate Indian sunset. Howie felt like he had been lifted up by an angel and carried clear into genital heaven. He felt pretty good, all in all. But while he was on his back getting galloped, he had a glimpse of the moon through her solar window, and he saw once again the words written on the glass in blood. They were indecipherable hieroglyphs from his position on the floor, but he knew what they said. Death to the child slayer. It cast a shadow on his lust. He remembered that there was a murderer on the loose, and maybe it was a big mistake to be playing doctor with a dead man's daughter on her living room floor. Somewhere in the desert a coyote howled. The sound was so eerie, goosebumps broke out all over his body. A ghost walked on your grave, she whispered, feeling his bare skin. 
This, too, was not reassuring. But his waters were rising, and it was too late now for this particular salmon to turn around and head for safety downstream. Sunday morning, he played catch with Angela in the front yard while Allie cooked breakfast. It was another perfect spring morning, unseasonably warm. The aroma of toast and eggs and coffee drifted from the house. The little girl ran around the garden with an ecstatic expression on her face as Howie tossed her a soft purple Nerf football and made funny faces and clowned. It was obvious that Angela adored having a man around the house. All the nighttime shadows were gone on such a sunny morning, and Howie was a happy man. Howie and Allie and Angela. It was a seductive picture. We'll call the police after breakfast, Allie had promised. You can call Jack then, too, if you want. I'd better, he told her. But they both wanted to put it off as long as possible. Reality. Cops knocking on the door, strangers intruding upon their intimacy. They were reluctant to turn their thoughts from wet thighs and kisses to blood on the window. Howie, catch, Angela cried. She threw the Nerf football as hard as she could high into the air. A breeze came up and gave it some extra lift, and the football flew clear over the Latia fence into the sagebrush beyond. Wow, Howie cried, congratulating her. Yes, something. Breakfast, Allie called, appearing in the front doorway. It seemed to Howie almost like being in some kind of New Age Norman Rockwell painting. Handsome young Indian, white lady doctor, angelic little girl. Be right there he told her. He jogged out the front gate and around the side of the Latia fence to fetch Angela's ball. The purple ball was easy enough to find in the open desert. He spotted it between an anthill and a small prickly cactus. But as he picked up the ball, he smelled something bad. When he saw the source, he nearly threw up. It was the family dog, Rusty, lying in the sagebrush. The Irish setter had its throat cut so violently that the head was nearly severed from its body. A swarm of flies had settled on the open gash. Howie heard Angela running up behind him. He turned quickly and picked her up in his arms and carried her back to the house, a taste of ashes in his mouth. Fifteen After breakfast, Howie telephoned Jack to say that he had found Senator Hampton's oldest daughter and that she was in trouble, besieged by fanatic pro-lifers who wrote messages on her window with the blood of the family pet. Jack had been unexpectedly angry. Howie, for Christ's sake, he exploded. Why didn't you phone me last night when all this happened? Because the lady was exhausted, Jack, and she didn't want any more hassles. Anyway, her trouble with these Christians doesn't have diddly to do with our case, so I thought, hell, the morning is soon enough. Jack's voice was incredulous. Howie, a man, our client gets murdered, shot with an arrow, and then someone terrorizes his daughter, slits her dog's throat, and threatens to kill her too. You don't think there's a possible connection here? What kind of detective are you? Howie became emotional, due, perhaps, to lack of sleep. Frankly, I'm not a detective. I'm a scholar, thank you. And if you don't like my work, you can shove it. Jack seemed taken aback by Howie's tone. He spoke more calmly. This is a murder investigation. Don't you get the seriousness of this? I do, Jack. Naturally, I do. No, you don't. We don't know who the killer is. It could be Allison Hampton, for all you know. Now, that is ridiculous. You think so, do you? Howie, listen to me. When I asked you to be my assistant, I didn't know we were going to get such a heavy case the first time around. I thought I would have a little more time to teach you things. Now, I'm telling you, boy, keep your dick in your pants and your wits about you, or you could get yourself killed here. Am I making myself clear? Obnoxiously clear. Howie was so angry he nearly slammed the phone down. But it was a complicated situation because somehow he felt like a kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He knew he should have called the police last night, and Jack as well, and that he had not insisted on doing so because of his own not so altruistic motives, that a bunch of cops coming over would have interfered with his late-night opportunity to have Allison entirely to himself. This, too, was a cause for soul-searching. Maybe he should have kept his distance from the lady doctor. How he had to admit that the whole thing felt a little wrong to him, and one day when he found true love everlasting, 
there wouldn't be words written in blood and dogs with their throat slit lying in the yard. Later on Sunday morning, Jack had Emma drive him to the house where he took charge in his most imperious manner. He told Howie to please look after Angela for an hour, take the little girl on a walk, something, anything to get the kid out of the house so Mom would be able to talk more freely. Howie felt himself unfairly exiled, but he made the best of it. He drove Angela to the Rio San Geronimo, a half mile from Allison's house, and showed her how to catch fish with her bare hands. It was one of the few really Indian things that Howie could manage. The trick is to lie down quietly on the bank, then reach into the water quickly and pull the fish out from beneath the submerged ledges where they like to hide. Howie and Angela didn't actually manage to land a single fish on Sunday, but they did a great deal of laughing, and they both got very wet. By the time he got back to Allison's house, the state police were there, and Jack had even called the FBI, who were supposedly on their way. So much for the possibility of further intimacy with his snow maiden. Allison seemed so overwhelmed by the situation that she barely glanced at him, her sensitive Indian lover of the night before. Why don't you let me take you and Angela out for some pizza tonight? he asked, getting Allison alone for a second. Maybe we can take in a movie afterward, just the three of us. Get away from all this hysteria. But she only flashed him an exasperated look. I can't, Moon dear. Not tonight. But soon, okay? I'll give you a call. Sure, he said. But when he left that afternoon, Allison had not even asked for his telephone number. On Monday, Jack sent Howie northward on a trip to Colorado Springs. His mission? To investigate the Millennium Investment Corporation, to learn who they were and why Senator Hampton had seemed so oddly interested in the word itself, Millennium, the last time he had visited his old girlfriend, Maria Concha. How he sensed that Jack was deliberately getting him away from Allison. This pissed him off slightly, yet he was grateful for the five-hour drive alone to sit with his thoughts in the cab of the pickup truck, just a speck on the horizon, driving through a high desert plateau on a two-lane highway with snow-capped mountains and the perpetual distance. You could feel the difference almost the moment you crossed the border from New Mexico into Colorado, passing from the red desert and softly rounded Spanish architecture into a more verdant white man's land of trees and mountains and sharp angles. New Mexico was an Indian feline place, whose beauty was mysterious and subtle. Colorado was cowboy canine, and there was nothing subtle about the Rocky Mountains. Such was the cultural divide. New Mexico generally voted Democratic, Colorado Republican, with the exception of a few liberal pockets in such places as Denver and Boulder. It seemed astonishing to Howie how the world always broke down into this clever yin-yang divide. Man, I guess you gotta have either an innie or an Audi, he said aloud, profoundly, as he pulled into Colorado Springs. It was his big thought of the day. He meditated a while on Allison Hampton's innie, deciding that, as these things go, hers really fit like a glove. Colorado Springs was bigger than how he remembered. An attractive town, very clean, nestled against the Front Range Mountains, with Pike's Peak in the near distance, the famous peak where a poet had once been inspired with patriotic fervor to write the verses to America the Beautiful. How he found his way out of the downtown grid into a well-manicured residential section. There were a lot of leave-it-to-beaver houses and station wagons full of moms and kids. This was a last bastion of Anglo-Saxon America, a besieged culture that had retreated from the multi-ethnic coast to make a fortress in the Rockies. The fortress came complete with the United States Air Force Academy and some very secretive NORAD bunkers built into the nearby mountains. Colorado Springs had always been a mecca for the right wing, a town that thought of itself as a kind of anti-San Francisco. Most of all, there were lots and lots of churches. By consulting a map, Howie made his way on Colorado Avenue, past Garden of the Gods Park, toward Manitou Springs. It was close to two in the afternoon when he finally located 3195 Patriot Drive, Suite 304, the address he had for the Millennium Investment Corporation. At first, Howie thought there must be some mistake. The address took him to the Manitou Mall, 
a mid-scale shopping center with a J.C. Penney, Sears, movie complex, food court, and a variety of smaller outlets. To Howie's surprise, Suite 304 was the administrative office of the mall itself, reached through a back hallway between the men's restroom and a bank of public telephones. Howie was about to turn away when he saw Millennium Investment Corp, stenciled in small letters on one side of the glass door. He wandered inside. You must be the Easter Bunny, said a pretty young blonde woman sitting behind a desk. It was a small windowless office, hardly more than a cubicle. An athletic young man had been leaning over her, but he jumped back guiltily when Howie came in. It was obvious that he had been flirting with the pretty blonde, and he seemed uncomfortable at being found out. Howie smiled at them both. Personally, he was in favor of flirting and all activities that continued the species, but they did not smile back. The man had short dark hair, a low forehead, and a pudgy babyish face. But his body was a more serious affair, a wheat lifter's body of big shoulders and huge biceps. He seemed to be bursting out of his clothes, a short sleeve polo shirt, and jeans that were half a size too small for him. He stared at Howie without an ounce of friendliness. Well, I guess I'd better get back to work, darling, he said, slowly to the woman at the desk, but his eyes remained on Howie's ponytail. Call me if you need anything. He snapped his fingers and clapped his hands together, meditating upon Howie's presence for a moment more. Then, without another word, he walked from the office. Howie turned his attention to the woman. She was in her mid-twenties, a blonde with big hair that swooped and dived in various directions about her head. Howie noticed, not necessarily in this order, red lipstick, a kind of permanent orange suntan, blue eyes, a cute little snub nose, and huge breasts that were so picture-perfect and perky one suspected a boob job. She was a cross between a playboy pinup and an all-American cheerleader, a kind of Republican sex goddess, Howie decided. She decided to smile at him. I hope you didn't forget to bring back your ears and tail. Her voice was chirrupy and bright. I beg your pardon? Weren't you the Easter Bunny? Howie spent a moment assuring her that no, he was not, nor had he ever been a rabbit of any kind, nor was he applying for the security job that had been advertised in the newspaper. Then what can I do for you? she asked, not quite as chirrupy as before. I'm looking for the Millennium Investment Corporation. Oh, well, they're not here, of course. This is the Manitou Mall Administrative Office. Yes, I see that, but there's a sign for Millennium on your door. Well, that's because Millennium Investments is the company that actually owns the mall, but there isn't anyone here from them. Where can I find their office, then? Their office? You know, office, where they do business, tables, chairs, a room, maybe someone who can actually answer a few questions for me. What is it exactly that you want to know? she asked, less friendly by the second. Howie wasn't entirely certain why they were having such a communication problem about something that seemed to him quite simple. He tried again. What I want, he repeated patiently, is to know where I can find the office for the Millennium Investment Corporation. She shook her head sadly, pouting just a little. The pout suited her. She was really very sexy, he saw, and he understood why the dark-haired Hulk had been flirty. I wish you were the Easter Bunny, she said, because then I'd be able to help you. I wish I was the Easter Bunny, too. I'd multiply and do all sorts of fun things. So you really can't help me? Perhaps if you tell me what you're interested in knowing, I might be able to answer your questions myself. Howie saw he wasn't going to get past her without a story. So he got a tad creative. Well, the thing of it is this. I represent a consortium of Native American ski interests. What we're doing, we're exploring the concept of a Sioux ski resort in the Black Hills, and the name Millennium came up, naturally, as an investment group with a long history of involvement with the ski industry. Oh, I think you must be mistaken, she told him with a thoughtful frown. Skiing? Oh, yes. I have a friend from San Geronimo Peak who suggested Millennium said this would be just the thing for them, right up their alley. Ski Sue, we're going to call it. Let me make a phone call, she said vaguely. 
how he waited while she picked up her telephone, dialed the number, and spoke softly into the receiver. This is Darlene. Listen, there's a young man here, an um, indigenous person. No, not an indignant person, gracious me. Indigenous. That's right, an Indian. And he wants to talk to someone at Millennium about a ski resort? She looked up at Howie with a cheerless smile. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Howard Moondeer. I'm the vice president in charge of development for the Black Hills Ski Association. Says he's the vice president in charge of development for the Black Hills Ski Association? She repeated dutifully into the telephone. She listened and nodded, and then she hung up the phone. I'm so sorry, just as I thought. There's no one who can help you. But if you leave me your card, perhaps I'll be able to have someone get back to you. Howie patted his shirt pocket. Darn, I'm all out of cards. But maybe I can talk to the person you were talking to just now. I beg your pardon? The person you had on the phone just now. Was that someone over at Millennium? Over at... <laughs> oh, no. She laughed cheerfully at his misunderstanding. That was just Christy at the dental office. I thought she might have some ideas, but she didn't. What does a dental office have to do with Millennium Investments? Oh, nothing at all, said the blonde graciously. Howie was starting to wonder about this conversation. It was like trying to wade through a puddle of Velveeta cheese. He just couldn't get anywhere. Finally, there didn't seem much else to do but write down his name and address and leave. He debated making up a fictitious address, but why add to the absurdity of an already absurd encounter? In the end, he gave his proper address in San Geronimo, feeling he had done enough fibbing. How he left the office with the sense that he had failed woefully at a very simple task. Jack was going to be unhappy with him, and that was the last thing he needed after their fight. How he should have been more aggressive, Jack would say. What kind of detective are you, boy? But what was he supposed to do with a woman who had such a problem with basic communication? Break her arms? Jam toothpicks under her fingernails? What, Jack, what? How he had to acknowledge that he just wasn't any good at this. He really had no idea how to make a person talk who was determined not to do so. As he walked along the hallway from the office, he noticed a young woman coming toward him from the direction of the food court. She looked familiar, though he didn't know from where. She had thick, dark, blonde hair and a Nordic face that was very tan, a pretty girl all in all, a bit stocky, and how he couldn't imagine where he had seen her before. The hallway was narrow, and they had to pass close to one another, since she was walking toward the office he had just vacated. He saw, quite to his surprise, that she had a small gold ring piercing her left nostril. This seemed very avant-garde for Colorado Springs, if not positively counter-culture. How he smiled at her as they passed, and she smiled back. It was the recognition of people in a foreign land who come across someone vaguely of their own kind. He was sure he had seen her before, but he couldn't for the life of him remember where or when. How he walked on a few feet down the hall, but he was so annoyed at his lack of memory that he turned to give her another look. Strangely, she had turned at just the same time to look at him. They laughed. You know... I'm trying to think of where I know you from, he said. She shook her head. No, I don't think we've ever met. Do you ever get down to San Geronimo? Never, she assured him. Then the girl with the nose ring turned decisively and walked away. 16. The food court at Manitou Mall was something. A huge atrium with a glassed-in ceiling and an updated, hygienic version of an old-fashioned carousel in the center to entertain the kiddies. There were brightly colored plastic horses and little chariots and moving benches that went around in circles to a recorded calliope waltz. How he suspected the food court needed such Disneyland extravaganza in order to disguise the sad truth that the food itself was lousy and overpriced. He personally was not fooled. He surveyed his culinary choices with a gloomy eye and opted for an orange Julius hot dog and a lemonade. It seemed to Howie that his trip to Colorado Springs had been a bust. He took his plastic tray to a plastic table and watched the plastic horses go around and around. 
He knew that if he didn't come up with some better piece of detective work than what he had done so far, Jack was going to raise an eyebrow at him when he got home and make him feel like a complete idiot. But what could he do? He took out a ballpoint pen and spiral notebook from his day pack and started jotting down ideas. One, phone the number I have for Millennium. Perhaps someone else will answer besides the Republican sex goddess, and I can grill her, as they say in the novels. Note, check the origin of this strangely culinary slant to detective jargon. Two, check the local phone book for other possible listings of Millennium Investment Corp. Who knows? Three, stroll the mall, pretending to be a happy shopper. Strike up impromptu conversations and ask assorted salespeople if they can tell me anything about who owns this building full of sleepwalkers who buy junk they don't need. Four, what else? Check with the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce. Meander into a local real estate office and ask if anyone's heard the name Millennium. But will any of these upstanding citizens really open up to an Indian with a ponytail who is clearly not their kind? Howie was debating these possible points of procedure when he saw the big-haired, big-breasted blonde from the office cross in front of the carousel and head toward the McDonald's counter. She was waiting in a short line when she was joined by the man Howie had seen earlier bending over her desk, the baby-faced hulk with the muscular arms who seemed to be bursting out of his clothes. He whispered some sweet nothing into her ear, and she laughed. It was interesting to watch the body language of two people who were so obviously sexmates. It was as if the air between them was disturbed by some subtle electric charge. The blonde, how he believed her name was Darlene, left her spot in the McDonald's line in favor of the Hulk, who was clearly a tastier morsel at the moment in her eyes. They stood together restlessly, waiting for something to happen or someone to arrive. It turned out to be the latter, and the someone was the girl with dark blonde hair and the nose ring, who came into the food court from the direction of Radio Shack. Howie still had a maddening sense that he had seen her somewhere before. The group was a threesome now, and the nose ring girl did not seem to fit with Darlene and the Hulk, at least not in Howie's culinary psychosociological scheme of things. She was a pasta primavera, while Darlene and the Hulk were T-boned steaks. Nevertheless, they walked together toward the exit from the mall into the parking lot. This was most intriguing. How he popped the last bite of hot dog into his mouth and decided to follow. It seemed he might have a chance to do some detecting after all. Outside, the sun was shining, a bright, bland afternoon. How he followed the threesome at a distance as they strolled up into the J section of the parking lot, entering a sea of asphalt and automobiles. Just in case they happened to look around, Howie pretended to be a befuddled shopper, trying to find his car among a thousand others that all looked the same. It was a part he had practiced for many times in the past throughout the shopping malls of America, but the group did not glance behind them to see his fine performance. They walked clear to the end of the row to where a dark blue car of recent vintage was parked next to a stubby tree. It was a Detroit Mobile, a large car now that wasting fossil fuel was back in vogue. How he was uncertain of its make. Buicks and Fords and Chevrolets all seemed pretty much the same to him these days. There was a man sitting in the driver's seat waiting for them, and his window came down with a soft hiss. His face seemed very pale, and how he had a glimpse of red hair, but the sun was reflecting on the windshield and how he could not see more than this. The nose-ring girl stood close to the open window and began talking with the man inside. Meanwhile, Darlene and the Hulk stood quietly to one side. As meetings go, this rendezvous seemed to Howie to be of a suspicious and dubious nature. Unfortunately, he was too far away to make out a single word. Howie, you really are a wimp. You mean you followed them out into the parking lot, but you didn't get close enough to hear what they said? Come on, Jack, what am I supposed to do? Sneak up on my hands and knees? Sure, why not? Or are you afraid to get your Ivy League hands dirty? Maybe mess up your jeans? Howie sighed. He knew there was no way he was going to be able to face Jack unless he found out what this parking lot rendezvous was all about. He studied the situation and decided to creep closer, hiding behind the line of parked cars. With luck, he might get near enough to eavesdrop. 
He didn't want to do it particularly, but he supposed he had better give it a try. He set off as quietly as possible, darting from car to car and feeling just a little ridiculous. In a few minutes he was close enough to hear voices. Howie hunkered down behind the rear fender of a GMC truck and strained to listen. It was the nose ring girl who was speaking. No, that's totally unacceptable, she was saying. Look, if you're not serious about this, you need to say so now. All right, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll have to think about that and get back to you. It was frustrating because Howie could not hear the response of the man inside the car, and the fragments of the girl's part of the conversation were meaningless to him. He wondered what Jack would do in a situation like this. Jack, that gung-ho idiot, would probably try to sneak closer yet. Howie was on his hands and knees creeping along the pavement when he noticed two huge tennis shoes a few inches away. Howie looked upward, following the contour of two thick legs and tight jeans. He saw a silver belt buckle, bulging muscles in a sleeveless polo shirt, and finally a pudgy baby face. It was the Hulk, and he did not seem pleased to see Howie. Hey, have you seen my car keys? Howie asked. I must have dropped them somewhere around here. They're on a kind of a roach clip keychain that has a lot of sentimental value to me. Howie thought he was pretty clever to think so fast, but apparently he was not clever enough. Without warning, one of the huge tennis shoes came up swiftly from the ground as though to punt a football. Only in this instance, Howie's head was the ball. He took the kick on the chin as he was struggling to rise to his feet. The force knocked him backward. There was an explosion of light and a gush of pain. He lay on his back, breathing heavily, tasting blood. He tried to sit up, but his head hurt so badly he thought it best just to lie there until the world was a nice place again. A new face appeared above him. It was the man with red hair from inside the car. He had an unusual face, an El Greco face, elongated and strange, the sort of face you might see in a tortured saint in an old painting. The face swam closer in Howie's vision. The red-haired man was kneeling by his head. He had something in his hand, Howie saw, a can of Diet Dr. Pepper. Howie noticed the soda because he was horribly thirsty, but the man did not offer him a sip. Does it hurt? The man whispered. There was something compassionate about his eyes, as though he really wanted to know. Yes, it hurts, Howie managed a dry croak. Then stop this foolishness, because it will hurt more the next time, and you mustn't cause us any further sin, or none of us will go to heaven when the trumpets sound. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Howie did his best to nod, though, in fact, he didn't understand a thing. All he really wanted to do was sleep for a very long time. The red-headed man watched him for a moment, and then he committed a small but unpleasant crime. He took the final swallow of his drink and carelessly threw the can over his shoulder to the ground. It was a while later. How much later, it was hard to say. How he had managed to roll over and get up onto his hands and knees, and he was throwing up against the hubcap of a Mustang convertible. This was exhausting, and he collapsed into his own vomit. Had he been able to see beyond the immediate extremity of his pain, he would have noticed the nose ring girl pass close by. She hesitated briefly as she studied its condition, and then walked quickly across the parking lot. In her hand, she carried a paper bag, and inside the bag, there was an empty diet Dr. Pepper can. She was a tidy girl, apparently, no litter bug. She opened the trunk of her car, threw the soda can and paper bag inside, and then took out a red day pack. There was a cell phone inside the day pack, and she punched in a series of numbers. It's me, she said into the receiver. I'm afraid things are getting a little out of hand. 17. Howie must have slept for a while, because when he opened his eyes again it was late afternoon and he was by himself. He was lying in his own vomit in the narrow space between two cars and the parking lot. Vomit was only part of the bouquet of smells. Someone had dumped a bottle of liquor over him. Muscatel, how he deduced from the aroma. If anyone had walked by, they would have taken him for one drunk, low-class Indian. There was blood on his shirt, and he really was a mess. 
As he sat up gingerly rubbing his chin, a woman holding the hand of a small child walked by and caught sight of him. She clutched her child tightly and hurried on. It took Howie a few minutes to rise to his feet. He was sore. He had a headache. But his body seemed more or less in working order. He wished he could say the same thing for his clothes, which were torn and filthy. The dark blue car was nowhere in sight. His first thought was to go inside the mall and find a telephone and call the police to lodge a complaint against the terrible people who had done this to him. But the way he looked, stinking of muscatel, he realized there was a very good chance that he would be the one to wind up in jail. In an amazingly short time, he had tumbled down the social ladder into an untouchable caste that made people avert their eyes and hurry away. Clearly, there was no more detecting he could do in Colorado Springs, not until he changed clothes and had a shower. At least he had gotten something from this trip that he could bring home to Jack. The Millennium Investment Corporation were suspicious bastards indeed. They were not even slightly pleasant people, and Wilder and Associate should investigate further. For now, this would have to do. Sore and weary, Howie stumbled through the parking lot until he found at last the Toyota pickup truck. He was very glad to fire up the engine and leave Colorado Springs in his rearview mirror. He drove for more than an hour on the open highway until gradually his headache subsided. The sun set behind the western mountains, and Howie was glad for the darkness. It was a humiliation to be beat up and kicked around, an assault not only on his body, but upon his fine opinion of himself. Sometime after dark he stopped at a small roadside diner, but they refused to serve him. He felt altogether too low in spirits even to become angry. Howie turned on the heat in the cab of the truck as he climbed up the steep mountain pass that would lead him back into northern New Mexico, a land more hospitable to Indians, where he longed to be. About 10 p.m., high in the mountains and nearly out of Colorado, he noticed the same car had been behind him now for quite some time, its persistent headlights reflecting in his rearview mirror. He slowed down to let the car pass, but it slowed as well, and stayed in place about fifty feet back. Probably it was nothing, just a station wagon full of some all-American family. Yet he had a funny feeling, a cold clutch of paranoia that he could not entirely shake. He climbed higher along the lonely highway, passing an elevation marker that said nine thousand feet. It was an obscure mountain pass, not a well-traveled route, and at this time of night, Howie and the car in his rearview mirror were the only vehicles anywhere around. Maybe it's a cop car, he told himself, hoping to nail me for speeding. For the next half hour, Howie kept his speed obsessively at fifty-five miles per hour, the precise limit. He made a game of it, watching the red needle on the Toyota dashboard. The road became very winding, and there were times when the headlights behind him disappeared, separated by a curve. Howie decided to try an experiment. He accelerated sharply as he passed around one of the long mountain curves. When the car in his mirror was momentarily lost from view, he slammed on his brakes, pulled over quickly into a turnout at the side of the road, and shut off his headlights. In a moment the car on his tail glided past with a swish of tires and hum of engine, a dark phantom speeding into the night. It went by so quickly, Howie was not even sure what kind of vehicle it was, foreign or domestic. Well, goodbye, whoever you are, Howie said aloud into the night. He turned off his engine and decided to wait a few minutes, just to make certain he would not run into it again further along the road. It was a dark, cold night with only a thin sliver of moon hovering in a misty black sky. To his right there was a bare granite cliff, the mountain itself. To his left, a guardrail and a steep drop-off to a valley below. There was no other traffic now that the car in his rearview mirror had gone by. In the distance, Howie could hear a stream of some sort, moving water, and the sound of the Toyota engine gurgling a little in the dark. It would have been peaceful, but the stillness of the night seemed spooky to him, and Howie would have been glad for a few friendly trucks going by. And then, as Howie's eyes became accustomed to the night, he saw a dark figure on the road in front of him, coming his way. At first, how he thought he must be mistaken. Who would be in this lonely place at night? But there was someone there. He heard the soft but unmistakable sound of footsteps. Step, step, step. 
the shape came steadily closer. Some dim, terrible thing coming his way on this empty mountain road where no one should be. Howie was fluttery with terror. There was a quivery feeling in his chest when he tried to breathe. He strained his eyes, trying to see, but he could only make out an outline of living darkness that was more dense and solid than the darkness of the surrounding night. Howie's hands were shaking as he pressed the plastic knobs on the doors to make certain they were locked. He turned the ignition and the Toyota roared into life. With a grinding of metal, he forced the transmission into first gear, and the pickup leaped forward onto the pavement. He drove blind for a moment, downshifted into second, accelerated, then flicked on the headlights so he wouldn't crash. The beams of light swept the road, and yes, there was a figure there. It was a dozen feet ahead of him on the road, an unrecognizable person, faceless in the sudden glare, standing by the guardrail on the left side of the road, holding an arm to its face as though to shield itself from the encroachment of light. The figure was holding something in its hand that was long and thin. It was a gun, how he saw, a double-barreled shotgun. How he raced the engine in second gear, not daring to pause long enough to downshift into third. As he drew alongside the figure, he watched that the shotgun was raised and both barrels were pointed his way. Howie ducked down low in the cab and jammed his foot on the gas pedal. There was a deafening explosion. The rear wheels of the Toyota seemed to lose their grip on the road, and he started to spin as though he were skating on black ice. Howie sat up and tried to correct the steering, but something was very wrong with the truck. He was skittering out of control, heading toward the guardrail on the left side of the road. He stepped frantically on the brake, but it was too late. When Howie saw he was about to crash through the guardrail, he experienced a moment of enormous calm. There seemed to be plenty of time. Quite calmly, deliberately, he unbuckled his seat belt. As the truck broke through the thin metal and flew out over the side of the cliff, he opened his door and jumped outward into empty space. He was only in the air for a moment, and then came down free of the Toyota upon some soft brush. This seemed like a good thing to him, but he kept on rolling and hit something hard. He came to rest, his back against small hard rocks, the wind knocked out of him, a strange feeling in his lower body. He knew he was hurt, possibly hurt badly, and it seemed most unfair that such a thing should happen to him twice in a single day. Below him he heard the truck crashing through brush, bouncing against earth and rock, a jangle of shattering glass and metal. Then there was a whoosh of explosion, a fireball of light. In the brief glare, how he had a glimpse of the shadowy figure watching from the road above. It didn't seem entirely human to him, but rather some nightmarish thing. As how he watched, the ghostly figure raised the shotgun high above its head in a kind of triumphant jubilation. And then it began to dance. Part Two The Blind Detective One Jack Wilder was having his recurrent nightmare when the phone rang. He always dreamed in color. Dazzling colors. Lush living greens, blues as deep as paradise, red straight from the fires of hell. Only a blind man in his dreams could see colors as rich as these, so beautiful and complex, swirling with electric presence. He saw a sleepy suburban street, an expensive two-story white frame house, a front yard and trees. He was standing in the driveway when the garage door hissed open to reveal the blackest Mercedes-Benz in all the world. The car was pure evil, and the headlights were eyes that searched to find him. Without a sound, the machine came to life and leapt his way like a great hungry beast, seeking to run him down. Jack drew his service revolver. He took the crouch stance he had learned so long ago at the police academy, feet apart, and he fired round after round into the approaching windshield. There were Chinese men inside the car, each of them dressed in dark blue suits and ties. He shot them all, blam, blam, blam. One after another, he blew their heads apart. They exploded like overripe melons, bone and blood. But the car itself refused to die. It kept coming at him as he stood in the driveway, firing his impotent gun. Finally, he threw the gun away and attempted to vault over the hood of the Mercedes as it came rushing upon him, a kind of crazy handstand in which he hoped to get clear of the terrible machine. But he was a middle-aged cop, not a teenage gymnast. He flew into the air with the grace of an elephant and came down too soon, 
head first through the bullet-cracked windshield, his bloody head resting at last in the bloody lap of a drug lord. Rivers of blood, dead Chinese gangsters in a car, a black Mercedes. In his dream as in life, these were the last things Jack Wilder ever saw, a drug bust that had ended his career. The irony was that Commander Wilder wasn't even supposed to be there. He was much too senior, a creature of the high police bureaucracy. He should have left the raid entirely to the people in his command, but had not done so for the simple reason that he was feeling bored at the moment, stale, going through yet one more midlife crisis. Bring went the bedside phone. An old-fashioned telephone, with an actual ringer rather than an annoying digital beep. Jack insisted on it. Jack, shall I get it? It was Emma's voice in bed next to him. I got it, he told her. But when he opened his eyes, the nightmare began in earnest. He couldn't see. He was trapped in a bottomless well, a suffocating darkness in which he felt himself buried alive. This was a bad joke indeed, to see when his eyes were closed, when he was sleeping, but then see nothing when he woke and opened wide. For a moment he couldn't bear it, the terrifying claustrophobia of blindness. A strangled cry escaped his throat. Emma eventually picked up the ringing telephone. It was nearly 11.30 at night. There are sophisticated places in the world where this might be considered early, the start of an evening, but not in a small New Mexican town among people of a certain age. Jack and Emma had been asleep for a good hour. She turned on her bedside light and glanced anxiously at Jack. She knew he had been having his dream, which happened at least once a week, sometimes more, though not as often as four years ago. Jack and Emma's bed was in a snug room on the second floor, with a low ceiling of wood latias, branches stripped of their bark that were set in a traditional herringbone pattern. There was a small adobe fireplace, round and smooth, at one corner of the room, and two well-fed tiger-striped cats. Sushi and sashimi, curled on the bed, fitting themselves wherever they could among the crevices and mountains of Jack and Emma's reclining forms. The cats were sisters, nearly identical. Katja, the German shepherd guide dog, was asleep nearby on the floor. Katja's personal tragedy was that she was not allowed on the bed itself, and the cats, of course, always lorded it over her. Yes, Emma said into the phone. She listened for some time to what the voice on the other end was telling her, interrupting occasionally with questions. But he's going to be all right? Oh, thank God. I see. Well, don't worry about that. Our insurance on the truck will take care of the medical bills. Now tell me about the accident. She put down the phone and studied her husband. Jack was lying on his back, breathing hard, his forehead shiny with cold sweat. Are you okay, honey? I'm fine. It's Howie, isn't it? What's up? He's in a hospital in Fort Willard, Colorado. He ran the Toyota off a cliff on a mountain pass. Jack took a long breath. How bad is he? His right leg is fractured in two places, and he has a concussion, but he's going to be okay. You know these hospitals. Their main concern is that Howie doesn't have insurance. Jack swung his legs from the bed onto the floor. I need you to drive me to Colorado, Emma. I'll put on some coffee while you hunt up our insurance policy for the vultures. He stood and walked toward the bathroom to splash some water on his face. Jack knew every inch of the house and moved with confidence toward the hallway. What he didn't know was that Katya had shifted from her usual spot on the scatter rug and was stretched out on the floor directly in his path. Emma saw the accident a moment before it happened, but by the time she called out, it was too late. Jack tripped over Katya's front paws, and all hell broke loose. The dog yelped in surprise and bounded away. Emma screamed. Jack swore. Even the cats yowled and leapt off the bed in different directions. In a normal household, it would have been a laughable moment, but not so with a blind man. Jack tumbled forward, disoriented. He fell against a dresser and dropped hard on the floor with a cry of pain. Jack! Emma cried, jumping to his side. Oh, damn, that dog! Jack sat up from the floor with a groan. It's not Katya's fault. Usually I feel about for her, 
but I wasn't thinking. I was disoriented from my dream. Oh, Jack, you're bleeding. You hit your head. It broke her heart to see him like this, helpless and bleeding. I'm okay, he said stubbornly. You have a gash beneath your eye. I think you're going to need stitches. I'm okay, Emma, he said irritably. He shook his head, disgusted with himself. I'm sorry. I don't mean to take this out on you. Look, if you can just stop the bleeding. Emma went to fetch him a towel from the bathroom, leaving Jack on the floor. He hated the low comedy of this, to find himself a blind man who couldn't even make his way to the bathroom without tripping over a sleeping dog. So what am I going to do? He asked himself. There are only two choices. I can put a pistol in my mouth and pull the trigger, or I can pick myself up and try again. Each day for four years, Jack had come to the same crossroads. It was always necessary to make a new effort, a new resolve. Tonight it seemed particularly hopeless. Howie in the hospital, himself on the floor. It was hard to imagine a less suspicious moment for the firm of Wilder and Associates. They reached the hospital in Fort Willard, Colorado, at nearly three o'clock in the morning. Emma left him alone in a chair in the waiting area outside the emergency room and went to investigate Howie's condition. Jack fought down the panic that came with being by himself in an unfamiliar place. He hated hospitals, and with good reason, knowing them too well. He needed to pee, but now he would have to wait until Emma returned to help him find his way. He wondered whether he was in a large or small room. It helped to define his universe, see his surroundings in some way. It was a small room, he decided, from the close acoustics. There was a woman at the reception desk talking about her insurance policy. She had brought in her husband with chest pains, and now she was going through the paperwork to get him admitted. I'm going to sit here patiently, Jack told himself firmly. I will not panic. Nevertheless. It was a relief when he heard Emma's footsteps and smelled her warm, familiar scent. Sorry to take so long, she said. They have him in intensive care. I had to wait until I could speak to the head nurse. There aren't supposed to be visitors this time of night, but I talked her into it since we came so far. We can go in and see him for five minutes. Are you okay, Jack? I gotta take a goddamn leak. Can you walk me to the men's room? Of course, honey. There's no need for you to get upset. Upset? I can't even go to the bathroom without asking my wife for help. Only in unfamiliar surroundings, she told him mildly. Jack was having a bad night. But these moments came and went, and she knew from practice how to deal with them. She took his arm and led him to the door of the men's room. There was no one around this time of night, and she wished she could walk him into the bathroom and lead him to a urinal but she knew it was better to let him pee on the floor than to destroy his dignity with her solicitude. Howie would never suspect the price Jack paid for his apparent calm, that the facade he presented to the world was built upon sheer terror. So you thought Toyotas could fly, did you? Jack asked lightly, standing by Howie's bed. Japanese ingenuity, Howie managed. His voice was slurred with painkillers. Jack could hear the drip-drip of the IV and the beeps and clicks of the machines that were monitoring Howie's vital signs. All these sounds were deeply familiar from his own long convalescence. There was a sickly smell of fluids and bandages in the room. So, how are you feeling, Howie? They're going to set the leg tomorrow morning, Howie answered dreamily. I'll feel better then. We're making plans to have you transferred down to San Geronimo, Emma told him. We're hoping we can move you by ambulance the day after tomorrow. Meanwhile, don't worry about money. Thank God the Toyota was insured to the max. Do you want me to call your parents, Howie? Howie shook his head. Indians, you know, we don't make a big thing about pain. Better tell Bob and Nova, though. They'll be worried. I'll phone them first thing in the morning. Jack said. Look, we have only a few minutes before the nurse kicks us out, so tell me what happened. Howie was floating in Demerol, only semi-coherent. Man, 
There was a blonde with huge knockers. Do you like big knockers, Jack? It depends to whom they're attached. I like small breasts myself. It's where I'm at on the food chain. I mean, nursing just isn't my bag. It's not what I'm looking for with a woman, Jack. To suckle, yeah, sure. But the accident, Howie. I had a hot dog. People really eat badly up there. In Colorado Springs? Did you find out anything about Millennium? They had an office in a shopping mall. That's where I met the blonde with the knockers. But she didn't respond to me. Maybe she sensed I've been weaned. There were two men, a baby-faced hulk with big muscles and a red-haired guy with the face of an El Greco saint. The hulk kicked me when I followed them out into the parking lot. Then El Greco said something to me, but I can't quite remember what. Calm down, Howie, Emma told him, for Howie was suddenly agitated, trying to sit up in bed. Jack, I think we should let Howie get some rest. We will in just a moment, Emma. Now, Howie, I want you to concentrate and tell me about the accident. It was no accident. Son of a bitch shot the tires out on the truck. Shot the tires? Who are you talking about? Was it your El Greco saint or the Hulk with big muscles? No, not them. Aren't you listening, Jack? It was the ghost dancer. The what? Unfortunately, and most frustrating for Jack, the head nurse came into the intensive care unit. She was a middle-aged woman with dyed blonde hair, black eyebrows, and a saccharine manner. I'm sorry, but you have to leave now, so our patient can get his beauty sleep, she said in a pleasant sing-song. Jack ignored her. Howie, what are you talking about? What is a ghost dancer? I didn't really see him. It scared me to death the way he just came walking down that dark highway. I'm very sorry, said the nurse, more sternly now. Perhaps you can come back during visiting hours tomorrow. Jack was on edge, and this nurse was the last straw. He turned to her with haughty irritation. Will you kindly shut up? Can't you see I'm trying to question this man? Now what the hell are you talking about? Jack had turned his attention back on Howie. What do you mean, a ghost dancer? But Howie could only shake his head. Damn near scared me to death, he repeated, awed by his own terror. Meanwhile, the nurse was going for help. Come on, Jack, Emma told him gently, taking his arm. Howie needs to rest, but I need to know who shot at him. We'll come back she said patiently. Tomorrow there will still be mysteries, my dear, left for you to solve. 2. Howie drove off the cliff on Monday night. On Tuesday, Emma Wilder took the day off from work in order to chauffeur Jack around, fill out various insurance forms, and arrange for Howie's transfer by ambulance from Colorado to San Geronimo. But on Wednesday, she returned to work. Emma held one of the two paying positions at the San Geronimo Public Library, and much as she loved Jack, much as she wished to be helpful, it was simply not possible for her to drop everything and become his all-purpose, seeing-eye wife in Howie's absence. She had a life, too. The San Geronimo Library was housed in an old hacienda that had been bequeathed to the town by a rich and genteel old lady. It was said that Carl Jung had spent a night here on his trip to New Mexico to see the Indians, and that D. H. Lawrence and his wife Frida once had a tremendous shouting match in the courtyard. The house was quaint, but it made for an inefficient library, a warren of small rooms that were crammed floor to ceiling with books. At noon on Wednesday, Emma left a volunteer in charge of the checkout desk and took her bag lunch into the native culture's room an oddly shaped area that had once been a back pantry. Emma pulled out a volume from the shelves and settled herself at the table, prepared to eat and do some research for an after-school literacy program she ran for local children. She opened her lunch, wondering what culinary surprise Jack had for her that day. She laughed when she saw what it was, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Jack, you son of a bitch! Every successful marriage is based upon a fair division of labor. 
love alone, once the honeymoon is passed, does not cut the cake. In the Wilder household, Emma did the housework and Jack did the cooking. Such was the division they had settled upon a few months after he had lost his eyesight, for Jack had insisted he either must be useful or he would go mad with boredom and self-disgust. Today, Jack's skill in the kitchen was legendary throughout his social circle, but his culinary prowess had not come without cost. For nearly six months after he took over the kitchen, Emma suffered through meals of almost psychedelic disarray, food that was burned or half-raw, bizarre spices, ingredients that were comically wrong. In his blind impatience, Jack had used sugar instead of flour, soy sauce for oil, cayenne pepper for salt, and on one memorable occasion, a can of Katya's dog food, which she mistook for refried beans. Gradually, Jack had learned to taste and smell and organize his kitchen in such a way that he knew where everything was. He had become a master chef, multi-ethnic, veering from sushi to enchiladas with delirious ease. All this made the peanut butter sandwich today a cause for some concern. Emma studied the sandwich thoughtfully, pondering its significance. As peanut butter sandwiches go, this was certainly the deluxe model. The bread was homemade, the jam was imported from England, the peanut butter was organic. Nevertheless, she knew her husband very well, and the lunch he had made for her today was a statement of his discontent. I am not going to feel guilty, Jack. She did feel for him, though. She knew that without Howie and without her help, he was stuck at home today, and most likely he was extremely grumpy about it. But she wasn't about to give up her own job. Certainly, to be a librarian was not as glamorous as being a great detective, but then again, maybe it was. Who could say, perhaps one day she would give just the right book to just the right person, and it would have a more lasting impact on the world than all of Jack's running around. Emma bit down rebelliously on her peanut butter sandwich. It was delicious, absolutely the best peanut butter sandwich she had ever tasted, due in large part to the whole wheat bread that Jack had baked himself. Then Emma reached into the bag for a napkin and found a Godiva chocolate. Damn you, Jack! As always, he was manipulating her in his own sly way. But what can you do with a husband who makes your perfect sandwiches and slips Godiva chocolates into your lunch bag? With a sigh, Emma closed the book she was reading, a collection of Navajo coyote stories she was considering for her after-school program. Apparently, the local children would have to wait because Emma Wilder had a husband who was a bigger child still. She put the coyote stories back on the shelf and then searched among the books for quite a different subject. She found three volumes that were helpful and spent the rest of her lunch break reading about a Native American cult of the last century, a cult that was known in English as the Ghost Dancers. How odd, Emma said aloud. In general, she was inclined to like Indians and respect their customs, but there was something disturbing about these ghost dancers, not at all pleasant, almost insane. She stared out the window for a moment, deep in thought, and then she returned to the checkout desk to use the telephone to call Jack. But the phone rang and rang until she got the answering machine. Jack was not home, and this worried Emma, too. Where in the world could a blind man go? Jack spent the first part of Wednesday morning in a deep funk. It was extremely frustrating for him to be housebound because there were so many things he would have liked to do. Drive to Colorado Springs, interview some people at the San Geronimo Pueblo, even make a trip up to the ski resort. But everything seemed impossible without Howie or Emma to help him. So what now? He asked the empty house. Jack sat in the overstuffed platform rocker in the living room, pushing back and forth rhythmically with the toes of his right foot. While he was rocking, he felt a long, wet nose thrust itself into his lap. It was Katya, hopeful of some affection. Often enough in the past, Jack had pushed her away, for he did not particularly like dogs. But Katya had caught him at just the right moment. He put a hand on her furry head, and he felt the motion of her tail wagging optimistically. Poor old Katya, he said in a soothing voice. He meant, of course, poor old Jack. They had always had a difficult relationship together, man and dog. 
The German Shepherd had come to him in California from the San Rafael School for Guide Dogs after a two-month training course soon after he lost his sight. But Jack was a self-described cat person. Finding cats, graceful and clever and independent, and dogs just the opposite, klutzy and dumb and horribly dependent on people. The last straw with Katya was that she liked to chase cats, although fortunately sushi and sashimi the two tiger stripes were more than a match for her. There had been an incident shortly after Jack and Emma moved to New Mexico. While Jack was walking around the block with Katja and Harness, she saw a cat, forgot all her training, and took off down the street at a gallop. Jack was half dragged in a most undignified manner nearly up a tree. He vowed it was the last time a German shepherd would ever control his fate. Of course, he should have returned her to the guide dog school for further training, but Jack couldn't be bothered. Katja was simply demoted from guide dog to barely tolerated pet, and from that moment on he had made a concerted effort to memorize his surroundings and get around with no one's help. Well, Katja, I haven't treated you very well, have I? Jack said to her this morning, scratching her ears. Katja had been waiting years for this moment, just the tiniest bit of affection from the man she adored. Dog that she was, she became overexcited with the smallest encouragement. Jack found himself licked in the face with her long tongue. She slobbered all over him and tried to climb up into his lap. Jack knew he must be in a very bad way because it actually felt good to have someone, anyone, drench him with such uncritical amounts of love. Down, Katja, down! But she could tell from his voice that he didn't mean it and in a moment he gave in to her completely. He wrapped his arms around her neck and buried his dead eyes in the gorgeous warmth of her fur. Half an hour later, Jack and Katja stood on the front path together outside the wilder home. Katja was in harness. Jack had managed to find the contraption after a search in the back of the hall closet. He held the stiff handle of the harness with his left hand, and in his right he carried a white cane. It had become a very long time since he had attempted this procedure and he tried to remember what he had learned from the two-month course he had taken. Guide dogs do not really look after their master. They are trained instead to avoid any possible danger to themselves, to stop at curbs and look for traffic so that they'll not be run down. Most of the work is done by the blind person who must listen and feel and be constantly aware of changes in the shifting environment. Jack felt foolishly self-conscious as he stood there with his dog and cane, very much a handicapped person for all to see. He hoped none of the neighbors were looking, finding him in any way an object of pity. Okay, this is it, your big chance, Katya, he said to her in a stern voice, a voice that had once terrified uniformed officers and lieutenants alike. You mess up and your dog food, you got that? All right, what are you waiting for? Let's go. And off they went. Late on a fine April morning, Katya leading the way down the sidewalk, tongue lollying, ears pricked forward, and Jack following behind, tap, tap, tapping with his cane. 3. Jack and Katya headed in the direction of Sisters of Mercy Hospital on the north side of town, where Howie had been transferred from Colorado earlier in the morning. The distance from Jack's house to the hospital was slightly more than a mile, as treacherous a mile as any he had traveled in all of his life. Jack thought he had the route perfectly clear in his head. He had come this way often enough on walks with Howie in the fall, go north on Calle Santa Margarita with his back to the sun, cross four streets, turn right on the fifth intersection, and walk straight for about fifteen minutes until arriving at the main highway. The hospital should be on the right-hand corner. What could be simpler? Katya did her part admirably, keeping him straight on the sidewalk whenever he had a tendency to swerve. She stopped at every curb just as she had been taught, allowing him the time to perform his own well-practiced drill, to feel for the curb with his left foot, use his cane to seek out possible obstacles, and, above all, to listen for traffic. The first two intersections went so smoothly he began to relax, but the third street was a disaster. He was halfway across the road when a car full of teenagers appeared from nowhere and nearly mowed him down. They yelled obscenities and howled with laughter to see a helpless blind man with a cane. 
Why this struck the little barbarians as funny, Jack could not say, but it made him so angry that he lost his orientation and forgot how many streets he had crossed. All it took was for his concentration to waver just this much, and it was as if a magic thread had been broken. Before the teenagers appeared, he had been a man who knew exactly where he was. By the time they passed, he was lost in a featureless, all-embracing night. Jack continued onward, for there was no turning back. Somehow he turned too early and arrived at the main highway at a corner he did not know, a place full of strange smells and sounds that all mingled together in a chaotic way. For several bad minutes he felt himself on the edge of something he recognized as blind panic. He was starting to hyperventilate, struggling to get a grip on himself when he heard a wheezing voice nearby. Hey, Cap'n, can you help a guy out? Lend me three ninety-nine. The voice belonged to an old street character named Tucson Tom, a down-and-out hippie who had arrived in San Geronimo with a counterculture invasion of the early seventies, and had somehow survived all these years. Jack knew who he was from Emma's anecdotes, for Tom generally slept in a small clearing behind the library. He stank of beer and dirty clothing. Why three ninety-nine? Jack managed to reply, breathing heavily. Get ourselves a twelve-pack, Cap'n. We'll go to the park and do ourselves a little drinking. What'd you say? Hey, did I tell you? I was in the Vietnam War. Were you? You bet I was. Man, I saw some terrible things over there. I'll tell you all about them over a brewski. Jack made a deal with him. If Tom would lead him to Sisters of Mercy Hospital, Jack would gladly give him four dollars. He could have the twelve-pack all for himself, the penny change, and even keep his war stories to himself. Tom said, sure thing, Cap'n. He took hold of Jack's arm, but he was so drunk he nearly pulled them both to the ground. Don't take my arm, Jack said crisply. Just walk by my side, please. For Jack, this was a nightmare. The loss of dignity was nearly as bad as feeling so utterly lost. Tucson Tom pawed at him and spoke with semi-coherent nostalgia about the days when you could get drunk much more cheaply than today. When they finally reached the hospital, Jack found he had a new problem. He needed some seeing-eye help in order to pick out four-dollar bills from his pocket. He had stuffed a handful of cash into his pocket before leaving home, but he did not know the denominations, and he certainly had no intention of trusting his drunken guide to choose the right amount. Tom became belligerent when Jack refused to pay up on the sidewalk, suggesting instead that they go inside the hospital and find the help of some neutral person. I am going to pay you, Jack explained patiently, but I will pay you inside the hospital. The old drunk suspected a trick, and Jack thought he was going to have a fight on his hands, but then a nurse appeared from the parking lot and offered to help. She paid Tom from the wad of bills Jack pulled from his pocket and then turned Jack over to one of the Candy Striper volunteers inside the hospital. One volunteer took charge of Katya because dogs were not allowed inside the hospital, not even a guide dog. Then another volunteer led him to Howie's room. And so he arrived at last, exhausted and shaken. My God, he swore to himself, people with the use of their eyes could barely imagine the adventure of traveling a single mile from home. Howie laughed when he saw the expression on Jack's face as he sank into the chair next to his hospital bed. It was the first time Howie had laughed since driving the Toyota off the Colorado mountain. You look miserable, bro. How'd you get here anyway? Emma phoned from the library a few minutes ago, so it couldn't have been her. I walked. You walked? Naturally. What do you think I did? I put Katya in her harness, I used a cane, did my whole blind man's bluff. Jack, that's quite a ways to come from your house. I'm impressed. Jack shrugged. Well, don't be. I had the route memorized, so it was nothing. Now, let's talk about you, Howie. How are you feeling today? Better. I'm still doped up pretty good. I wish you could see me. I look like the curse of the mummy. Bandages wrapped around my head and my chest where I got bruised. My right leg's in a cast, suspended from a nifty little pulley system. The doctors say I can go home at the end of the week, but I'm not going to be able to do very much for a couple of months. That's too long, Jack grumped. You got to get well faster than that. 
Howie grinned. I'll try, Jack. Howie shared the hospital room with a Spanish rancher who had hurt himself falling off a horse. The rancher had the TV set on to an afternoon talk show, and his wife was sitting at his bedside watching with him. Occasionally they talked to each other in soft Spanish. Jack pulled his chair closer to Howie. So, tell me about Colorado Springs, he asked quietly. I want to know what kind of hornet's nest you stirred up there on Monday that made someone try to kill you. From the beginning? Every detail, my friend. Jack listened to Howie's account without interruption. Then he sat very still. Jack was quiet for such a long time that Howie turned his attention back to the television, which he had been watching before Jack arrived. A lady named Antonia, who once had been a man named Tony, was talking about changing his, her sex. It was a simple operation.